when um, Comrade Shaleen tried to explain something about the true revolutionary history of Mako, they said, we're Dominican, we just want to party. <laughs> So partying happened. All right. So thank you for coming out. We have a full agenda today. I, um, I've i misplaced my script, so I'm going to have to wing it. Uh, we're, we're here to discuss questions about the state from a, roughly speaking, left perspective. Um, and that perspective is grounded in all three of our panels in actually existing activity. So it is not a pay on to the state, nor is it a program of complaining about everything we hate about the state, um, but rather what we think can be done and how and why and what some of the contradictions and opportunities have been. Uh, after we watch a short video, we're going to go straight to the first panel on Kadala that's going to be chaired by my comrade, uh, Peter Hitchcock, and our third presenter on the panel is zooming in from Kadala. So, um, and apparently we're connected. But first what we're gonna do is watch a brief um, segment of a long conversation that Francia Marquez Mina, who as you know is Vice President of Colombia now, um, a conversation she had with Angela Davis uh, several years ago when Francia decided to run for office. And so we just have a few highlights of their conversation and some of the uh, major points uh, along the way that Francia and, and Angela made in that convo. So we'll watch that and then we'll go straight into the first panel. So are we good? Have I forgotten anything? Maybe I forgot to tell you who I am. Ruthie Gilmore. <laughs> Glad to be here. Yeah, I, I remember uh, in 2010 uh, when uh, we were uh, driving down one of the highways near Cali and we saw um, huge um, fields of, of sugarcane. Uh, and we learned that that sugarcane I, I remember uh, in 2010 uh, when uh, we were uh, driving down one of the highways near Cali and we saw um, huge um, fields of, of sugarcane. Uh, and we learned that that sugarcane is being grown there in order to you know, satisfy the desire of people in uh, the global north uh, to um, think, to uh, feel that they are contributing to the, uh, the struggle to save the planet. As a matter of fact, by using um, a biofuel as opposed to fossil fuels. Uh, but at the same time, we learn that these miles and miles of sugarcane, and if I remember correctly, uh, they were, these fields were referred to as the Green Desert. Uh, uh, they bore witness to all of the people who had been evicted from that land. Uh, uh, people who had actually preserved uh, the um, integrity of, of the land and the biodiversity of the land by the things that they grew. Uh, um, 
And as a consequence of such vast numbers of people being evicted from their land um, uh, with nowhere to go, uh, there were these new prisons that were propping up. Uh, and it's very clear that the prisons were designed to hold those people who had been divested of the means with which to sustain themselves. Uh, uh, and so this was a, a, a very clearly a racist move um, affecting indigenous people, affecting Afro-descended people. And, and I mention this because I think it's, um, it's such, a, it's such an, a clear example of the ways in which uh, uh, climate issues and environmental issues uh, are ground zero of social justice uh, uh, issues. Uh, and, and, and I love Audre Lorde's quote, there's no such thing as a single issue str a struggle. Uh, uh, all of these struggles are interrelated. Uh, uh, but I think that um, we are uh, not devoting nearly enough attention uh, to the environment. Uh, and, I, and, and this is one of the reasons why I uh, am, am, am so uh, proud of the work that Francia has done. And congratulations again for your Goldman uh, Prize, uh, uh, because uh, your work is an indication of, of the ways in which our uh, global struggles against racism and patriarchy and race. Precisely when I met Angela Davis. Well, precisely when I met Angela Davis, we were facing um, the loss of our land because of the mining, um, the extractivism that was being proposed in our community that was uh, proposing to take our ancestral lands that we had occupied since our elders had been enslaved and that they really fought for them. It was land that they really got after working for years in through slavery and even after slavery, as our elders say, these are lands that they had inherited for the ethnic um, Afro-descendant and indigenous peoples, our being as a peoples, as humanity is not possible without the land, without nature. And we were in that struggle when we met Angela Davis. We were really facing the third largest uh, company for mining worldwide. It was a uh, corporation that has British and Canadian capital throughout the world. It were in the world that show themselves as developed world of course, including the United States. And in that moment, the, uh, the way it was spoken about was development. So you had to sacrifice a community because you had to advance and progress. And who are those communities that have been uh, sacrificed always? Ethnic peoples, Afro-descendant uh, Afro peoples, indigenous peoples who are considered to not matter. And that struggle we thought that it was the struggle of La Toma, our community, but it's the struggle that now has to be carried out by the, all of humanity in the, in the planet. Because unfortunately, after so many, so many screams, desperate screams from our people who have resisted, who have put forth that we need to introduce a collective vision of the struggles, we, you need to recognize the collective action as far as the protection of our lands as a living space, not as a space for obtaining um, um, more money. And through that struggle, we thought it was something really small, but then we recognized that it was the problem of humanity and those desperate screams we had in that moment 
are the screams, the desperate screams that so many people are screaming right now because of the effects of the climate crisis. That responsibility, that human responsibility, we not all have the same level of responsibility. The states have a very big um, responsibility dealing with the um, crisis that we're facing. The uh, corporations have a lot of responsibility in regards to the uh, climate crisis. Sadly, the consequences and the effects that are also hitting disproportionately those uh, in historically impoverished, racialized uh, subjects. It's women who, for example, with the pandemic, we were suffering the consequences disproportionately of uh, the COVID-19 pandemic. It's the people who don't have potable water, who don't have fresh water, who don't have food, access to food, who are really living the uh, consequences. It are the people who have been displaced because of um, the politics, who have been uh, displaced to really vulnerable places. They're really living the worst consequences of the climate crisis. Of course, Sooner than later, this is not just going to affect the most vulnerable people. If we don't do anything, this is going to affect all of humanity, even though we know there's people doing research to go to another country. But I don't think there's another planet like the one we have. So we need to take on, in the meantime, our responsibility is to continue sharing those ancestral traditional knowledge in the politics. And my decision to run for the presidency is not, uh, you know, it's not a desire out of nowhere. It's a feeling of the people. It's a feeling of having responsibility towards nature to use our a motherly love, to use justice, to use equity, justice, to fight uh, in, against that policy, politics that is being imposed against life, that politics that puts people humans in the center of things and has forgotten that people are part of nature more broadly. We have a sense of the kind of conversation that Vice President Marquez had with Comrade David, just to kind of open us up to thinking about how we might start thinking together about the state. So without further ado, I'd like to invite the first panel to come up. Good morning. One of the key words there that I heard was responsibility. Um, and it's my responsibility to hold this panel together, I hope. Um, but there's a responsibility that was actually discussed last night that I think is, is very important with regard to uh, uh, Breck's uh, play. Um, part of it had to do with individual responsibility versus uh, uh, collective uh, or communal uh, responsibility. Is that all right? Okay. I just didn't want it to buzz. Um, and so that actually, you know, those are wonderful comments, right? Uh, that we just uh, uh, witnessed, because that actually links some of the discussion last night, uh, particularly in the brilliant crosstalk that I thought the audience uh, had, um, with this uh, these gnawing questions of the of the state, which are going to be pro approached from many uh, directions uh, throughout the the day. I mean, Kerala, I mean, I'm not going to be a spokesperson for the state of Kerala, but it's it's really interesting, right, that here is a state within actually existing uh, Modi Hindu uh, nationalism that is not about that, right, that is uh, uh, autonomous in its in its own way and is actually um, in, in, in part a, a product, product of the discussions and negotiations of the Indian Communist Party. 
Um, so our, um, I'll, I'll int introduce the speakers uh, individually. I would say that uh, uh, Recourage, the, the last speaker, will be joining us via uh, Zoom. And so, you know, I, um, I ask for your patience <laughs> if, um, if there are any te technical difficulties there, which wouldn't be for the first time, right? Um, mainly, I mean, it's interesting because that'd be a direct link with Kerala during our uh, discussion. Uh, the format will be each uh, speaker, uh, uh, the, this morning Nisi, uh, Nisi Maithri and Rekha will uh, speak for about uh, 20, 15, 20 minutes, and then we will open it up for uh, discussion, uh, keeping in mind that um, what we say in, in, in this uh, uh, panel will be, uh, the, the questions that are raised will be carried forward to uh, the, the uh, following panel. Um, so, I'm just going to go uh, say a couple of things from your uh, biography, Nisim. So, um, uh, Nisim uh, Manu uh, Thukaran is an associate professor at Dalhousie um, University in, in Canada. Um, much of uh, Nisim's work is, is focused on the, the, the meaning of uh, uh, Marxism for radical change in uh, Indian politics. I'm going to uh, mention a couple of uh, uh, his books, uh, Communism, Subaltern Studies, um, um, Postcolonial Theory of the Left in South India, and uh, more, and before that, and we actually have to chat about this later, yeah. um, <laughs> The Rupture with me Memory, Derrida and the Spectres that Haunt uh, Marxism. It's a, sort of a, a running joke um, uh, that uh, we have in the CPCP about whether or not we're allowed to mention Jacques um, in, these, uh, in these proceedings. Um, so without further ado, the floor is yours. Okay, uh, I'm going to move aside. No, you sit here. Oh, okay. Just sit there. Okay. <laughs> He's not giving me... And the me music the... stopped, and I sat somewhere else. <laughs> okay, thank you. It's uh, wonderful uh, to be here. So, um, what I'm going to talk about today is um, not an eulogy to the state of Kerala, but uh, to give an understanding of uh, what are the challenges that lie ahead for something that is... Uh, reasonably well-known and is famous uh, for its uh, social development and uh, human development and uh, democracy in itself. So my talk is uh, titled as the Carolan State in the Times of Neoliberalism and Hindu Nationalism. So the state has been a central pillar to what we know now as uh, designated as Kerala model, model of development. So for those of you who are not familiar with the state, um, it's, it's a province, it's a state within India. Its uh, population is 35 million, so it's as big as Canada. Um, in terms of its, uh, why it is, you know, well known and studied uh, since 1975, uh, across the world, especially in the global south, as a model is because of some of these factors. Say, for example, multidimensional poverty index, uh, a new way of measuring poverty because it's not just poverty, economic poverty, but uh, poverty measured across uh, 10 indicators uh, of Oxford uh, UNDP. So you can see uh, the latest one, India is 25% poor. Kerala is 0.7%, right? And literacy, as many of you would know, uh, Kerala attained 90% literacy uh, in the end of the 80s. And most important statistic there is the Human Development Index rank there. India is 130, China is 86, and Kerala would be, if it were a separate nation, 58. So despite the fact that Kerala is a lower middle income region and the fact that uh, uh, it is not an industrialized province or state, it has managed to acquire 
human development indicators akin to the global north, and that's why it is being studied, right? And you'll see this uh, uh, in this chart, which is published recently in a scholarly paper. Uh, you can see the, the human development index uh, of select South Asian and Southeast Asian states. So Southeast Asian states, as you all know, some of them have industrialized South Korea, Singapore, Taiwan. They've attained economic prosperity and human development uh, indicators of a substantially high level. But here, why Kerala becomes important is because of this gap, right? Because it's not very rich, but it has managed to attain human development indicators of the global north. And so you can see uh, Malaysia is 57, but Kerala is 58, despite not having the uh, income of uh, Malaysia. And again, you can see that even China, which is uh, 15,270 uh, per capita, GNI, Kerala's is much lower than that, but is almost 30 places ahead of China uh, in terms of, and this is what has been theorized by Amartya Sen as development is freedom that you need to uh, prioritize political, human, economic, cultural freedoms, and not just development as economic uh, material well-being, right? So these are some of the reasons why Kerala is being studied. I just wanted to give an introduction to those who are not familiar with Kerala, and that's why uh, Richard Sandbrook, uh, in his book, uh, the Reinventing the Left in the Global South, the politics of the possible, he thinks, uh, he calls Kerala as the most radical social democracy in the Global South and a pioneering uh, state region in terms of the uh, social democracy, a radical social democracy. But what I am talking here today is not necessarily about uh, why these achievements uh, are important or why these achievements, uh, or just focus only on these achievements. But what I am today talking about the challenges to further democratize the state and the challenges that are now a very important part of uh, continuing what is known as this model, although we uh, cannot call anything as a model because there's no you know, rubrics to be followed in a socio-economic and human context. So. The first challenge is the fact that despite the fact that all these things that I mentioned about Kerala, there is a huge differentiation in terms of caste when it comes to the lowest caste or castes who are known as Dalits, who are politically known as Dalits now, the formerly untouchable caste, and the indigenous people. So when people allude to the Kerala model, they refer to the average situation, right? I mean, the, the indicators that I mentioned. But now it has come to a state, uh, to a stage when we need to talk about how we can deepen democracy by bringing the most marginalized of these sections to the forefront. So there is still a huge gap in the indicators that I showed you between the lowest caste, the lowest sections, marginalized sections, oppressed sections, and the rest of the dominant parts of the society. So it is akin to the race question in North America, uh, especially or in Europe uh, for that matter. So we need to talk about how we need to uh, redistribute these tendencies in a more egalitarian manner. So the time has come to focus more and more on the fact that the state has to be democratized, uh, democratized further rather than just remain at the level of the older discourse in which Kerala has done this and so and so, right? So we need to talk about the fact that the marginalized caste, the Dalits, the untouchables, the formerly untouchable, but although untouchability prevails in so many forms in India, as uh, scholars who are working on caste would know, uh, they are still at the bottom, despite the fact that the left has you know, uh, been the most prominent actor in bringing the state to some kind of a democratic, social democratic uh, uh, establishment, right? So here I would uh, take cues from Frederick Jameson, who said always historicize, right? Because as he says, the dialectical shifting back and forth between two temporal registers, the synchronic and the diachronic. The synchronic, the structures that comprise a given object in the particular moment of study, that is the now, the, the present. And the diachronic is the character of the object developed through time. 
And here what is important to understand is that how this caste marginalization has persisted until now under capitalism and coming from feudalism. So they were at the bottom of the feudal structure and now they have continued to remain at the bottom under the capitalist structure despite social democracy, despite the most radical social democracy, despite the first communist movement party that was elected in a democratic fashion in the world. Right? So this is the long history of caste marginalization that we need to historicize. And we need to talk about this in a more uh, prominent manner. So this is what scholars have called as uh, conjugated oppression of caste and class together. Right? So these untouchable Dalit castes were also the serfs, the slaves. There was slavery in Kerala, one of the few places in India where there was slavery. Uh, in uh, India was in Kerala during feudal times. So, and the indigenous people's question, although these people only, uh, the, the sections of the population constitute 10% of Kerala's population. So that's why you don't talk about them as much in the dominant discourse as, as, uh, as the model itself, right? So I argue that one of the first challenges is to make this the central aspect of uh, democratizing the state in Kerala, and the challenges of democratization. So this is the first challenge. So we cannot restri uh, restrict ourselves to these comparative figures that we, I just showed, India and Malaysia and China and Kerala, without talking about the internal constituents of this. Right? And the same goes for gender uh, inequalities, which are, which are also uh, persisting in various forms, despite the fact that women in Kerala have attained, uh, you know, uh, again, human development indicators, but which section of women? We need to talk about, right? So this has been theorized in Kerala in the discourse on Kerala by other scholars also. I'm just trying to bring this to the front in a theoretical form. Inequality has grown in the last uh, 20, 30 years since India has adopted the path of neoliberalism. And this is seen in Kerala as well. And the people who suffer the most in this inequality is again the Dalits and the indigenous people. And that is the most important thing to be noted here. The question of land has not been solved, although it's the most comprehensive land reforms in South Asia. But again, the people who did not have land before are now again at the mercy of the market because they don't have access to land despite land reforms. So these are some of the questions that have to be central. And one point that has to be noted is that Dalit or untouchable, formerly untouchable caste leadership in the left movement, in the communist movement itself, has been uh, abysmal, again, how question of caste has been, you know, uh, left behind in the mainstream discourse on class and the left movement is something to be kept in mind. Again, we can draw parallels with Latin America, indigeneity, race here and the left movement and so on. So this is the uh, thing uh, that I see as the second challenge, which is the de-radicalization of the communist movement itself. Right? And uh, this de-radicalization is not something that happened in the last five years. It has been happening since the parliamentary path has been adopted. But that's not something that can be, uh, you know, uh, abandoned in the sense that this is not something, uh, there, there's a democratic bourgeois parliamentary system that is in, uh, in the works. And so the communist parties are contenders fighting for elections and so on. But the point is that, that there is substantial de-radicalization, right? Uh, all kinds of surveys and popular discourse was, would argue that there is almost no difference between, you know, the communist parties who are in elections and, you know, a, and the non-communist parties who are contending, right? So that is something that has to be uh, brought to the forefront. I have called it before in my writings as the conjecture of late socialism in Kerala, in which there is certain revolutionary ideal that is still captivating substantial sections of the uh, Marxist communist cadre, but the reality is capitalist and the reality has changed. It's a globalized interlinked society, right? But you still uh, have hoardings such as these uh, of Lenin and revolutionary uh, slogans and greetings and so on, which pepper the left communist discourse in Kerala. And so this is a kind of inhabiting two worlds kind of thing. And I borrow this concept of late socialism from the anthropologist Alexei Yurchak, who has worked on Soviet Union and the end of Soviet Union, and this inhabiting two worlds when the world is transitioning to something else. So 
I see the second challenge, this de-radicalization uh, re, uh, uh, de of the communist movement as the second major challenge. And there is an inability of the communist, mainstream communist movement to deal with uh, this churning that is needed to create a new left, a left for the 21st century, a socialism for the 21st century. So there is no substantial debate happening within the Indian Communist parties now uh, to create this new left, a radical new left, which is uh, befitting the new social conditions and so on. So in that sense, the, this uh, problem is a huge problem that, uh, that socialism for the 21st century is not on the agenda. De-Stalinization is not on the agenda. You still have Stalin's photographs adorning the party meetings and uh, you know, all party fora and so on. They have not even, con you know, considered contending with this question. So how do we move to uh, a new socio-economic and political uh, conjuncture without contending with the past, you know, without talking about Stalin and without talking about democratic centralism in, in a, a liberal democracy and so on. And the irony is, uh, some of you would know who is working on Indian politics, the communist parties, despite democratic centralism, have been the most internally democratic party in the bourgeois democratic parliamentary context, right? That they elect their uh, members, representatives, leaders in a thoroughly democratic fashion, which, which is not influenced by dynasty and family, which is the main mode of operation of politics in the Indian context. Now the Hindu nationalist Movement has arisen, which is moving substantially away from that, but I'm just coming to that now. So I would say that this challenge, the second challenge, the, the need to craft a new left, a new socialist agenda is still lacking, missing. And that is a big challenge. And there are numerous compromises with neoliberalism adopted by the left, the communist movement, precisely because of the fact that, as scholars have argued, that there's this uh, dilemma of redistribution and accumulation, right? So they succeeded in redistribution. Now, where, do, where does the accumulation part come in? Because there is substantial flight, cap, capital of, uh, you know, capital has fled the state uh, because of the image that this is a communist state and so on, and, right? In which labor is protected. And so there are problems on that front. I'm just giving you a schematic understanding. I'm not going in depth into this. So class compromise, that is neoliberalism by stealth has become the uh, recent form of left's involvement in the accumulation process, uh, trying to create accumulation. Big capital has been courted by uh, the Communist Party, which is in power now in Kerala. So, and there are other problems like unemployment and fiscal crisis. So revenue mobilization becomes a problem. So here there are spectacular failures in state-led economic development. That is why market becomes a culturally, you know, legitimate thing. You know, people are attracted to the market because you don't have many successes to show in state-led economic development. So that is the second major challenge that I outlined. And the third major challenge is something that you're all familiar with that is happening beyond the borders of uh, Kerala. The tectonic shift in India towards the capture of the Indian nation state by the Hindu nationalist movement, which is showing fascist and authoritarian tendencies. So this is a huge challenge that now you had a reasonably working radical social democracy in Kerala, but now that is being imperiled by this larger context in which this populist nationalist leadership has taken charge and has become very powerful. So powerful that it, a small state like Kerala cannot you know, imagine taking on. And that's going to have huge ramifications. It's already started framing the politics, the culture and the economy of Kerala in various ways in because the central discourse has shifted from class, the economy, and from that to Hindu and Muslim and Christian. So the communal divide, the ethnic divide has uh, become the major conflagration in society, trying to create this, even in Kerala, the nationalist uh, BJP is trying to create this, to make this as the central divide, the religious divide, right? So, uh, so that is the 
biggest shift that has happened in the last 10 years, especially under populist uh, Hindu nationalist regime. So here, one of the biggest problems is that the left is now, especially uh, only in Kerala, I would say, it's adopted some of the authoritarian tendencies, personalized leadership of the right. And here you have a picture of the present chief minister of Kerala the, from the left, who is kind of has evolved a personality cult based on centralized, individualized leadership, which is never known in the Communist Party, uh, which is mimicking the right, right? So that's how I see the right in which Narendra Modi is the leader, right? The personalized, populist, centralized, in which one person decides the fate of 1.4 billion population, right? So these are the some of the three main challenges in which the left is now seem, seemingly impacted by this huge behemoth. And it is structuring the society and politics. And it also has to adopt some of those tendencies within itself. So to conclude, as my time is up, Peter, right? Uh, <laughs> Didn't want to sign. Yeah. So to conclude, I would say that the biggest positive, the biggest, uh, the most relevant point to note is the vibrant social civil society in Kerala. The state is being constantly challenged by the civil society. Right? The state is, res is not responding, but the civil society is making it respond. And so that has been the constant feature of Kerala society for the last 130 years since uh, the British, uh, uh, you know, so, since the British influence in uh, British colonialism and the period after that. And this radical civil society, not, I'm not talking about civil society tied to political parties, but a radi independent civil society. And that's been the biggest uh, advantage or the pro most prominent positive feature of Kerala, trying to bend the state into more democratic, radical social democratic uh, directions. And extraordinary vibrancy of that. And this has resulted in, for example, this is a, a news item from the New York Times during COVID. Kerala did very well in the initial parts of COVID. And later it had huge numbers of deaths, actually the second largest numbers of deaths during COVID. But you can see how the public pressure and the civil society makes the state behave. India had, according to uh, health and medical experts, almost 10 times more deaths than the officially recorded deaths, right? 10 times more. Its official numbers of deaths are 500,000. They're actually supposed to be around five, 5 million. Kerala, despite its high number of deaths, is the lowest excess deaths. That is, the state bends to civil society pressure to record actual deaths and compensate and so on. So the excess deaths of Kerala are almost the same as North America, Canada and uh, America, uh, I mean Canada and other states who have done uh, relatively better in handling COVID. It's purely because of public pressure. To give a comparison, the state of Gujarat from where Narendra Modi hails from, the numbers of deaths are 10 times more than the officially recorded deaths. And they gave compensation to 10 times more number of people for those deaths, but still they have not changed the official numbers. You know, officially you have given compensation to almost 100,000 people for COVID deaths and the official numbers are 10,000. They haven't changed it. That is the brazenness of an authoritarian populist state. You can do this because majority wants you there, right? So you can do anything that you want. So this vibrancy, cultural vibrancy, this is from uh, one of the biggest cultural festivals, the Kochi Binale, uh, held in the city of Kochi, the largest city in Kerala. And you have Che Guevara in the local garb. <laughs> Still firing the imagination of people who have not completely de-radicalized. So this cultural sphere, but as I said, still not completely contending with things like caste, but even that is coming out because caste and indigeneity has to be the central uh, focus in the present. And I believe this civil society, this this is an indigenous people's struggle for land, uh, would take this 
so-called model, it has to take this model to its unfulfilled potential. It has so much of potential, but it is still unfulfilled because of the, the marginalized, uh, most marginalized sections are not still equal citizens. And this unfulfilled potentials come from a history of almost more than 100 years of anti-caste struggles, which are not necessarily, this is even before communism, the biggest anti-caste reformers in Kerala. And some of this fed into the communist movement, and that's the initial thrust for the communist movement, this critique of caste, which melded with class in the communist movement, that has to come back to further fulfill its potential. And I have called it as the incomplete national popular. The communist movement built a national popular of the Gramscian sense, but it is still incomplete because the most marginalized, the margins have still not right there, up there in the democratic imagination of Kerala. Thank you. More musical chairs. Um, next, our next speaker. Thank you, Nisma. We'll, we'll hold these yeah. thoughts, right? Yeah. Hold these thoughts. Um, our next speaker is my dear friend, uh, a colleague, and a comrade at the Center for Place, uh, uh, Culture and Politics, uh, Maitri uh, Prasad, who has been um, active at the CPCP for quite a while, uh, quite a while now, but productively so. And um, <laughs> this, the tome that emerges from this, uh, this, uh, uh, this time with us, I think will be a game changer, uh, works primarily on uh, labor migration, uh, both uh, between uh, Kerala and the, uh, and the rest of India, but also obviously uh, Kerala in its relationship to West Asia. Uh, particularly Saudi Arabia and uh, the UAE. And um, Maithri's work is interested in the, in the politics, of, uh, not just the economics of those relations, but the politics of it and how it, it changes uh, uh, local and uh, state uh, agendas of uh, various kinds. So I do welcome uh, Maithri, and I will get out of the way so that people can see your, oh. mm -hmm. see your screen. Thank you, everyone. Um, I, you know, I, when uh, we were discussing this uh, conference, you know, there were a lot of thoughts in my mind in terms of how to formulate this. And, and I was also discussing with Ruthie. And one of the lines in the description that we have, we have of the conference, it's about sovereignty. And, you know, what does it mean to be sovereign? And what is the relationship between the state and so sovereignty? And all of these questions. This is very unfamiliar terrain for me in terms of, you know, I have not read the classics, so to speak. <laughs> <laughs> so this is like, uh, you know, some saying yours was going to be a classic. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so no classics uh, yet, but some thoughts, some observations. Um, it's titled a Radical Non-Sovereignty the right to be indebted and the right to labor, but it's no title. It's just, uh, you know, just my way of like trying to think about these things. Um, so I'll start, I mean, my intention here is to give you some snapshots of how the state works and how, you know, sovereignty is an ongoing question. And as uh, Nassim said, uh, 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 something that needs to be historicized, and which has been, you know, which has been historicized. But this is my attempt to actually get into it a little bit in terms of my own research and think my think it in relation uh, with several processes that are going on. Some of which uh, Nisim talked about, um, and we have here something called, you know, I mean the. What I want to bring to your attention first 
is an instance of non-sovereign debt. So we have this, you know, small territory within in, within India. So it, it issued rupee denominated debt instruments to mobilize funds internationally for infrastructure building for the state coordinated Kerala Infrastructure Investment Fund Board. So this is a neoliberal instrument where you have public private participation to to bring in investment into the infrastructure uh, uh, building, for example, ports uh, or roads and all of those things. It's called KIFP and it's been a big uh, uh, thing that the, the left government had been advertising and it floated uh, masala bonds. It, these are called masala bonds so uh, because it's rupee denominated and they uh, brought in around 2000 crores. It's not much in terms of, you know, how you think when you were to think of, if you were to think in terms of dollars. 250 billion dollars. 250 billion dollars. Million dollars, yes. And, um, but, the, but the Indian state, uh, especially the Comptroller and Auditor General of India, pulled up the, Indi uh, the Kerala state and said, this is unconstitutional because subnational states cannot, do not have the power to raise foreign loans. So this, they, they just stopped um, the Kerala state from taking loans from, uh, in this instance, London stock, uh, stock market. So this, this made me think about, you know, so this is an instance of non-sovereign debt, which means that, you know, um, a, a subnational entity is trying to raise resources, but the, the central center, the union government is saying, no, you can't do it because you cannot, uh, the, the center said that, oh, you cannot bring in liabilities behind our backs. Uh, you have, you, the, 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 the job of bringing in foreign liabilities is, uh, uh, it uh, it uh, resides with the the union the the Indian state. So then then uh, what is the history of uh, you know why is why, how did um, Kerala end up being not exactly sovereign? What is the history there? So, uh, so uh, there is the um, there is an instance an in interesting instance. Uh, in the history of communist movement, where it refused place-based or territorially bounded ethnic sovereignty. Uh, this is in 1946. India was becoming independent in the sense it was in the process of becoming independent. And uh, at this time, in the Travancore state, which is a princely state, which is uh, which which uh, joined, which uh, which was part of, which is now part of Kerala. And at that time, it was ruled by a uh, Raja, uh, but under British paramountcy. So there was this revolt called Punapravaila revolt uh, against the Travangu state and its prime minister, who is Brahmin and who had a uh, uh, who was uh, who continued the leg the, the upper caste Savarna uh, uh, Hindu legacy of the Travangu state and modernized it uh, in in terms of this. Uh, uh, you know, so there was a lot of ha taxation. There were famines at this time. So the 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 labor movement addressed the questions of the famine, addressed question question of cholera uh, epidemic. So in 1946, the urban proletariat aff affiliated with the Communist Party of India, at the time called All Travancore Trade Union Congress, formed liberated zones and fought pitched battles against the. Oh, sorry, this is the Travancore police uh, in uh, against the Travancore police in opposition against the prime minister's move. For 430 communists died in the firing by the Travancore army. So you see that, you know, there is a tradition of refusing a, a, a closed idea of sovereignty that is place based or, you know, that's that's uh, too ethnic or uh, too bounded. So this all, as, as Nisim said, this also speaks to the lower caste radical traditions in the 19th and 20th centuries and the emergence of labor unions. So we see that, you know, uh, the lower caste radical traditions were for um, right to education, right to uh, use public space, right to uh, take water from uh, public, uh, you know, water taps and wells. So we see that there is a question of 
who can access the public space. And many of these, uh, both the communist movement and the lower, lower caste radical traditions that preceded it worked uh, in, in relation to this idea of public space. And you also see that many of the labor unions arose uh, in response to uh, caste, in, in relation to caste based uh, um, uh, unionized, caste based artisanal unions. So, what I wanted to uh, say here was that, you know, there is a tradition of understanding uh, sovereignty dialectically uh, in the movement itself, in not as, you know, wanting to. So the communist movement is, uh, specifically wanted to join the union and actually fought the local princely state uh, uh, against becoming an independent separate state. So this this uh, so you you see that you know uh, the communists were uh, at that time very internationally oriented, which meant that in a way that that they had to join the Indian Union. So that was an that was an idea of that's where I think many of the coalitional work that you later see, which which we can call civil society, emerges too. So this working together of different interests and uh, how you move toward dialectically without getting caught up in in in, a, in any specific idea of sovereignty or not. And and in the 1970s, as Nissim pointed out. We see the labor migration that you know where uh, many of the people, uh, for example, in in, in 1990s, 30% uh, of the gross domestic product of uh, of the state came from remittances. So we see that uh, the history of labor is not only about you know these liberated zones and trade unionization, but it's also this internationally oriented. Uh, you know, attempt to actually sustain a certain uh, economic uh, model. So here, I mean, this is another snapshot. We are moving to another, you know, time. Uh, so we were, I mean, when I was talking about non-sovereign debt, I was talking about the present situation, 2019. Then we moved to 1946. But this is again back to the present, uh, where you see that you know there is um there is the infrastructure the the push to uh, bring in investment there is the push to uh, build big infrastructure for example port building uh, there are um, uh, roads being built continuously and you see a lot of uh, damage to the environment damage to people living in coastal areas. Or um, uh, in the in the margins of uh, you know the society, um, so we see that there is a heterogeneity of capital that's coming in. So I was specifically looking at port building in uh, container port uh, container port building in in Kochi, and you see a heterogeneity of capital. You see uh, Dubai port world, which is uh, you know Khaliji capital coming in. And you see local uh, capital and subcontracting chains, and you see different the institutional change in port sector, which means that uh, uh, the port sector was privatized, where the government, the state government, uh, is building road and um, uh, rail connectivity for the ports. That's that's being privatized. So you see a neoliberal model there, where the existing institutional systems uh, of public ports and public roads are being um, destroyed. And you see different types of recruitment of migrant and local Malayali labor that reflect political settlements between trade unions, corporate construction companies, and recruitment agencies. So you, if you observe labor in, in these um, you know, port building um, sites, you see that you know, the, the, the there are large recruitment companies affiliated uh, and negotiating with the state government, bringing in workers, and you have local trade unions who strike up a settlement with the state and with these uh, big contractors, saying that okay, we'll provide you, you know, these many workers. But eventually, you see that you know the the local trade unions are basically not getting into the work but just getting money uh, on the side where the migrant workers are doing all the work. You also see that 
you know, there are uh, around 28 or 29, uh, can I have the water? <laughs> so you see also the re, uh, redrawing of the welfare architecture, where um, one of the salient features of, you know, what makes Kerala unique is around 29 boards, welfare boards for informal workers where you have your, um, for example, for hotel workers, for laundry workers, for um, construction workers. For, so you have 29 different types of uh, welfare boards and welfare systems for different types of uh, workers. So what you see is that the this welfare is right now completely, um, you know, uh, ex the, the migrant workers who come in to do all this work, is ex they are excluded from this this welfare architecture. So you see that the trade unions uh, and their collusion with capital in the sense that how state mediates this uh, uh, to to um, to sub to make migrant workers subsidize this welfare architecture. So many of the times you have these big buildings being built and you have to pay a cess to the state uh, and that cess directly goes into the uh, the welfare of uh, Malayali workers, but the work will actually be done by uh, migrant workers. So the, you see an ethnic wage welfare complex where wage is differentiated, where welfare is also differentiated. You have a separate uh, welfare program for migrant workers. So you see a con uh, you know you see what we see everywhere, which is the production of difference, and uh, and also uh, uh, you have superimposing of you know, national caste, the, the coming together of caste differences within Kerala and, and uh, caste differences from outside Kerala. So you see um, these interlinkages between, um, between uh, different kinds of capital and transformation of this, um, this labor space. So you also see the refusal to open up social security and wage systems to migrant workers. So here, you know, I, I also want to speak about, you know, how does, how do, how do you, what is, com I mean, I've always asked this question, what is, are there something communist, you know, are there some uh, traces of communism or, you know, traces of ways of being communist in Kerala? And some of the things, um, you know, some things that I've always wondered about are hartals, which are general strikes, large general strikes. You could, you know, you could be very uh, nominal in terms of your, uh, you know, strength in terms of parliamentary democracy or actual strength, but you could actually call a hartal and people would participate. So you have, uh, especially, you know, in the 90s and 80s, we used to have uh, buns and hartals, these general strikes. That'll just be, that'll just, that would mean that there's nobody coming out, no work being done, you know. And this, this comes out of a tradition of um, uh, general strikes from the communist movement, which persisted uh, for some time. And then you also have something called Nokuguli, which I've talked about a little bit before uh, in some of my work, is, is where you know you have, um, this is about headload workers. So for example, suppose you know there is a, a big port is being built, for example, and you have to bring in, um, um, bricks and you have to unload or flood or flood these bricks so what happens is that sometimes the local trade unions of headload workers they'll come in and they'll say okay you have a big um, like mechanized system to unload but you have to pay us even though you are um, um, you are not uh, we might not be actually doing the work so there are different ways of like um, combating camp capital combating um, the state, combating, I mean, this could also be like, you know, I'm moving houses and I'm moving all my uh, chairs and tables myself, but the workers would come and say, okay, we see that, you know, you're doing this. Maybe you want to do this alone, but you have to pay us, uh, pay us some money because we, we belong in this place. So there is also that place-based, um, uh, right to uh, claim making that goes on um, in terms of labor 
So these are some of the, you know, uh, things that I, I think that makes uh, Kerala uh, communist or socialist. And sometimes these are demonized. For example, you know, Nokuguli is always like characterized as something bad where, you know, workers would come and just, you're just asking for uh, wages that for, for work that you haven't done. Or, you know, you have one, done one person's work and you're you asking for 10 people's uh, wages. And, and about this hartal, which actually drives away as per, um, you know, narratives that this drives away capital. And it, it does. So, the, <laughs> so how do we understand, you know, this? Uh, so our, my uh, socialist time resides not, in so, not only in socialist institutions like cooperatives and state-supported pensions for the informal workers, but in the specific relationship between capital and labor and between the state and labor. The outlawing of practices like Nokuguli and Band or Hartal so that lower caste workers will submit to the rule of law is, is a significant moment in the social history of labor in Kerala. It is being destroyed so that productive forces can be freed, relations of production can be reconstituted that will authorize the real subsumption of labor and the extra legal force of labor is curbed. So you, you can see that there is some extra legal force that resides with the with workers. And that continues. And because it's the left government that banned Nokuguli. It's it was not the Congress government. They wanted to ban, you know, this this anachronistic, <laughs> stupid practice, which is probably, you know, people will call it, oh, probably it's a feudal remnant. Or, you know, why are why is <laughs> Why, why are proletariat behaving like this? The proletariat should not be uh, irresponsible to, uh, to homeowners or, you know, to the, uh, to the poor um, uh, residents of... So it, 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 it's, it's, it's contested in that sense. Yeah. <coughs> so all of these things that, you know, that, that, tell, that tells me that, oh, there's something called sovereignty but there is also there are also choices that the communists themselves made in terms of relinquishing a certain closed idea of sovereignty partly because the local state you know at the time the the travancore state was quite um what to say that used to tax a lot for example there were taxes if you wanted to wear clothes you had to pay a tax if you were a low caste woman and wanted to wear upper cloth you had to pay taxes so this was a Hindu, um, you know, Savarna uh, princely state under the paramountcy of the um, of the British India that was doing all this, and people rejected that. People rejected that idea of sovereignty that was based on untouchability and you know this kind of yeah. So so my question is here. <clears throat> So what are what are what do these juxtapositions tell us in terms of like you know to go back to that debt thing the, the non-sovereign debt and how the Indian state stopped us and then you have the uh, the communist you know liberating zones but also rejecting the this idea of you know why couldn't they have said okay let's do this Travancore state right now and later figure out, you know, whether to join the Indian Union. Why did they push to join the Indian Union so militantly? And, um, and yeah, so, so here, debt, uh, I mean, that instance of non-sovereign debt tells us that the state is an institutional framework, uh, the state as the institutional framework to reproduce the conditions of reproduction of a people. And, and I think you know this is this is like a little bit like the right to have rights, where you know you you feel that there is you need an institutional framework to reproduce conditions of reproduction, and then you see okay these trade unions are bearers of a social history of labor that affirms the ethno linguistic territorial form of the state, even though they arise out of a tradition of rejecting such a sovereignty or such a territorial form. And you see the production of differences, but the tenacity of nomenclatures that govern labor. So what happens is like you you still restrict, you still consider 
a Malayali as worker. You you still have trouble, you know, bringing in people into these trade unions, into the welfare architecture, into the welfare boards, into accident accident death compensation. So you see these clash of nomenclatures that govern labor, and and this also tells us, you know, what was. I mean, in terms of like thinking about why did these people uni uh, join the Indian Union? Um, so fe uh, federalist. I mean, you you also remind are reminded of the idea of federalism and its salience uh, for working class people, but that's being like re uh, destroyed right now in in the sense that there are new modes of taxation being uh, brought in by the uh, Indian state. There is a colonization through these taxation re regimes uh, uh, by by Hindutva forces, uh, not just taxation regimes, but also ideas, as Nisim said, ideas of, you know, how to be that are very Hindu, because uh, in, in Kerala, we are uh, 20, around 20% 20 uh, Christians and 27% Muslims, and the only, only the rest are Hindus. And what is Hindu? It's, you know, it's a collection of practices, but that's being codified now in the terms of the Indian state. And so we have the, we have the destruction of federalism, new modes of taxation, and Hindutva colonization of not just Kerala, but also other southern states. And uh, um, so there is a re-emergence of interest in sovereignty as the right to control resources and the right to have liabilities. So, you know, we, we see that um, uh, right now, the finance minister who uh, floated these uh, debt instruments, masala, uh, you know, loans or whatever in the London Stock uh, Exchange is being pursued by the uh, enforcement directorate of the BJP, you know, government. So we see that, you know, the right to have liabilities, the right to be indebted, it's not a simple thing where, you know, you reject it, but you, negotiated in an ongoing story. Yes. Yeah, yeah. So what should I? I'm not sure. Um, I did warn you about a possible, um, possible issue with communication, and it hasn't been established yet with uh, Ray Garage, who is our, our third speaker. Um, but uh, first, thank you, Maitri, for those um, uh, comments and analyses. And it's, it's good to have that other dimension, too, yeah. with, with what Nisim was saying in the first uh, pr uh, presentation. Um, I should say that... Uh, if you if you don't know Rekha Raj's work, uh, she is uh, uh, an activist and writer in, in Kerala and works in particular on uh, 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 Dalit politics and uh, feminism and um, has been doing that for quite some time. And we, originally we hoped to uh, have... Uh, uh, Rekha here in person, um, but uh, sometimes the activism is more important than the uh, <laughs> than the airline miles. But while we're waiting to reestablish the uh, or establish the contact with Rekha, may maybe we could begin at least yeah. some of the, the 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 conversation based on uh, the uh, Maithri and Nisim's presentation so far. Um, did anybody want to ask questions from the from the audience? So what, what's happening, uh, which shouldn't be that mysterious, is it's raining season in Kerala and internet speed is unpredictable. And Greg had, had acknowledged receiving the link from us this morning. Okay. But for some reason, the connection hasn't happened. And, and our comrade Dave has been hard at work on it. So, yeah. 
Okay. Maybe it's communist time. I, don't know. <laughs> I would say it's the fault of neoliberal infrastructure rather than communist infrastructure, but we can, de you know, we can debate that. Uh, no, I'm not able to. It's not being seen. My WhatsApp message is seen. So weird. Well, I, I think why don't we start a discussion yeah. and should she miraculously and walk in quiet and listen to her presentation. Yeah. Okay? Yeah. Yeah. I got it. I got it. Um, all right. So, um, you know what I would really love uh, as people compose, uh, people who are on this side of of the stage compose uh, questions is maybe the two of you could talk briefly because I thought the resonances uh, between your presentations were fantastic. So maybe you could ease, ask one another a question about what you've said so far, if you would. Maybe Nissim, you would. Yeah. So uh, uh, the banning of this practice, right, of uh, drawing wages while you watch, that is, that is no cool. Uh, it's also because of the fact that, uh, don't you think it's also because of the fact that, you know, the class composition of society has changed, right? I mean, so labor is not what it was like in the 1950s or 60s. So Kerala, because of the fact that uh, there's substantially high human development index, so we can't just compare the 50s and 60s to what's happening in the 2010s in terms of, say, for example, huge shift of people from the agrarian sector. Well, the, the people working in agriculture in Kerala is the lowest in India, right? It's like in, in the, uh, in the uh, single, just above single digits, right? So when that shift in class composition happens, and when the entire region and the state, uh, the entire nation is moving towards a market-led development process, right? So don't you think that's, Th that is one of the reasons why this would become anachronistic, right? Like uh, a practice like this would completely not fit a market ethos. <laughs> Somebody drawing wages and he says, you can carry your own stuff, but we will draw wages for that, right? <laughs> that's what it is. I mean, that's, that, so the, uh, the, terri uh, the unions have established their territory. So any offloading work that happens, you can do it on your own, but you just have to pay the wages for it. Like, we don't have to do it, but if you are doing it on your own, you still pay wages, right? It's also true, like, the Javits Center here in New York City, just mm. by comparison, exactly mm. the same. Mm. Yeah, so, so <laughs> don't you think, so, so that, that shift in, you know, the economic social structure in which, you know, manual working labor itself has shifted considerably, right? And, uh, and so on, so that, that changes the entire socio-psychological dimension of, you know, what a society should be uh, in terms of, you know, the market, the place of the market. For example, if you see surveys in Kerala, you see there is increasing numbers of people who are trying, uh, like who are saying that there should be more market-led activities from state-led activities. I went into it uh, in a, adequately to uh, in my presentation, but one of the ways that Nokukuli has become such an issue is not just because of you know collecting wages for not doing work, but because um, you know there are industrial estates, there are these port building yeah. infrastructural work that's happening, and you have all kinds of claims on the work that's being done there, you know, not just headload work uh, for construction work. So work as claim making is being uh, uh, is, is being erased. That right to work as a, so when you have so much money coming in, billions of dollars are coming in, aren't you going to give us something? You know, that's the question. So how, how are you going to maintain uh, class compromise without uh, distribute, redistribute without some aspect of redistribution, and the only aspect of redistribution that will work for laborers is giving work. So this is the question, you know, that's 
inside there how how do you perceive work so that's the question when the work for example when in trivandrum i recently went to a place where there was a big strike going on but uh, that was a coalition of all the trade unions so you had bjp you know bjp trade union cpm communist party trade unions different communist party trade unions congress trade unions coming in and sitting in a place in front of a a uh, small factory like a medium kind of factory in our in in kerala's context and for here like a tiny thing so what they were saying is that you know we are not asking for uh, wages for uh, not doing uh, after not doing any work we are asking that you know what is legally <coughs> sanctioned to us in terms of so the legal uh, mechanism is uh, if you have loading and unloading work that's coming into a place you need to give it to the workers who are registered in that place you cannot hire workers you know outside outside of that place and get on with that work so so what what the, what nokuguli at its heart is a is a claim making process work as claim making uh, process and it can but you know it might become anachronistic in itself like you know that particular form but workers claim making will always be there wages as claim making will always be there what is my question to you <laughs> i don't think you know i i really love the way you um, um lay, uh, you presented the story the kerala story i was wondering you know you are a political scientist i was wondering what you thought of for example you know i mean if, if you were to listen uh, without being without enough information about what actually happens in kerala we have a different government every 5 years so we elect um, congress governments uh, once in a while and we have done that until 2016 so it's been alternating so we've always like people have always uh, so my question is what do you think of the class uh, caste composition of these two coalitions uh, the congress led coalition and the left led coalition and what is that seesaw that was happening and that probably stopped right now a little bit and how do you see um hindutva as a as this uh, ethos you know as you said um and what is the how do you think of electoral democracy yeah so one of the problems that i see is that uh, like to answer your question you were talking about general strikes right and hartals and bans so this uh, communist mode it's very interesting to see that a general strike like a communist party or any other political party in india can just call for it and the entire nation can come to a standstill right the communist parties can call for a general strike and uh, work will stop and especially in the regions or states where they are in power where they are running the government so the government is actively trying to shut down work so you have to understand this right uh, so one of the problems with this electoral democracy and as i said the de radicalization is the fact that something like a general strike has been used for merely party political purposes not in the interest of the working class not for the interest of uh, the most marginalized classes right so this is one of the problems as scholars on parliamentary communism and so on have identified right i mean something so powerful as a general strike is routinely used to harass people right mm -hmm. so if you do don't shut your shop they will come and shut your shop and this is not to attain a class goal but this is to merely uh, push forward the po political party's goals right so these are two distinct uh, ideas to push forward the class socialist or communist goals or political party goals right so that is one of the things in which electoral democracy has de-radicalized uh, the party or the party's involvement in it uh, before they used to in the 60s they used to call the communist party in government as administration and struggle together right you you launch popular mass struggles in the civil society even while you are in government so you are running the state you are running the police you are in control of the uh, legal machinery of violence at the same time your cadres are are also encouraged to you know uh, you know agitate and so on 
So, in terms of the shift between both the parties, this is one of the first times that the left has continued to uh, they won the elections back to back in back to back election. So it sees it seems as a very popular thing in the sense that you know you come to power and so it's it's a lot of legitimacy. But it was also came to power because of the fact that it adopted a lot of populist measures, like uh, during the COVID pandemic and how they handle the pandemic, etc. So one of the shifts that has happened in to respond to her question is the left is becoming more populist, talking about the people rather than the working class, right? And that's also happened because the the class constitution of the parties have changed, uh, um, has changed uh, to to more middle class, less working class. So you have to talk in terms of, you know, what kind of development would you bring if you still stick to the same communist rhetoric of, you know, shutting down work and so on. Because now development has become the biggest catchphrase across the global south, but, you know, specifically in India and in Kerala, development. The word development is the most powerful word. That That's the word that you are assessed on, every political party. Are you bringing development? It does not matter what kind of development. You have to have development, right? So uh, Maitri's work has very powerfully shown, for example, how the labor class within the one region nation has been distinguished on the basis of where you originate from. Non-Kerala workers unionized, I mean, the Kerala workers unionized under the left are treated very differently from non-Kerala workers who are not unionized and who are now expropriated to contribute to the social welfare measures that the communist legacy has built, right? So this ethnic divide is 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 a tragic, uh, you know, um, uh, outcome of this process in which the other workers are now being exploited, right? In the name of, you know, you you are radically you 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 still cling to the radical slogans of communism and socialism, but there is this huge divide between workers of one place and workers coming from the other place. And one section of workers are getting the trade union benefits and so on. And this also happened with the unionized workers who are targeting, say, for women who are not part of the unions, like it happened in Munar and so on, right? I mean, so the traditional working class unionized have become a um, force not for democratic change, but of privilege and preventing radical change uh, is one of the main tendencies that has happened. It sounds like there are several versions of de-radicalization de yes. uh, going on simultaneously here. Um, conjugated oppression, right? Conjugated um, so, yes, so, but maybe either of you could clarify this for the for the audience: the 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 relationship between those infrastructural logic of uh, um, uh, of democratic government, let's say. And this, these, for want of a better word, overdeterminations of of uh, populism that we now see, not just obviously from um, guys like Modi, but yeah. uh, uh, across 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 the globe. And you know, it's not a question of like uh, balancing one one form of uh, contradiction with another, but I wonder whether or not that populism is is sort of a catalyst in, in intensifying the the contradictions that you you both in, uh, enumerated with the relationship between labor and and the state for instance yeah uh, so uh, i would see this as a general uh, tendency of populism across the world not just in the global south you can see it in the global north with the rise of right wing extremist movements right so, uh, and that reflection is seen, that's why I said that Kerala is not an oasis, it's, it's situated within the larger nation state and the globe and so on. So the populist tendency arises from various uh, reasons. We, one of the reasons is the fact that politics itself has changed drastically. That one of the things that is radically changing the society of Kerala is that substantial number of people, as she mentioned, is outside Kerala, working in the Gulf, working in North America and so on. So almost 10% of Kerala's uh, working population is outside and 30% of the, the state uh, domestic product 
is coming from outside. So that substantially uh, changes politics because the youth are not present to radically take forward uh, to uh, the people who are left behind, who wants to go outside are the people who are now the main purveyors of politics locally. Although in, in the era of uh, uh, you know non-territorialized global politics, I mean, politics is being affected from everywhere. But populism is the result of this in the sense that the older form of institutionalized politics is giving away to a direct mediation between the leader and the people. Like Narendra Modi has not given one single press conference in 10 years. He has not talked to the press. There's no history of a democratically elected leader not taking a question from the press. And in my ethnographic work, I ask people, he doesn't give press conferences. That's not good. Why does he need to talk to the press? He's working for the people, right? <laughs> this is the answer you get. He's working for the people. He does not need to talk to the people, right? Or the media people. So the answers go in this direction. All the other prime ministers were talking to the press. What have they achieved? They have not achieved anything. This man is achieving something, right? So, so populism is that. So the leader substitutes everything else. But in Hindu nationalism, it's a combination of populism and nationalism and an institutionalized party because populism differs from place to place. Hindu nationalism is there already in India, but it became populist now in the last 10 years in which one leader is added on to populist tendencies added on to an institutionalized network of the largest, most powerful organization, the Hindu nationalist organization. So that is going to reflect on politics, the way you react to it, even in a place like Kerala, where Hindu nationalism is electorally not significant. Does Prasad um, Aliyama agree with that? Uh, <laughs> yeah, I, I feel that, you know, uh, the politics in Kerala was always populist if you were to kind of like turn it on it turn it a little upside uh, the, the the word populism it's about people right and uh, at at all points you know these were coalitional forms even left politics was coalitional and necessarily uh, uh, necessarily class coalitional not just like different sections of the working class but also across classes that you could see for example this um, uh, this this uh, Pravaila revolt what you see is basically lower caste comrades being killed with you know upper caste leaders as you've just pointed out but at the same time uh, you know it's not as simple as that it's not as though the current um, chief minister is a, a former from a former un formerly untouchable caste so so these things are changing and there are a lot of like pushes and pulls that cannot be reduced to populism i feel but at the same time what you see is like in modi is that you know whatever is happening all the welfare that's happening in the subnational scales they are trying to take credit for it by you know taking it so the the relationship is between the central government modi and the people and you know all of these other scales are being rendered obsolete in that process and in that sense yes you know populism is it's a different type of populism it's a different type of people's politics that's being uh, imported so it's 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 actually a, a a struggle between different types of populisms i would say rather than you know uh, rather than pejoratively using the word populism. No, of course. I mean, uh, no, no, no. I, I'm just I no, agreeing I'm, with you. I get it. <laughs> I get what you're saying. I mean, uh, there are different kinds of populism, right? There can be left populism, right wing populism, radical populism, which is pushing uh, for more democracy, or populism, which is arguing for the uh, the point that the leader does not have to talk to the press, right? That's populism. Because he is directly in touch with the people. Why does he have to talk to the press? So that substantially negates democracy in the sense that there is no accountability. So left has, in this present regime, has adopted some of the characteristics in which the leader is towering over the ideology and the movement and the party. And he is the one who is delivering you the goods, 
right? And that is a populism which is not democratic, uh, which you know, uh, in which both the right and left are uh, almost on the same page with that kind of a denome. Yeah. So strategically, does that provide insulation or what? Uh, you know, insulation, insulation from Modi's. No, I mean, uh, insulation. Uh, as I said before, it is a small state compared to the larger population and the nation state, right? Okay. Uh, somebody in the back. I have the mic. <laughs> I have the mic, and then somebody will go in the back. Because no, it's exactly where you just got in the conversation is what intrigues me the most for us to talk about now and throughout the day. And that is to think... Um, as, as well as we can about the various forms of mediation, including refusing mediation. So the example that you gave of Modi doesn't take um, uh, talk sorry. to the press, but you also, you know, we're talking about, as we know, that, um, that there is a party, there's an entire party infrastructure, which yeah. is to say a form of mediation that Modi and company have used to achieve the power sorry. they have. So my question has to do more generally now with how already existing institutions, whether parties, unions, other forms of already organized people, are um, you know in the in the context of this vibrant civil civil society are sort of seizing the moment, reconstituting themselves in terms of class or you know whatever their 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 kind of structuring um, urgency is to push back against these tendencies. I mean, in, to push back, for example, against the notion that what we must embrace to save ourselves is this thing called the market or whatever. And I wish Rebecca were here because I think yeah. she would be talking a lot about um, these kinds of compositions and decompositions. But I would like to hear about that. And, and let me say one other thing. We, uh, when I was talking with some comrades in South Africa, we were talking about how, uh, for some people, the South Africa Communist Party is, you know, moribund. But for other people, they say, well, it's an infrastructural capacity that maybe we can re, we, we can, can enliven if we can get inside. Um, and getting inside means it very often taking, because there's nobody there to keep you out. So those are the kinds of questions that intrigue me. I'll answer briefly and then you can. So as I said before, so uh, some of the most radical challenges to uh, the existing status quo uh, are coming from unions, for example, outside the established social, uh, socialist communist network, like uh, the women's movement uh, against the established trade unions, uh, belonging to lower castes and so on. So that's there. So the independent civil society is where uh, independent, I'm not saying independent as in market oriented. Uh, I'm suggesting civil society, which is for a progressive cause, but not tied to political partisan, politically partisan agendas, right? So there is the uh, loci of change. Uh, say, for example, Kerala has made huge strides in gender and sexuality debates and rights and so on, transgenders and so on. First state in India. Uh, very natural outcome of this long history of civil society movements, uh, which have not been incorporated or by for narrow pol political party purposes. That inevitably happens because it's not possible to ward off, you know, the kind of uh, incursions by the political party into civil society space. But I see that is the uh, place where a lot of changes uh, or the struggle for changes uh, is coming from these small, smaller organizations, civil society organizations, not necessarily from within the political party, like the left party itself, as I mentioned before, right? Although before in the 90s, the democratic decentralization attempt, the largest attempt in the world came from the party, from the state itself. Uh, but this time, these changes are now coming more from outside uh, and in opposition to the established Communist Party government or party framework is what I feel. I agree. Yeah. No, I I largely agree with you on this point. Um, and you know, it's interesting uh, in terms of what is inside and outside the party too. Uh, just like you know, what is 
inside capital and what is outside capital. Yeah. So, uh, so you see that you know uh, this civil society. I mean, you see the a kind of delegitimation of organized labor that's traditional, masculine, and all of that. Uh, but also the coming up of, uh, you know, for example, nurses, uh, large strikes by nurses that was outside traditional, um, you know, union unionized uh, spaces, but was also linked to the international labor movement. Because, you know, what was happening was that uh, these, these nurses were migrating, but when they were working in Kerala, they were being paid very low amounts, their passports were being confiscated. So you see that, you know, how this international labor movement and the contemporary forms of uh, uh, organizing are, you know, taking shape. Also, the civil society right now, it's also can you could you could say that, you know, there's large scale uh, migration of Muslims into the um, uh, into the Gulf. And that has an effect on, you know, um, institutions that support uh, education of uh, Muslims and other groups um, and coalitions that are developing between um, Dalits and Muslims and um, other uh, marginalized groups. So there is new types of coalitional building, but at the same time, is it outside the party? Because, you know, you always have to respond to what's happening in this, you know, so you are always like thinking, all right, What's CPM doing? You know, let's figure out how to respond to that. So there's always that that um, reactivity and this uh, this question of what's and 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 you see the civil society. I I feel sometimes you know the civil society could be different different things. Like there could be this very elite. You know, okay, let's talk about you know this this very intellectual kind of um, critique of the left. But at the same time, which is totally different from, you know, what's going on uh, in terms of this nurses strike or, you know, so you see those different spheres operating to form a critic. But at the same time, I don't think it's enough to, uh, so you feel a certain, that there is some inadequacy when it comes to, um, uh, to, 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 to resisting Hindutva, because I feel that how Hindutva operates is by uh, by uh, hijacking class conflicts, hijacking, you know, the uh, making, because Hindutva in other places in India is operating as the, uh, like a party, where the party will create new contradictions and, you know, solve them, move forward in a very, um, you know, so to speak, classic manner. Uh, <laughs> so it will be about, you know, like who can create uh very bad contradictions and who has uh, who has the capacity to do that okay, thanks, Mary. hi um so my name is maria and uh, i'm actually from trivandrum kerala and uh, was a so-called gulfi you know i'm one of the <laughs> The, one of the many families uh, that you sort of allude to, right, the, whose parents were laborers in a Khaliji state and sent remittances back. And so my two questions is just actually building on uh, themes that you've already talked about, um, Inisim specifically, uh, when you talked about civil society forcing the hand. I mean, uh, and you, you've started talking about components of civil society that are doing that. Um, is it Kudumbashri type? Uh, organizations or, uh, uh, and I know it's complicated, the within, without party, but uh, if you could speak a little more to uh, which components you see as the more radical ones that are forcing the hand of the state. And um, Maitri, if, uh, if you could share a little bit more, since you talked about how that international orientation and um, contributions uh, from Malayali laborers in the Gulf um, was keeping afloat a certain model, uh, although we reject the term model, right? Um, what is the perhaps revolutionary potential there? 
I, I think about all of the nurses, right, that are working in Kafala and Khaliji states for disruption. Um, do you, if you could speak a little about, yes, there's absent youth, but mm. what, what kinds of internationalist struggles could, be, could we be waging mm. given the existence of um, different kinds of laborers, the kind that you see represented in um, books like Ardiji with them, you know, mm. um, and of dif different levels of, of laborers from Kerala. Mm. Um, what, what might the potential for winning some of the struggles we're talking about be mm. in that diasporic presence? Yeah. So uh, to give us, uh, before I pass the mic on to uh, Maitri, uh, two cup, a couple of two examples. Uh, uh, two examples. One is, uh, for example, if you have heard of uh, the trade union fight within the plantation labor in, in the hilly regions of Munar, that was led by women outside, like unions, out, it's called Pembule Urme. And it was fought by women outside the traditional communist labor unions and against them because the communist labor unions were standing with big capital, uh, you know, in many of these uh, events because of the fact the need to uh, bring in capital to foster development and so on. So that's a, so they are not aligned to the mainstream political parties. They were, it's, it's a major thing in terms of its impact. Uh, we don't have to measure everything by the success as much as the kind of capacity that emerges from people, from workers, laborers, especially women, belonging to the lower caste, even outside uh, the state like Tamils, uh, Tamilians, for example. So that is one example. The other is, for example, the sexuality and gen uh, you know, gender-related rights uh, movement uh, struggles. For example, I, I'm not sure if you are familiar with the Kiss of Love the right to, you know, kiss publicly to protest against uh, people who are morally policing you. So that is not coming from, you know, organizations attached to political parties because they, they often take very conservative positions. Even actually many Communist Party leaders took positions which are almost the similar as, you know, what right wing and uh, other conservative politicians would take, although the younger m leaders of the Communist Party did support the case of law, but the main engine, uh, the thrust of the critique came from independent uh, organizations. Some of them could be elitist, as Maitri correctly said. You know, there are a whole range of civil society institutions of different class uh, and caste. You know, many of them are also upper caste. So you have to keep that in mind. But uh, many uh, organizations are fighting for radical change of course, have to uh, interact with the established party and government, but are also uh, not completely tied to them or, you know, as a party framework kind of thing, you know. As uh, Ruthie was saying, Rekha would have, you know, be able to elaborate on that more if she was here. No, I'm really uh, sad that Rekha couldn't be here today. I mean, couldn't participate. Um, she would have, I mean, she was telling me, we were discussing yesterday, and she was telling me, oh, what should I speak about? And, you know, I was telling her, oh, you could speak about, you know, all the things we have been doing, and you have been doing. And one of the things that, um, you know, uh, she has done is to uh, talk about uh, the Dalit question, yeah. the, the women's question, and uh, uh, the question of gender and sexualities in a in a in, uh, in a i wouldn't say intersectional way but in a very sharp pointed way that cuts through a lot of uh, a lot of this inherited you know um uh thinking that's not helpful uh, to deal with uh, what's what sometimes going on for example uh, one of the, the the one of the metros that were built in kochi that had uh, it. It was Canadian funded, and it had trans workers as uh, trans people as workers. And then within 23, uh, you know, there were 23 of them, and within two months, all of them left the yeah. job. So you see that you know it's a very uh, 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 this this uh, uh, 
the way the party or the state appropriates these dissident voices appropriates yeah. in a good way like i'm saying that you know bringing them together you know either trying to destroy sometimes but if you can't destroy and and to to kind of like honor its moral force so i think a lot of this moral force of uh, these uh, dissident communities these outliers sometimes um and rekha would have also talked about coastal communities fish worker communities who uh, who were also uh, you know uh, really marginalized from this uh, kerala model or whatever so i feel that um, this moral force sometimes comes from intellectual force and that intellectual force is about circulation of material circulation of ideas and that most of the time it has come from you know especially recently it has come from people who are uh, residing uh, abroad and or you know people who are moving in different spaces uh not just internationally but to think of in, for example many of these trans people came back to kerala from bangalore and you know all of these space, places where they had um uh, they had um they ha- they had to leave kerala at, at some point and live in these big cities so it's also about you know how can you make kerala livable which is a continuous question that's being asked you know this livability question is, th- is being continuously asked and there is never as we said you know just as the sovereignty question is never closed the livability question is also never closed it has to be renegotiated afresh all the time i'm just i re- regha is i hope she so she's saying that she's not able to join the zoom yeah link is um i'll just call her yeah i can Sp- put her on speaker phone at the back i think do you want to collect them or yeah let's let's collect them here cool um thank you both for this talk it's been uh again like mathematics in that i'm think- thinking so many things at the same time and i'm not sure i understand them yet but thank you um my question is to both of you but sort of angled in slightly different ways the first is about the whether there's like a dynamic uh nisim in the um within the left democratic front as a coalition of parties where certain parties that are members of the front or certain factions of the CPIM um uh represent certain uh corners of capital or have come to at least partner with certain the certain corners of capital certain factions of capital because they see it as part of a you know real problem of development or a real problem of of providing like you were saying in terms of accumulation and redistribution um and uh the version of this for my three I'm, i feel really provoked by this idea of non-sovereign debt or of the the fight over a subnational state borrowing and you know because so much of kerala's economy is both uh at, receives a lot of foreign exchange both in the form of labor remittances and in the form of tourism money um i'm interested in this dynamic of um it's not socialism in one state but it's social democracy in one subnational state like there's a really interesting dynamic here of bringing in all of this foreign exchange money and yet not needing it in quite the same way that other fully sovereign um independent post 
like post-colonial and socialist states need to deal with it in terms of international trade and that kind of thing. So I was wondering what your thoughts were on that aspect and how that has shaped some of the struggles that you're looking at. My name is Rechi. I wanted to say something about uh, the word Nokuvuli. Uh, Nokuvuli actually means a bystander way. It is uh, coined by the right-wing media. This is not the truth and reality actually about the Nokuvuli. Um, Kerala's grassroots labor demands their right to wage when somebody tries to steal that uh, job. Of course, there is a warehouse where people are working and uh, the owner of the uh, property bring his own people and uh, try to remove these people who earn and live with that money. So they always ask, okay, you do with anybody, but we have to get our share. This is what their demand. This is a very a global, this is a global phenomenon actually. Today we have robotics re replacing us and the artificial intelligence is replacing us. But in liberal democracy, we never ask where is our share of money. So this is our grassroots labors are asking. That cannot be seen as something wrong. It should have a very positive impact all over the world today. We have to ask the same question, where is our share? When you take the job outside this country or giving robots the job or the artificial intelligence takeover, this is what they tamed us no cool. It is not some, uh, simply something the labor is stealing something. The labor is demanding something. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I, I, I think I actually said that too, that, you know, work as claim making in the local and wages as rights. Wages as a set of rights, work as a set of rights, and not just as and and also we we cannot uh, also be too uh, taken in by uh, the difference between stealing and taking and demanding and you know all of these things as workers you know we we are entitled to steal uh, and we do almost i mean all of us do uh, <laughs> yes. i call it plagiarism i don't call it stealing <laughs> but yeah was Sure. Um, Can you briefly respond to that? Yeah. Uh, I forgot your, uh, you. Did you say your name? Reggie. Okay. Yeah, it is true. I mean, uh, it's not. It's not so simple. Also, in the question of the framing, because as I said, it's all intermixed with party politics and so on, right? So, for example, the general strike or hartal, which could be used uh, for enhancing or increasing workers. Uh, well-being, rights, and so on. That, for example, has been used instrumentally to, you know, not for the welfare of welfare, like workers. So when that happens, you know, you even legitimate practices of labor claiming their uh, right becomes, you know, intermeshed with this kind of politics, which is merely operates on party politics. That's why it gets a bad name, right? Um, and like, for example, if you don't uh, acknowledge or don't participate in a hartal they can do you, you can use violence for example you know that gives a bad name for the actually what the general strike is meant for and uh, to that that so it's not so simple the framing also right because the pa party involvement and and so on happens so i'll just add my question to the queue yeah. um it, two parts so when Nassim you're talking about the conjuncture of late socialism I mean it brings to mind a lot of a, a couple of critiques one one critique of well is is there a, an encroaching space of state capitalism is that is that what's happening or because in in other ways you're also describing sort of a strong model of redistributive socialism so and and I all know that you also said that both things can be true or two worlds are happening yeah. at the same time. Um, and second, Mitri, um, Maitri, sorry. Um, so you're, I, I loved your, the idea of communist time 
yeah. and that how much that echoes in some ways Susan Buck Morris revolutionary time too um, and you you know you say strongly that it communist time doesn't reside in institutions it resides in this other space where relations are reconfigured but isn't there an attempt inside the institutions to reconfigure those relations so I I kind of while I like it, I'm I'm not quite sure why isn't communist time actually happening in those institutions. Okay, I think. Okay. Yeah, I'll respond to the first. Uh, I'll take those questions first. Or you? Okay. okay, for to answer your question first, obviously, I mean there are different factions with any large movement, right? So uh, there have been always these discussions on what is the attitude that we should adopt towards big capital, capital, and so on. And so that kind of a debate has always happened. Uh, I would say that if you're familiar, there is a strong communist movement. There was a strong communist movement in Bengal province in India where the Communist Party ruled for 36 years electorally. It's never happened in uh, anywhere in the world where a party has returned to power and stayed in power for so long, 34 years. So there the uh, acquiescing to capital was on a more heightened level. They tried to quote uh, neoliberal capital, big capital and so on. And when then they lost the elections and then it's other parties which are, which are ruling there. So these kinds of debates have happened in Kerala too. But as I was saying, because the class composition of the society has changed, there is substantial middle classing of society, higher human development indicators, the per capita income has gone up so much. Actually, now Kerala is one of the richest states in India from, uh, you know, very high poverty levels in the 1960s and 70s as a result of this social welfare and the remittances and so on. So even the party realizes that it has to have a new kind of politics. You can't be just talking about workers' rights and, and so on when the changing composition of the worker itself makes uh, politics different, right? So now they have to talk about, say, information and technology workers and what kind of labor they are doing. You're talking about remittances from abroad and that's uh, the impact of that. So in that sense, yes, now development has become a huge buzzword, as I said before, too, because there is a feeling amongst the middle classes and the educated classes that Kerala is falling behind other states industrially or in a development sort of way, right? So that is why this urge to bring in capital or collaborate with big capital. And those kinds of debates have already ha happened and the present regime is, you know, even while giving revolutionary slogans, is not averse to actually uh, bring in big capital like it happened in a few projects such port, big ports and so on, right? So yes, that has always happened and that is happening in a more heightened level now because of the fact that, uh, and it's also because of the failure, as I mentioned before, the cooperative sector, the non-capital sector, there have been a couple of huge examples of success in Kerala, but they are not the, uh, you know, the main dominant sector. So you don't have an alternative model to show, like in terms of workers' rights, worker-owned cooperatives, etc. There are a couple of very good examples, but you know they're not they're, they're minuscule compared to the overall. So that to answer your question of why this happens of you know having to align with big capital. And to answer your question on late so <laughs> pardon? That's okay. okay. We, we're almost out of time, so oh, okay. you want to share that. One quick end then. Uh, so late socialism, yes. Uh, you I mean it in the sense that Socialism has been the hegemonic construction, the reason for Kerala's, you know, what you can say is common sense. You know, socialism, communist ideals, and so on. So those have dissipated from the late 80s with the collapse of the Soviet Union. There is a famous case of an actual incident of a worker falling unconscious in Kerala when he saw the visuals of Lenin's statue being taken down in Poland. Because that was how mentally he was uh, struck by this, this end of a dream, right? a revolutionary dream. So late socialism, I call it in that sense, that you have still the socialist ideology and communist ideology, but the reality, the material reality is become capitalist. A change from what communist times he was talking
talking about in that sense, an increasing rapid change towards more market-oriented activities. But you still have the classics and <laughs> the remembrances of things past. <laughs> No, I want to quickly try to address some of the questions, uh, but also talk about this, you know, cap capitalist fractions. I think, Patrick, you said, yeah, what kind of capitalist cap fractions of capital are aligning with the party? Did you ask? Did you mean that? Yeah, I mean, it's it's such an interesting story. We were talking about the urban proletariat striking, right? So that meant that there was an urban proletariat in the 1940s. So. Uh, you know, but so you see that over time there is a decline in capital formation um, in 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 Kerala in terms of there is an industrial decline post independence, and uh, even though the uh, the CPM said okay we have to we are we are taking plantations out of the land reforms because we need plantations this is big industry, yeah. all of those happen irrespective of all those you know impulses to. Uh, protect capital from the communist side, we don't have enough industrialization. So you see that in the 2000s post, you know, this, uh, but it's also not just Kerala's fault because that's the architecture in which, uh, you know, the, uh, in which it operated. But then it changed in the 90s after um, the liberalization and all of that. And then you see that you slowly see the big capital like Ambani, Adani's and all trying to come in. And especially in the infrastructural, you know, sector, in uh, through real estate and through all of these, uh, this construction, real estate, uh, uh, you know, coordination that's happening. So what it has eventually ended up doing is to align with Indian big capital in a, in a particular. You could say that. I mean, this will be this can be contested, and I'm sure you know there'll be other opinions. But it it is it it it'll, I mean, this is this is a story, right? It's not. It's not so much about choice, um, you know, just as those workers were striking against sovereignty, they were not thinking, they didn't know how, what's going to happen 70 years down the lane. So this is the trajectory in which capital and labor and the state are moving in a particular, mm, this thing. And, and your question about um, socialist time, uh, I think, you know, I, 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 I wouldn't say that socialist time is not there in institutions because institutions, I mean, we, when we talk about the state, it's about institutions. But what is the, I mean, com, what is, um, how do you uh, push for it? I mean, you know, how do you uh, make claims on those institutions depends on what's happening, the so-called outside. And it you you need to, um, and, and, I don't know. It's it's also about what time is, right? How do you, how, can you not work? Can you, you know, go outside of the laboring, uh, can you be outside your laboring bodies and, you know, do something else? So all of those questions are aligned with how we conceptualize time. And in that sense, you know, it's not just about institutions. Yeah. So, you know, we're not, um, we're not out of socialist or communist time, but we are out of actual time at this, this moment. So um, I'd, I'd like to thank uh, Maitri and Nesim for their contributions uh, this morning. And also, uh, thank you for Rekha for at least trying to participate, um, but uh, circumstances would not uh, permit that. So thank you. Thank you again. Comrades, five minutes and we will reconvene for the new municipalism to continue our discussion.
I need to use the clicker. No, you don't. I do. No. And you also, can use my screen. So they said so, that you can't do that. No, no. They're but I have, they have my presentation. Oh, really? They, they just do. told me that I had to connect myself here. They told me. Let me let me check because I put my pres your presentation here, so it will be just like tick tick tick. Huh? They said that you can't do that. I just checked with them, and they and they said to use the clicker. That's a problem for for me and for. Kazembe. Uh,
to remind if there are people here, there is a, another uh, discussion happening upstairs. Um, uh, and its keyword is Trinity. So Trinity is upstairs. And we are the four something, I guess, down here. So I'm going to turn it over to my comrade Miguel, who will introduce himself and introduce the panel, New Municipalism. Thank you, Rudy. I'm super happy to be here. Uh, I don't know how we're going to perform after uh, such a serious and pertinent conversation with Kerala uh, just before this. And so I am a bit intimidated. Um, I'm always intimidated, uh, but per especially you know after this conversation, we're going to try to do justice um, to uh, the topic as much as we can. As you know, municipalism is an incredibly broad topic. Um, it's uh, it's been on the books uh, and and you know in the writing and in videos and in all kinds of organization and mo movements around the world. Um, it has gained popularity and not, right? And we're talking, you know, decades of, of, of this discussion. So there's as much as four of us can uh, do to touch this topic, but I think we are going to touch it from our own sort of work and perspectives. Uh, I was reminded yesterday after the Brecht play that um, you know, one of the things that Benjamin said of Brecht is that in order to be political, you have to uh, do what you know what you know what to do, right? Uh, of course, for the cause, and and I think this is the position that uh, that the panel uh, uh, brings forward, right? Is uh, as much as you know we are, and we always try to thrive to be part of collectives and social movements and so forth. Um, I think what we're going to be presenting to you now is what we are trying to do to confront or to face or to question um, uh, or to push the topic of municipalism in the current context, no? which I think has been quite uh, frontal in a lot of the work that we have been doing. Um, here, um, I'm going to um, uh, be presenting also the the order of how this is going to go. Uh, Maliha is going to be the first one, then Giuseppe, uh, then Kesembe, and I'm also going to conclude with a, a presentation and then perhaps try to sum up something uh, and then moderate a panel uh, between the questions between the four of us. But of course, we're going to try to leave as much time as possible to. Um, uh, open it to the panels, which is such a contentious and interesting topic that we have to discuss in relationship to the state. And I think even more specifically, because um, a lot of the roots, um, which I will discuss later on municipalism, comes from libertarian municipalism, which many of you uh, regard as being part of uh, um, an anarchist sort of positionality from uh, Murray Bookchin and uh, on all the work that he has been developing, had developed after. And, 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 and well, you know, that's also a very interesting question. I have my own views on this, but I think all of us have the same. So with that said, um, uh, I am going to uh, present Maliha. Um, and we want to have the presentation behind us so that you can start, you know, and that's, that's all. Um, no, that's me. The Maliha is the one with the fish eating the fishes <laughs> and yeah. vice versa. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, and so uh, Maliha Safri uh, is a professor in the economics department at Drew University. Her research has focused on class and political economy, and in particular, the ways that people engage in collective practices in work, housing, and food. Uh, she has published numerous articles, amongst them Science, anti poverty Thinking, Marxism. I have to say this, Maliha, sorry. <laughs> She's like, go on, go on. Um, the Economics Boys uh, uh, organization and edited books uh, also. And Maliha was recently a recipient of the National Science Foundation grant and has a forthcoming book, which I think it's, it's so, so, I mean, like into this topic. And I cannot wait to actually see it out, um, which is called Solidarity Cities and confronting racial capitalism and mapping transformation. Uh, and that is a huge research you took over many years. I don't want to say how many. Yeah, but a lot. Uh, uh, the, on urban solidarity economies uh, uh, among the, the tri-state region, right? In the, in the, in, uh, well, you'll tell us more. You'll tell us more. OK, so please uh, welcome with a huge applause, uh, Maliha. Can you hear me? Um, so I've been working in a mini collective of co-authors, and I'm really presenting our 
joint collaborative work. And uh, so I've been working with uh, Craig Borowiak from Haverford, Mariana Pavlovskaya, who some of you know from Hunter College, Stephen Healy, Western Sydney. Um, we've been looking at the urban realm through the lens of solidarity economies, which we believe has a lot of potential. And I think you'll just get ideas from the evidence that we gathered on how people are ingeniously and collectively meeting core human needs over the long haul into the present. We're not talking about luxuries. We're talking about housing, food, dignified work, fair finance, all through practices set in opposition to capitalist ways of providing goods and services. Second, these things are happening in major ways in communities of color, but not only there. They should be seen as uh, beautiful experiments constituting a toolbox for policies, practices, and projects to be enrolled in creating a new approach to regional economics. And we ground our approach to solidarity economies in an anti-capitalist concept of class. Uh, when most people think of class, they think of income or wealth or a socioeconomic grouping. Instead, we are using class to talk about how people organize producing, appropriating, and distributing of surplus. And capitalism is not the only economy where surplus is produced. Looking at the economic landscape with this kind of diversity means we've got to use this key distinction. What is exploitative, for instance, modern day forms of slavery or capitalism and towards a class process which reaches past as in beyond capitalism to non-exploitative or post-capitalist. This crowd doesn't need convincing that it doesn't matter if there are women CEOs or some poor people that make it into the elite. What we need is a reorientation and reimagining of social systems towards economies that don't root themselves fundamentally in exploitation. And contrary, I think, to what some critics have said about post-capitalism, I don't think it means a grand revolution in which capitalism is superseded. Rather, it refers to all the economies in our midst that can be seen as other than capitalists that stem from a difficult, difficult, uh, it is difficult, but different ethical stance and politics. What we find is people are gathering to engage in economies connected via solidarity rather than via markets. We, uh, we worked with activists. We did surveys, interviews, participated in movement campaigns with many different institutions across all these cities, actually, Philadelphia, New York City, and a smaller city in Massachusetts, Worcester. This is just one quick picture um, uh, that sh is trying to show you the variety of different kinds of collectives that we talk to throughout many different campaigns. And, and like I said, working closely with different kinds of institutions in all of these places. Um, the brown dots are affordable housing cooperatives. The green dots are community gardens and vast majority of community gardens are both in communities of color and food producing. We looked at fair finance through not-for-profit banks, credit unions. We looked at worker and food cooperatives. We worked with them, community-supported agriculture. There's other stuff too, but these are the big chunks, right? And then we wanted to look at the different dynamics of these initiatives. One way was in relation to historical processes of redlining. And what we found was clustering, um, big time. Uh, geographers call clusters hotspots of activity. We found strong evidence of a correlation between these solidarity economy clusters and historically redlined areas of New York City. So one of the big things we're trying to do is see what are the spatial patterns of solidarity economies. And one pattern we identified is what we call the bulwark pattern. Here we concentrate on the kind of bulwark that is organized by and deepens emancipatory post-capitalist politics. What Cooperation Jackson organizers have called uh, the strategy of build and fight. These initiatives are formed as a kind of bulwark in communities to resist racial capitalism and build something else. Overall, you can see right here in New York City, we have enough solidarity economies to work towards a different horizon. One of the, what we call solidarity city. That's the title of our forthcoming book, like Miguel mentioned. Um, in this country, the idea of a solidarity city has been put forward by Cooperation Jackson in Mississippi and all of its sister projects, mushrooming um, in different parts of the US. 
Cooperation Humboldt uh, that I've worked with, Cooperation Buffalo, Buffalo, Austin, Richmond, there's three or four others. Um, for Europeans, the term solidarity city is more routinely used by migration activists. Um, right? S a sanctuary city, solidarity city, refuge city. And I think that's distinct, but we're converging. And we're converging with the kind of politics that they have been pursuing in establishing solidarity cities by focusing on the right to the city and presence. Migrants and refugees are members of the urban community, even if the nation state has not granted them national citizenship or legal status. Solidarity involves migrants, refugees, people of color, those made poor, sharing urban space, claiming equal rights, participating in the enactment of the city through its routines, practices, rhythms. Berlin's House of Representatives me member explained why he was supporting Solidarity City Berlin, an official designation by the Berlin city government. He said, for us, Solidarity City Berlin is an alliance of many groups in different fields. We understand our Solidarity City approach more broadly than an only an official network of cities. We want Want to weave the idea of a solidarity city through all fields of politics. What would that look like? The answers are going to be different. I think some convergence is occurring because, of course, these projects are also using a language of solidarity. Solidarity, not charity, is a slogan with rippling meaning. Solidarity is not about saving others. It's about understanding that my well-being is intimately bound up with yours. Ruha Benjamin put it really simply and beautifully, I don't need an ally. I need you to smell the smoke. Mm. It is not even sensible to close solidarity or foreclose new possibilities. It is ontologically ever open to resignification. I'd like to get super concrete with two examples, one from Philly and one from New York City. And I'm trying to address a central question of how to intersect specifically with the city state over land and buildings. Let's go to Philly. Community gardens in Philly have been providing community-based responses against drugs and violence all throughout the 80s and 90s. In the 2020s, they're engaged in a different type of struggle. Developers are buying up tax-delinquent vacant properties and converting them to condos and apartments priced way above what existing community members can bear. Some gardens have become sites of communal defense against gentrification and displacement. The Cesar Iglesias Community Garden has been at the forefront of this. Named for the, a labor organizer and president of the Puerto Rican Communist Party, Cesar Iglesias, uh, in 2012, they started as a collaboration between the Philly Socialists and local residents, the garden has become an intergenerational prism of low-income, Latinx, indigenous, black struggles for land rights, food justice, community, community belonging, right? Um, and like many other gardens, land tenure is insecure. In recent years, it has lost parcels to predatory developers who, unbeknownst to the gardeners, acquired land titles from sheriff sales, which are municipal auctions of tax land, tax delinquent land. Some of these land grabs were enabled by the aggressive actions of U.S. Bank, which had acquired the tax liens to 33,000 abandoned properties across Philadelphia that the city government owned, um, it, but the city government signed over at a time of significant fiscal distress. And now the bank is trying to cash in, cash out by targeting these properties for development, selling them out from under the communities. Though many of these properties were abandoned, they were far from vacant. They were being occupied by communities, right? These, the city's urban agriculture community rallied around these gardens as a way to resist gentrifying pressures that would push out the very communities that tended the land and stabilized these neighborhoods in the first place. So working with an interracial coalition, multi-class coalition from different corners of the city, including other gardeners, nonprofits, us as academics with a little GIS in our pockets. We're not talking a lot here, guys, a little. 
And uh, the Iglesias Garden acquired U.S. bank lien data. We mapped them against neighborhood demographics and garden locations. And doing this, they were able to identify at-risk gardens and demonstrate the disproportionate targeting of low-income black and brown neighborhoods. Using these maps and data, they led a citywide campaign that resulted in a temporary moratorium on sheriff sales of garden land. This struggle is ongoing. This is like a live feed. It's, it's not done yet, so I'm not trying to say they won, and I'm not reporting on a victorious struggle. It's ongoing, for sure, and there's lots of potential implications, but it's displaying the capacity for complex forms of solidarity spanning across and outward through the city. I'm going to wait for my second case to draw some uh, larger implications across both cities and across two different sectors. Let's switch our attention to housing. In New York City on Thursday night, of course, we had a great panel with Raquel and uh, Miguel and David. Um, uh, so uh, housing, right? Uh, uh, let's talk about housing cooperatives that are coming out of two different origins, Mitchell Lama and HDFC, Housing Development Fund Corporations, right? Um, affordable housing cooperatives intentionally suppress prices of housing either for rent or sale to allow affordability. Now, there's two different kinds, right? Uh, the, the HDFCs, the black dots, are almost all in the ownership category, but that's not true for the yellow dots, which are the Mitchell Lama co-ops, and those are actually split between rental uh, and sale, right? Um, all, uh, so uh, there's lots to get into. All, all, like I said, all require proof that residents' income is below the median income for the neighborhood. There are high flip taxes, taxes upon sale of the housing unit, a binding commitment, to stick to prices determined by a formula, to limit prices, common rules against subleasing. All of these things are trying to return housing to the purpose of shelter rather than financial gain or speculation or as what Raquel had called just housing as financial assets, right? Um, in 2018, 20% of low to median income people who would have been otherwise rent burdened, you know, Miguel talked about all this, what it's like to be living in New York City and just constantly feel precarious. These are the people who don't feel precarious who don't have to worry about, oh my God, am I going to get kicked out? Am I going to lose my housing? Now, there's two different kinds, and there's so much to get into because they're different kinds of siblings, and they come from different generations, and they have different relations to the state. Um, the majority of Mitchell Lama co-ops were built on vacant and reclaimed land. Um, and I know we have person here who's a super expert, Co-op City, depicted, uh, which is in the Bronx, the largest complex. Um, the most units of Mitchell Lama housing were actually built in the Bronx. I know, I'm super nervous. He, he knows so much more about this. He's, but uh, but uh, so Co-op City counts 55,000 residents. It has a high school, two middle schools, three grade schools, its own newspaper. Elders are more likely than averaged in and this is a lot in New York City to be because we already have a high average for this um, to be able to age in their own homes because of thick social networks. For those accustomed to looking critically and skeptically at state practices in the service of capital, in this case, the state was a partner in creating this protected space. Of course, they were dragged along by strong labor unions in the 30s, 40s, 50s, and 60s. Um, unions were advocating on behalf of a working poor constituency, experiencing real problems of crowded subpar housing that was devoid of air and light, which became central architectural features of Mitchell Law. Mama Tower and the Park housing. We have architectural expertise, audience, send me some good vibes here. Um, so defending against predatory landlords meant constructing a new kind of housing that privileged self-management, community control, permanent affordability rules. Now, this is showing intense state involvement via the creation of a new kind of investment vehicle backed by the New York State as fiscal guarantor. Um, Thursday night, Raquel had said, we cannot count on the private sector. The private sector will never provide good, cheap housing. That That's just not possible. Uh, this is something that the state can do, right? Uh, actually 
be the fiscal guarantor for cheap, affordable housing for workers. And if this is the picture of state investment, then the next picture is the picture of state disinvestment, right? Because these are all the housing co-ops that came through the other program in the 70s and 80s, where the state abandoned, uh, and, and of course, landlords abandoned properties. And instead of actually taking ownership, they turn ownership over to the collectives of tenants that are running these buildings with sweat equity. So if so we have, we we really have like two different kinds of housing cooperatives that have very different relations to the state, uh, investment, disinvestment, uh, organized abandonment slash investment, right? Okay, so uh, I'm sh running short on time and I'm just going to paint some quick, broad brushstrokes. Cities come into ownership of vacant land and buildings all the time. This is a continual process. It's not one time, right? And this is the moment to insert radical demands. Um, what does the city do with that land? This is the chance for a different vision of the city to guide us, but we have to have that vision. We want to confront forces of racial capitalism that segregate, prey upon, exploit. We want something else predicated on solidarity. Is the city going to prioritize green space in the context of heat indices rising in New York City continually over the next 15 years projected. City also owns buildings and comes into ownership of buildings. What's it going to do with all those buildings? In 2018, the city announced a $3 billion package deal, giving away tax breaks and a 600,000 square foot 1938 WPA building in Queens to Amazon. Famously, Queens goddamn fought back. And in 2019, on Valentine's Day, Amazon withdrew. It's the first time I ever had fuzzy feelings towards Valentine's Day. That did not get reported that much. But where the story gets even more interesting is activists have pushed forward, succeeded in forming a Western Queens community land trust over that land and building, and it is set to become one of the largest CLT building complexes in the U.S. You can see from behind me the, the feasibility report that has been worked up that will include space for community spaces, communal kitchens, for street vendors, educational space, artist spaces. So, hey, could the city... Instead of providing $3 billion in tax breaks to Amazon, support a community land trust? And the answer, which surprises even me, is, is yes. Yes, yes. yes. It, it, it happened yes. once. It can happen again. Um, and aren't you more curious about that? I, I am, right? Um, I'll end there. Thank you, Malika. Yes, he can provide, <laughs> definitely. Um, and uh, next uh, will be uh, just Josep Boigas, um, uh, coming directly from Barcelona. <laughs> and uh, I think you have a lot to add also to Maliha's uh, so presentation, but it's intimidating. You know, Maliha is always super good. You, know, so it's, you are uh, all intimidating. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay, so let me present Josep. Um, Josep is the director of the Regional Urban Development Agency of Barcelona. It has been for, well, since 2016, I think, since basically the new government of Ada Colau came in. Um, and the agency is called uh, Barcelona Regional. And he's also director of the Barcelona's Agency of Urban Ecology. Uh, he has been an incredibly active member of Barcelona Comú, which is, uh, the, since its inception, since it began, it is the political party that famously, uh, or not, has brought anti-neoliberal and municipalist principles across the world, right? Um, uh, spearheaded uh, by the current mayor, uh, Ada Colau, which uh, you work uh, very closely with. Um, Josep is uh, also an associate professor of architecture at the ETSAB. And of course, since a since long time ago, I won't say how long ago, uh, he has directed and curated many cultural activism programs which have highlighted um, uh, new approaches to the housing problem. So it, it goes into that. Amongst them, uh, I, I will just mention the most recent one, Arquitectos de Cabecera, um, and I uh, also want to add that Giuseppe is a co-founder of the Urban Consultancy Urban Front. Thank you very Great. much, Giuseppe. Thank you. Yes, definitely. <laughs> I'm so intimidated with, uh, with an extra thing, which is my English is not very good. So I had to prepare many, many uh, 
uh, slides uh, in order if I get stuck in any moment. So at least I would have as an image to 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 follow. Okay, I, I just wanted to explain a little bit uh, the the history of what happened in Barcelona during the last uh, years, and uh, it was good to 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 know uh, to to read uh, the book of uh, the power of proximity that that Subirats, uh, has written explaining a little bit this this emergence of the municipality and how in Barcelona I would say is the only city that uh, that remains uh, with the, with this government that came out of this uh, movement after the 15M in 2011 um, and I would say that now we are in, at the doors of next election in 20, the 23rd of this month maybe we are all kicked out of, of Barcelona and that this uh, beautiful story ends up. Hope, we hope not, but it can it can it can happen. And uh, this book, uh, the, the Power of Proximity, explains a little bit uh, what happened, what is happening. <laughs> I don't know where I have to point. Yeah, oh, there. There. Point, point, over there. Uh, no, this is the pointer. Go down, yeah. You have to point that way. I don't know. I think I think I have to point here. I think. No? no, no, well, oh, do this one. Doesn't work. Well, then if images. No, it's impossible. It's too many slides. I need I need to go through uh, them. Uh, otherwise, it would be so annoying to listen to me to say next <laughs> hundred times. <laughs> it works when you yeah. use it. Yeah. Well. Um, the, the, the story, as, as, as it starts, uh, um, at least these last eight years, uh, it, it starts with, with a naivety, or I don't know how you say it, with an ingenuity of, of our mayor that believed that the problems, that the, the real problems that we have, uh, that can be solved locally. That I think it's something that when we heard her uh, for the first time, uh, we, we didn't. We, we thought it was a, a, an ingenuity, a, a little ingenuity at the same that we lived uh, in in '75 when Franco, the dictatorship, died, and our first mayor, uh, Pascual Maragall, uh, said, and that was the first image that we had, that uh, Barcelona could be one of the best cities in in Europe. Something that we laughed. Uh, so hard because it was something that we didn't couldn't even imagine that our city that was gray that we were uh, completely depressed after uh, 40 years of dictatorship that that city could at some point become uh, a, 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 a city a global city um, this um, ingenuity is, is it solved no okay um, this ingenuity also was was uh, lit lit by uh, some uh, people that were talking about the positive metastasis, no, uh, a, a, a possibility of to start with little and to uh, allow uh, those little transformations to become a, a little bit as a positive metastasis. That, uh, for instance, during th those days, of course, there was a great uh, deal of uh, public space. They, we didn't have public space. Uh, we, we had public space, but it was forbidden to gather in public space because Franco didn't allow us to be more than three people in the street together talking. So uh, at that point, the, the important thing was to kind to uh, conquer those uh, spaces and to think about which, which are the public spaces that we needed as a young uh, democracy. Um, <clears throat> this um, explosion of, of optimism, you no, know, it comes, it goes from 1975 until 1992. An uh, explosion that, of course, uh, was organized very much on the uh, for uh, the social society, which was had been those 40 years uh, preparing that moment. You know, all, all these associations uh, related with housing, related with with uh, many other rights, uh, they were uh, at, uh, waiting for the moment that Franco died. To explode, no? and and the people that got to the government, of course, were representing all these uh, enormous uh, movements. But of course, uh, this um, this first moment was in fact uh, related with with emergencies, with uh, with the capacity of uh, doing uh, not exactly what uh, uh, what it needed to be done to solve all the problems, but in fact to really attend the extreme uh, necessities of the people that they were uh, for forgotten during so many years. This, um, 
despotism and lighted despotism at some at some point at, at the same time allowed that uh, working with emergency uh, people that they were government uh, were deciding so fast and 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 uh, with those little actions and kind of uh, create this instrumental rationality uh, to to kind of uh, transform uh, as fast as they could the city and then they come the olympic games uh, of course uh, this this optimism uh, allowed also to have uh, most of the people of the city working together. And uh, uh, at the moment that the, the city asked for the Olympic Games and we gained in, 19, in 1986, um, in fact, nobody cared about sport. No, no, we didn't really uh, care at, at all about what, uh, what the 15 days about sports. The, the main thing was what is in the background was, was the city itself. It was like the great opportunity to all these little things to can become bigger and to let, it, let them grow. You know? All these little associations, they, they got the opportunity to kind of uh, create a, a bigger associations and bigger uh, 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 ambitions for the transformation of the city. But of course, this, um, and, and there's a, a very good image uh, of the, that, that you could see it right <laughs> here, a very nice image. <laughs> Okay, I bus bus only this the batteries. It wasn't me. It wasn't. <laughs> uh, you you if you I don't I'm sure that you won't remember. But if uh, we have the image, you would see it. That the first thing that we did in the Olympic Games was saying hello in the in the in the field of the of the Olympic Stadium. We rode with people uh, with with all the people of the volunteers of the Olympic Games. A big hello, hello to the world. It was like this important moment for us to, to, to say to the people that we exist no? uh, and uh, to say hello and to even our mascot is a, is a dog, a little cute little dog that is kind of hugging uh, the world and saying, okay, come everybody to Barcelona because we love you, we want to have you here, we need you and, and, and all these uh, stupid things now, well, of course, we think about them and, and of course, uh, what happened afterwards, it's, it's, it's also history that we kind of die of success. No? After 92, uh, we of course said hello to everybody, and everybody came, and and so we really started to become that that uh, uh, um, uh, best city in the. I think that this last week came uh, a new that said the Barcelona is the best city in the world, which is a terrible <laughs> thing to 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 listen and to read. Uh, I mean, we have enough problems that that uh, that we don't need to be the best city in the world because that means uh, that that what happened after ninety ninety three is that, of course, uh, the city had to keep being in this map, had, had to keep being in the rankings of, of being the best city or the, or the whatever city in the world. So open uh, the city to big investments, to, to big tourism, to massive tourism. And, and well, what is happening, what happened uh, afterwards, it's uh, this uh, terrible story that goes from uh, 93, um, I would say, till, till 2011 or 2015, where, where uh, Things started a little bit to change. The 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 <clears throat> big companies came and starting with with uh, uh, Pritzker Prize architects uh, to come to Barcelona. I think Barcelona is a city with more Pritzker Prize buildings in the world, and uh, because they knew that if you come with a Pritzker Prize, uh, they will allow you to do ten floor more, or they will allow you to do something else. So. It's like this uh, selling the city, you know? I think it's, it's a very nice, the first logo of the city uh, during the 80s that was very simple and very neat, you no? Know? was Bar, Sell, Ona. Bar, because of course Barcelona is a city of bars and, it, and when we didn't have, when we didn't have uh, a, a squares to, to go and plazas and uh, we had the bars where we instigate for the new democracy. And I think it's a, it's a very important thing in, in our culture, uh, those, those bars, you no? Know? Uh, cell means sky uh, in Catalan. No? It, it was after 40 years of looking down, we start looking horizons. We start looking the sky, and, and I think it was also very beautiful. And ona, ona means wave, uh, and it was also the great opportunity to really discover. Yeah. Good. Thank you very much. Okay. <laughs> now, now I'm going to repeat the whole thing, but very fast. Okay. <laughs> The goal is to be the best city in Europe, Pascual Maragall, our mayor, and we laughed uh, so much. And Barcelona is chosen as the best city in the world. That's the, the, the terrible thing. No? The first period, 79, 92, hola to the world. 
Uh, and of course, we didn't care about these guys jumping. And but what is important is the back the back uh, uh, rope of, of the no, the city. Uh, and of course, the little projects, no, all the little uh, emergency projects that that we did during the 80s, recovering public space, and of course, putting public space as the center of all of all the transformation. Some of them, they were these sentences recovering the center and monumentalizing the periphery no? uh, with, with sculpture, in this case, Richard Serra, that disappeared uh, in the plaza. No? No, nobody knows that this is a sculpture of Richard Serra, this wall, this white wall, mm -hmm. which, which kind of uh, ma uh, constructs the basement of a, of, a, of a palm tree, which this is the important thing. No? You see the, the former image, there was only a palm tree where people gather around and still the palm tree as the monument of, 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 this, of this space or old quarries converted into, into public swimming pools. And, and then came the Olympic with the transformations and of course the honor <laughs> thing no? the, to, to kind of uh, recovering and, and, and having uh, the sea that we didn't, we didn't have. This second period when our dog, uh, little dog went out of the stadium and started uh, the second phase, no? the phase of selling the city and keep going and keep growing and keep uh, investing in the city with, with enormous uh, project which had nothing to do with this first initial uh, a very powerful uh, moment of the, of the beginning of, of the democracy no? and, and, and how the city kept uh, uh, promoting uh, big, big uh, um, uh, things like the Forum of Cultures. Uh, uh, that, that had been built with this, um, I think something that explains very well what happened in to Barcelona at that point was this image of the forum that you had like the logo, no, the logo of two hands uh, giving hand one to each other because it was talking about peace, about so, uh, solidarity, about uh, uh, sustainability. But in fact, for me, it always had been the two hands of the private and public shaking hands and and building the the, the city. No, one in one. One hand, we have this triangular building made by Herzog and de Meuron, which is a public building and is a museum and blah, blah. And next to it, in front of it, there is this terrible uh, other triangular building, which is one of the worst buildings in Europe, uh, made by Robert Stern. It's a, it's a shopping mall that has nothing to do with the culture, with the, with the, with the history and with the model of, of a city like Barcelona. Barcelona, as I was saying. And the next ones were even worse. No? Barcelona, posa guapa. Barcelona, make yourself pretty. No, make yourself pretty. For what? <laughs> For to to to, uh, to know you know it's Sundays you get pretty because there's some you invited somebody to come to your house and you have to look pretty. Don't a little bit like this. And the last one, which is even worse, which Barcelona, la millor boutique del món, the best shop in the world. So we became really a shop and we start selling our city. Like, for instance, this, this uh, stupid building by Ricardo Bofi is a five-star hotel in front of a very popular neighborhood. And, uh, of course, what happened is all those uh, Pritzker Prize coming and, and landing uh, with these uh, uh, buildings uh, uh, that they were privatizing uh, public space and privatizing uh, the city and uh, to kind of keep becoming... Uh, one of those best uh, cities in, in Europe. No? This uh, situation uh, led us to, uh, uh, me, not, not us, but many people start complaining, and there are some very uh, good thinkers. Uh, of course, there is also the Gaudi thing. We, we were proposing at that point to change our name and, and not saying anymore Barcelona and say Gaudi, Gaudi Nona, uh, because everybody uh, no, uh, uh, were also all, also the, the star architects coming to the city. They thought that we are stupid because they start saying to us that they were inspired by Gaudi, which is something that we hate. Uh, and and <laughs> no, like, for instance, Toyo, Toyo Ito uh, repeating the... the the uh, La Pedrera or uh, Norman Foster saying that he was inspired by the drag, the dragon, the little dragon of the of the Parguel, or of course Jean Nouvel uh, reconstructing the what is missing in the Sagrada Familia, no? The 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 and of course inspired by the by the rock that Gaudí was always inspired in 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 on the, and other inspirations even worse, which is the banalization, not not urbanization, but Urbanization of the city uh, with uh, with uh, Dubaiization of the of some of the buildings in this case, no. Um, so the, the the some books came out and I think they are very important and interesting, no. The lying city, you no, know, the city that is lying to us, no, because it's building for the people, but in fact it's selling the city, no. Or I hate Bar directly, I hate Barcelona or urbanization of uh, Francesc Muñoz. So all these. Hola. We said hola to the world and we, we start uh, reco uh, recuperating all those public spaces which we thought they were very important for our young democracy, but we lost them all after 10 years. 
uh, after uh, 10 or 15 years after that moment, we said adeu. Adeu means goodbye. Goodbye to La Ramblas, goodbye to Parguey, goodbye to Paseo de Gracia, goodbye to all those places because they were already in hands of the, of the private investments and tourism. So the third uh, period this, uh, uh, where it started uh, in the 15, well, it was in fact in, in 2011, uh, the 15th uh, of May, uh, people took the streets and they say, stop, stop all that. N not only the problems of Barcelona, it was the problems in general in the whole city and of course in the world. But in Barcelona was very important because in this, in this same plaza, in Plaza Catalunya, they start organizing a new, a new uh, powerful uh, transformation. No? Of course, uh, uh, it was made of all those, uh, again, uh, those little associations uh, that they were gathering uh, at the Plaza Catalunya. Some, uh, they were defending the right to, for housing, like, like Ada Colau with the group of, of La Pa and, and some others. And they organized the government, which they, what, what, what they said is, in fact, to reverse uh, the, the idea of those rights. No? In, in, in this case, we, we try to uh, put in the center the people and around the people like an onion. You, you can construct those rights, but starting by the first one, which is your own skin, is your health. The second one is your house. The third is the, your neighborhood. The fourth is the city. And maybe the fifth, if, if, if we want, of course, the right to, to, be, to become a global city, but not the opposite. That's what we did during the last uh, uh, years. No? We started uh, thinking that becoming global, uh, at the end, we would have, have everybody would live in their houses very happily. And it's not true, never happened. No? So this, the idea of, of, of going uh, just the opposite uh, way. And I'm, I'm not going to explain the strategies we, which are behind and the many projects that are at the same time uh, related with this with this the diagram, no, and, and and how all these projects are distributed in a plan, of course, being taking care that it, you are not uh, just focusing the problems in the pla in the places where where are more uh, stressed, but you have to really redistribute and pre redistribute and redistribute all those projects in the in the whole in the whole territory. Um, some of them, I'm not not going to explain them, but but are quite known. One is, of course, the super block strategy, which means take cars out from the center and, and, and allow people to, to, to take those, street, the, those streets. And the other one is how do we relate again with the sea instead of selling the sea uh, to, the, to the investment uh, and how do we relate with our rivers and the mountain. The, the strategy of the super block is very, very easy. It's, it's like this. You, you just allow cars uh, for some roads and uh, you, uh, at the beginning with tactical uh, elements, no, you start, um, I love this image of David Bravo uh, taking a picture of a uh, uh, street light which is covered with a garbage can. No? I think it's uh, one most uh, like a manifesto of what is it, what is this all, all about. No, and and taking the streets to discuss with with uh, with the people and and with the neighborhoods and 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 to convert the cities which in the center are the cars, no, to a cities which now are, we are about to open the the, the first uh, the, the, the one of the big operations which is the transformation of, of four streets and four uh, corners, no, where where they cross uh, cars and they can become. Uh, uh, parks, no, those are renders, which is a terrible thing to show, but it's it's something that is happening at, at this moment. But the most important thing is not that because we shift the the thing uh, of talking about public space to the talking about housing, and that's why Ada Colau comes from this 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 field, no, the, the housing problem. Uh, it's very important that when we talk about that transformation of public space, it's uh, surrounded with many other projects, and of course the most important is the plan of housing, which is uh, something that kind of it's not only about building houses. It's, not, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a pouring rain of, of many different uh, things that kind of uh, accompany the transformation of the public space. Uh, here, just some uh, some of them. I'm not gonna I'm gonna explain them all because I think that I took all, all, all the time. Uh, but they're just s some little things. You know? Like for instance, this one we love it. It's with the schools done with the. The, the associations of, of the schools that they take uh, in front of the more than 200 schools, they have taken the space and they protect the, the students when they go out from the school, uh, taking space for the cars. Uh, and that's happening uh, like in 200 uh, schools and now 200 more in the next mandate. Or this beautiful idea of the busy bus, no? with, with this a bus that the, the kids uh, go together uh, and they construct a bus with all the bikes and they go through the city and people can gather and, and add. add uh, and, and what I was saying about the, the, the housing plan, which is quite complex, and, and of course I, I won't have time to, to explain it, and I think maybe... I will leave it uh, right here. Hello.
Thank you, Josep. Um, we, uh, yeah, you recovered quite fast and well, right? Um, uh, I'm, we're part of the discussion we're going to have later is, of course, how all of these transfer into, uh, you know, Ada Colau's municipal strategy, municipalist strategy, because, I mean, they presented a lot of these projects also here in New York and many places around the world. But for the moment, um, I'm presenting my third guest uh, or the third panelist, um, a, which is Casembe uh, Balagun. Um, and uh, Kasembe, many of is very well known in the city, but I will just do it again because we have a lot of uh, visitors around. He's an organizer, writer, philosopher, cultural worker who lives in the Bronx. For over 20 years, um, Kasembe has been a very active member of a number of different movements, including from the very early get-go, Student Liberation Action Movement, Coalition to Free Mumia Abu, Jamal, uh, the Black, Black Against the War, Malcolm X Grassroots Movement, I mean, I, I could go on and on. I'm not going to do that. But you get the picture, right? It's a lot. Uh, his work is centered in building spaces for dialogue and education for community development across multiple disciplines. He has worked as an education director for the Brecht Forum, a progressive arts and culture center that we used to have, uh, which was great. Um, and, um, and recently also he served as a project manager for the Rosa Luxemburg Stiftung on a New York office where he mostly focused on racial justice and issues of the right to the city. Uh, Kesembe, of course, has appeared uh, in many uh, organized programs from Metrograph, Get the Institute, Brooklyn Academy of Music, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, um, and uh, Black Archives in Amsterdam and so forth and so on. So Kesembe is your floor. Thank you very much. <laughs> Should I, should I take this one? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Take that one. Check one, check two. Oh my God. Um, I'm thankful. I'm grateful. I'm a little nervous because I see so many people I, I love and respect here. So I don't want to fall on my face. But, you know, um, I, I'm, I'm grateful because um, the loving space that's always been created by the comrades here, um, particularly. Uh, the comments from CUNY, the Graduate Center, um, which I, you know, before you graced us, I mean, first of all, I mean, people, I go to Graduate Center sometimes, and people's like, oh my God, do you teach here? And I'd be like, yeah, actually I do. <laughs> you know, but, 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 I, but I feel so welcome there in so many different ways in terms of community outreach. But, but even before then, um, specifically Brother David Harvey, um, who I've known for years through my work at the Breck Forum, um, you know, we, you know, and the work of Liz Amestris and Max Willenbeck and a whole hundreds of people who helped, you know, build um, a space, that space before this um, magnificent space exists, existed, um, which is an awesome space. I, I like to call this space uh, the People's Forum, Havana by the Hudson. <laughs> um, but even before my work at the Breck Forum, I had an opportunity to work deeply with um, with uh, with Ruthie, um, and Greg, Craig. In fact, um, one of the foundings of a Critical Resistance, I was out on the West Coast, and it was my birthday. I think I was 22. It was 98. It was right after the Black Radical Congress, and <laughs> that was even funny too because I remember like I was talking to like it was a, it was a, the Black Radical Congress was a gathering of 5,000 black radicals. And it was like a fever dream. And so like, it was this one point where like, Boots Riley is having a conversation with Cornell West. And then like, you know what I'm saying? And I'm like, I'm, I'm dreaming, right? This is not really happening. But then in a corner, there was this big eyeball. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? There was an orange and fiercely red eyeball. I was like, what is that eyeball? It was like, it is the critical resistance. And I was like, that's the panopticon. And I was like, whoa. And I was like, wow, okay. So I followed the eyeball to West Coast, right? Um, and it was my birthday, and I was hanging out, and like, you know, and, you know, actually, Greg and Ruthie were nice enough to host a birthday party with me with a bunch of comrades. And I still remember that because that was a lowest, I actually got in, equated with this place called Lowest Deck Pie Queen, which I'm hoping is still there, um, which he introduced me to. So every time I'm in Oakland, I only go to California every 10 years since that time. So I'm, I'm due a trip in 2000 and um, when I'm 50, which is 2000 and soon. Um, <laughs> but I, I wanted to talk about this because I just, 
I guess for me, like, you know, and, you know, and I get to know Miguel too, because Miguel also did a break for him, but also do Rosa Luxemburg and, you know, and I'm right now I'm, I'm part of what, you know, for the first time in 15 years, I do not work for an organization named after a German communist. Um, um, the bottom line half won't take my phone calls. Um, um, but Miguel also had a chance to work with extensively and his wife also, Gabrielle in the audience um, at Rosa Luxemburg very, very well in terms of right to the city and did the work that we do. And Malia and some of the comrades in Barcelona, um, Santi and, you know, a bunch of other comrades who I've known over the years. And um, I guess for me, like my, my contribution is just like part of it today. I mean, I, I have a, I mean, I was trying to think about what I wanted to talk about, what I wanted to lead with, but this for me, part of it is just like a lived experience of being, part and parcel of the city and what does it mean to be left in the city? You know what I'm saying? To be militant, partisan in your thinking, you know what I'm saying? Philosophically partisan in the city. And who were those influences that left me in the city? Um, because I wanted to, because I want to leave a mark of remembering. I talk to Shalene about this all the time. Shalene Rodriguez, who's my friend and a great painter, drawer. She had this excellent exhibit downtown. She did portraits of me and Ruthie and She's just a brilliant person, so so smart. Um, and yeah, Ruthie wrote this great essay in this, and and um, and and I just I just wanted to say, um, and I talked to her. I said, you know, one of the things I noticed about POC, people of color movements and black movements is that we don't get to leave our own memories because we're, we're either in exile, we get arrested, or the state kills us. So this consistent because so this consistent work remembering, but not only remembering, critically remembering the work we did. So it was not just nostalgia back down memory lane, but we're actually in that system of, system, system of consistation. And that's what you mean by activating an archive. A lot of the young kids talk about archives. And let me tell you something right now. I've never done anything with the idea of it being an archive. So if, you, if anyone that wants to do my biography, Please be generous with me and also know that I don't write anything down. So, so my archive is just a bunch of vibes. <laughs> um, but I'll leave, it with, I'll leave it with this. How did I get started? And I don't share this, I don't share this story often, but it gives you a sense. So it was 1992. The Rodney King Rebellion just happened. There was an attempt to walk out at my all boys Catholic high school that was, that, was, that was snitched on and stopped both by internal snitches, the students, but also by the brothers and the fathers who stood in front of the door and said, you guys are not leaving the school <laughs> but under, any, under any circumstances. I was mad. I was so angry. I was so angry. I was like, I need to find an organization to do something to curb this anger. So during this, so this time, 1992 was also the year that um, the, the Democratic National Convention is happening. And my sister, who worked near here, Mass Square Garden, happened to you know, come home and said, you know, there was all these people outside of the Democratic National Convention. Here are all these newspapers that they handed out. I don't know if this is of any use for you. And she just landed them all on my table. I had, she had no idea that she was my gateway drug <laughs> into the left. Every imaginable newspaper I read that day, and I read things that I'd never heard before in my life. The idea of an alternative history, the idea of that there's, there's, these things are have and have nots. Who is this guy named Karl Marx? Why is he always stumbling up so much trouble? I had so many questions, and I was 16 years old. So I looked at the various presses, and they all had their minimal demands. Some of them said, I want to demand $15, a minimum wage of $17 an hour. Some said, I want a minimum wage of $19 an hour. Me being my mother's son, I chose the one that said, I want the minimum wage of $22 an hour. So that's the one I called on that phone call that night. So they arranged for me to meeting. 
And the meeting was at the Polo Grounds where I live, because public housing, 155th Street and 8th Avenue, the Polo Grounds. The reason I live in the Polo Grounds is because my mom's lived over there. They lived on Sherman Avenue in the Bronx, and they used to take my parents over to George Kilmer Park. She saw it being built, and she went downtown and got an application. And it was a big deal back then to get into the Polo Grounds because it was right on 8th Avenue, super cheap, super modern, a lot of hope. So my family moved there in 70-something, 70, 70 right? But I'm at the Polo Grounds. They said, I'm going to arrange a meeting for you to Polo Grounds. Get to the Polo Grounds. Um, we have a conversation, me and this comrade, white comrade. They're like, you know, there's a meeting today, this afternoon. Would you like to come? We can drive you over. And I, saw, I said, okay, sure, why not? Go over there, drove her over. And I said, so why not? And so I walked, we walked to the car. It was a white car. And it said, w, I remember this. I don't know why I remember these details so, so vividly. But it was like, WW, it said, she had a poster or sticker on the, on the window said, had a panda bear on it. And it said, WWF. And I said, what does that panda have to do with wrestling? <laughs> I was already confused. But I jumped in the car anyway. I jumped in the car. You know what I'm saying? I took the red pill. <laughs> went, to the, went to the meeting. Everybody was calling themselves comrade. And I remember them singing a song at the end of the meeting. Arise ye prisoners of starvation. Arise ye wretched of the earth. It blew my fucking mind. I felt some, for, for a minute there, I felt strange because I had never heard people talk like that. But I did, did remember that I felt a love of humanity and universality that was something that I had never seen before. And so I was like, this is where I want to go. Now, I, they drive me off and they go home. But what I didn't know was that how much, how much, dis, how much pain I caused my family. Because Miss Ruthie, another Ruthie, who had a built, who had a built, who had, who, who had a, apartment facing the avenue saw me jumping into that white car and immediately called my mother and said, I saw blank jumping into that car with a bunch of white people. And my mother went looking for me and said, my father, my brother looking for me. And when I got home, my mother was like, where did you go? Where were you? And I explained to her what was happening. And she was like, you are under no circumstances I'll ever talk to those people again. But I did it anyway. I said, listen, they have a song. <laughs> I'm sold. <laughs> later, on, later, on that day, my, 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 later on that day, my father, I heard my father talk to my older brother and said, you know what? I don't care what he does. I just don't want him, I don't, I just don't want him to end up like Robeson. And, you know, Paul Robeson, and that was an expression of the kind of anti-communism that he remembered growing up, what happened to Robeson. All right. So why am, I, why am I saying this, right? And this is, and I'm not, you know, I'm not trying to be, you know, I don't know. I'm just trying to, I'm trying to think, the part of the reason I'm saying this is because this act of remembering, Right. So important to remember, right? This, this work of the city is important to remember. Um, and so, you know, I join and I become a writer. Um, I write. I hand out the press. I speak on street corners. And I, I notice what's something that happened is that in that process, I'm creating a public. And I'm, and I, and I, you know, but the public is creating me. Because it's not easy to talk to people about, you know, transforming the world on the block. Because people don't want to hear that stuff, to be honest. Some people do, but it's a challenge. But even in the challenges, the challenges I receive from other people it aided me in my understanding of how to do education, how to think differently about things. And so I'm saying this all to say is that 
Um, we saw what happened with, that, with, with Jordan Neely the other day. And, 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 you know, and I was, and I, and, you know, and I was, I was, I was furious. And, and I think a lot about this because the response of, um, the response of Eric, the response of our mayor, only a few months ago, the mayor said, um, I'm a follower of Jesus Christ. I'm a follower of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ informs my, 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 my policy. And then to see his response after this, what happened to Jordan Neely, I had to say, well, what Jesus are you following? Because the Jesus that I know, that I follow, um, thinks about compassion for the poor, um, compassion for the for the for the for the for the for those who are, who are going through it. But then I realized that in this politics of this this municipality, is this micro politics of these institutions that shape us. And so you know, I'm looking forward to hearing the talk of Raquel and uh and uh the comrade um. Giapala. Because I met some comrades in Brazil a while back who are digging through this idea of evangelicism. And I think a lot about like the, the formation of municipalities, municipalities that require also not require a new politics, but new faith. So we need new institutions and we need to start with the church as well. You know, um, because there's a specific type of evangelicism that's reaching out, that's that's bolstering a particular type of centrism. That's not good for our people. Um, and so I say this all to say, and I don't want to take up too much time, is that I think that it's, it's a requirement for us to think about as we're developing this idea of a new municipalism, those new institutions that allow us to become new citizens and participatory citizens and democratic and democratic dem, dem, democracy making in the face of the state, which is at this point under, under the tight control of austerity, is making, is making crime, making prisons, making poverty. So then we need a new citizenship. Um, I want to say a couple more things that I'll be done, okay? Um, We can't really talk un, un, undo and not talk about um, the power of small left institutions to undo and to really do the work of collective organizations. Um, one, 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 one organization I'm thinking a lot about is the, the Lafarge Clinic, uh, who was named after Paul Lafarge. I think that's how you say Paul Lafarge, Marxist son in law, um, uh, who wrote the essay, The Right to Be Lazy. In, in Harlem, there was a Lafarge clinic that was organized by the Harlem left, um, namely Richard Wright, Paul Robeson, and also Ralph Ellison, to specifically do work amongst the mentally ill in Harlem in the 1940s and 1940, 19, late 1930s, 1940s. Um, just wanted to mention that because I think that's also an institution that's really important. Um, and then I want to say also is that um, I, you know, um, I love what you said, Malia, about uh, Co-op City, because the Co-op City is where I found refuge in. I live in Co-op City now, and I think part of part of living in Co-op City is that also it's just like we're always like, and we can talk about this after, afterwards, but it's kind of like it was started primarily. It was it was integrated from its very beginning but recently has become majority African-American and Latino. And I think that, you know, and so there's a way that, you know, this, you know, I love what you said with the other day of Shalene's ex exhibit about organized um, abandonment, but also think about organized flight and how, and how sometimes we take over these institutions 
And then part of the activism is also reactivating that. So the democracy making and cooperative building of making that a cooperative, you know what I'm saying, is consistent work. And how do we, how do we, how do we utilize funding to make that work happen? Um, which is something that I'm very interested in too, because you know, the the, the markers are there. But um, but I'm all this to say is I hope I haven't taken up too much of your time, is that I just think a lot about what does it mean to remember as, a, as an activist. Um, and also that act of remembering is also this, this work of, of, of consistent resistance. Um, you know, like I'm always reminded that, you know, they, there was a saying that during the, that during the, um, the, the, the Portuguese, uh, during the, uh, the, the, the anti-colonial war against the Portuguese that they can bomb the clinics they can bomb the hospitals, they can bomb the schools, and they can take that away from us, but you can't take that away from us if it's in our mind. And we carry those institutions on our backs. And as long as we carry those institutions on our backs, we can always have the architecture to rebuild them. And so that's the way I want to think about the work that we do in terms of municipalism, because there's a lot of forgetting that happens a lot of times. But sometimes we, as militants, as class conscious, relatively conscious militants, um, students of life, lovers, poets, painters. Um, I see a lot here, a geographers. Um, geographers. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, we have to also be able to do this work. Um, and also, again, you know, push forward in terms of what does it mean to be and develop a new citizenry. Um, yeah, so yeah, that's, that's my contribution. Um, thank you so much. And, um, I look forward to questions. Thank you, Cassandra. Uh, I mean, things are, are really, uh, coming up together for the, um, Brief presentation yeah. to try to put things together. I don't know how, but uh, but no, it's very clear. It's very clear. Um, so um, we have there. Yes. Uh, no. Yeah. Miguel Robles Duran is an associate professor of urbanism and chair of the graduate urban programs at the New School Parsons School of Design in New York City. He co-directs the Transnational Urban Consultant Consultancy, Urban Front, and the New York City Rotterdam-based Design Cooperative Cohabitation Strategies since 2020. He hosts Cities After, a bi-weekly podcast and YouTube program about the capitalist contradictions of our urban world. <laughs> yes, oh, he gave it to me, yeah. and he made me... Go ahead. Um, uh, okay, so um, with the, these uh, wonderful presentations, I think I'm, I'm going to try to put a little bit of a um, um, of historical uh, uh, line on, on municipalism, and, and I put together a very short presentation uh, so that we can get into the conversation. We have uh, you know, enough time, but it's going to be cool. Um, uh, that uh, I called municipalisms, confederalisms, and supranational urbanization, whatever that means. Very cryptic title. Now that I read it, it's like, what the hell I was thinking? Uh, but nevertheless, um, I, I think I, it's very important to start, you know, when we're talking about municipalism, and I've already uh, mentioned at the beginning, I think we all, all the time, are drawn to the concept of libertarian municipalism, right? And, and this is, uh, brings us back to Bookchin's uh, principles, um, and, and I think it's, it's very important to mention that uh, this is something that Bookchin actually said, um, that he believed that municipalism was actually a way out of the deadlock between, and I'm quoting him right now, uh, between Marxism and anarchism. Whether that is a thing, I mean, we're here to discuss that, right? But he saw the possibility of creating a new kind of governance structures that were not... Um, uh, 
uh, trying to take the state. And this is, I think, uh, perhaps at the at the beginning, uh, at the most important part of the com com sort of conference or what we're trying to talk here, because um, there are two very different positions, right? One is the 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 more um, um, I won't say classical because it's not classical. It's happening and it continues to happen. But the more um, a strong position towards, you know, taking power, you know, as we've seen in, in many cool attempts that have been done by the left and, and by uh, people that uh, want to in instigate uh, or, or start a different kind of socialist imaginary by taking the state. In the case of Bookshin, uh, it was very clear that that was not um, what he wanted to do. But nevertheless, and this is, I think, the big question always between anarchists and Marxists and so forth, right? When we discuss questions of the state, um, uh, well, anarchists not, and then anarchists say, you know, fuck the state, and then, you know, the, 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 the Marxist says, well, you need the state, and so forth. And he was trying, as he was building this, um, is trying to form this very interesting governance model. Now, I think, and that's my perception, and, and this is not a perception uh, that perhaps is generally uh, given to Bookchin, but I don't think Bookchin was too much inspired by anarchism, although he considered himself a form of anarchist. But I think he was very, very inspired by many of the social movements that were happening at the time, specifically radical feminism and, um, and radical environmental movements. Mm -hmm. Um, and that have developed themselves um, horizontal decision-making processes, uh, of course, that had issues of inclusivity, um, e ecological consciousness, very important in the work of Bookshin, right? And, of course, everything we've been talking about here, which is cooperative and solidarity economies. And, yes, uh, although they're part of a certain anarchist tradition, I think in the period that Bookshin was writing this, they were much more part of the radical feminist uh, movement that were trying to push this, right? And so there's a lot of saying that, you know, that, uh, the, the, yeah, the Bookshin uh, took a lot from that. Let's put it, let's just leave it that way. Um, and, and that, I think, is a very important thing that I want to mention. Now, yes, um, I want to um, also emphasize that municipalism rejects, and again, I said again, ceasing state power, right? Um, as its name implies, it's the focus of reconfiguring the local level of government, or the municipality in this case, right, um, as the site of political organization and decision making. I think this is a very important uh, part of what I want to discuss later, uh, you know, with all of you. you know, that we're not discussing state as state power, but it's how can we reconfigure local levels of government that some form begin to expand into a different structure of governance, right? Um, and once it's radically reconfigured, of course, the municipality would serve as the basis of an organizing alternative uh, economic system, social institutions, and of course, all of them that challenge the dominant capitalist system, right? That's uh, where it comes from. Um, of course, to go beyond the local, towards uh, regional, territorial, territorial, and ultimately global politics, which is where municipalism crosses another thing that Bookchin wrote a lot about, which is the discussion of democratic confederalism, right? Or what he would call a confederalist system, in which autonomous, self-governing municipalities would work in a unified structure at an international level. I'm always taken by the idea that, you know, the, perhaps the capitalists use global and, and, and those of us that come from another place uh, use international. Uh, but uh, if I say global, I, I apologize at some point in the talk because it's just <laughs> language is so taken here. But um, it, what confederalism was defined so, yes, it's here, um, it's very important. It's a system based on a governance that is, that is on networks of councils. And we're talking networks of councils rather than a centralized state. And in this case, what Maliha presented, you know, just at the maps of, of, um, of course, of the tri-state and the regions that you're operating, we're discussing a very strong uh, sort of council, uh, confederalist system, perhaps that it's operative, but it's not uh, emphasized as much as it should be. We will discuss that, right? In the case of what Kasembe was mentioning, is uh, you're talking about these councils of memory, I think, right? That connect us between different other regions, right? That are present and so forth. And in the case of Barcelona, there have been a lot of attempts of producing a much more um, status quo uh, sort of through the state structure of uh, these councils, right, that go in there. Now, these confederal councils take an, uh, the charge of administration 
coordination, and they serve as a key for establishing connections amongst towns, neighborhoods, cities, and amongst these networks. Now, the first thing that I want to argue here is that I think that neoliberalism has already rendered its own variations of municipalism or confederal councils as part of its global system of urban governance. It's already here. I mean, they're there. These councils are composed by, of course, supranational organizations. And I want to emphasize the supranational, you know, beyond the state. You know? And this is another contradiction, very interesting contradiction here, right? We keep on talking about the state, but here we're discussing these supranational organizations. Of course, as everything that emanates from the inners of capitalism, they are opaque, fundamentally undemocratic, and in most cases, they operate above the laws rules and regulations that govern us all, right? Or the majority of us, let's put it that way, not, of course, the billionaires. So typically, these supranational organizations, and the most commonly referred to, of course, are such as the nation-state-driven, such as the World Bank, IMF, BRICS, NATO, you know, and I can go on and on and on, but I think we all can refer to these supranational structures. Um, uh, but for today's sort of, uh, clo not closing, but setting up of this, end, uh, this part of the panel, I want to focus on the private industry-driven council. So those of the NATO and so on, I would consider they're state-driven, but there's these private-driven uh, industry uh, councils that are integrated by a very different type of logic, which, of course, pairs up very well. In this case, I am discussing the global consultancy and think tank machine, right? And uh, this is just like uh, an image of so many logos that I can put in front of you. Um, but uh, within this, I'm referring to McKinsey, uh, uh, Bain, uh, Boston Consulting, PricewaterhouseCoopers, Accenture, Deloitte, uh, Ernst Young, Parthenon, um, and the like. And of course, we cannot forget that these, these uh, consultancy agencies are completely um, mixed with the financial industry, right? So it is very common to see them operating together with... Uh, Morgan, JP Morgan Chase with UBS Payne Weber. I don't know if it's Payne Weber anymore, but it should be UBS Credit Suisse now, I guess, yeah. right? I mean, something like that. Uh, so um, all of these, Deutsche Bank and so forth, that you commonly see them, you know, in cahoots, basically, co combined together with uh, what is this, uh, in, this, organ this um, consulting groups. And adding to that, I would put um, in think tanks and institutions, including our own universities, right, that are uh, very much part of this. No? And so these supranational private organizations have become widely responsible. I do think so, that they're incredibly responsible for many of the urban and territorial ills uh, since they started to emerge as global powerhouses in the 1980s due to the coming of neoliberalism and so forth. And the way they emerge, I'm going to totally simplify it and summarize it, uh, not summarize it, but simplify it in a very crappy diagram that I made, that was making uh, yesterday, actually, but I thought it was very easy to visualize, is that if you thought, if, if, um, if we take the tale, uh, I finished reading recently uh, the book of Nancy Fraser called um, uh, Cannibal Capitalism, and, and she determines that an, a phase of, of capitalism that pre-existed um, neoliberalism was some kind of referring to the state uh, capitalism or the welfare state capitalism. If we come up from that, we would see in the diagram that I have behind me is that the state had a lot to say during the welfare conditions, um, uh, the public or the, the state public, um, in R&D, social reproduction issues, issues of healthcare, food production, of course, housing, education, transportation, environment, and so on. And all of these uh, units um, were um, had within the, the cities or the governments had their own think tanks, their own offices, right? So, for example, the housing office, I think uh, uh, Barcelona is one of the few remaining, I think, of your size, like the one that you direct. But in most places in the world, including New York, most of the services that used to happen within the public realm or within the realm of the city or the state um, have been given away, right? And they have been given away, of course, um, uh, to private consultancy firms, right? And so you would see that there was a certain intelligence of the public, whatever that means, and I know it's state capitalism and so forth and so on, but nevertheless, it was more in the hands of the public, uh, uh, whatever that means. Tell that to Henri Lefebvre in France, he hated uh, precisely these bureaucracies you know, that were there. Now, from this point on, 
Uh, what the neoliberalism did is that it took over all of these agencies, right? All of these think tanks that belong to the public and made it theirs for the very specific purpose, right, of uh, promoting, of course, all the things that we know. So at the sponsorships of these private consultancy firms and financial partners, then suddenly city mayors around the world began to coalesce in just like enormous amount of multinational meetings, right? Um, and uh, it, this, is, this is very interesting because you see from the 1980s onwards, the amount of summits in which you have municipal mayors, right, going, uh, the majority of them actually sponsored by Accenture or by JP Morgan Chase or by BP or, or by whoever are these, you know, private entities. And then you see mayors going back and forth, back and forth to this and can go on and on and on on these forums, right? Uh, uh, this was a very, very fast search that I did online, but I think it's, it's very easy for us to imagine, you know, all of these mayors, um, you know, United Nations, and that includes a lot of United Nations work, right? And I have to say specifically UN Habitat uh, or C40, you know, which many of you might know, they're sponsored by also these type of, of consultancy groups of these organizations. So even C40, which is to, supposed to bring the environmental aspects, you know, into, you know, we are destroying the planet, etc., belongs to this specific consultancy logic. Right, um, and this um, uh, I can go on and on. Now, uh, let me read you a bit uh, before I advance on this. Um, something that uh, J.P. Morgan Chase and the Brookings Institute, which most of you might know who they are, um, uh, put together an initiative. One of those initiatives that is called uh, the Global Cities Initiative. Right? And he says, it's a joint project of the Brookings and J.P. Morgan Chase aimed to strengthen the international economic connections and competitiveness of city regions through research, demonstration projects, advisory support, and peer networking. I mean, this is like, that's freaking municipalism there, but of course with a different meaning. Um, this Global Cities Initiative activities included more than 25 research products, tools for practitioners, 50 summits, 50 working in sessions in so many states and countries uh, in the areas, in metropolitan areas, to implement local tailored strategies, melding think tank insights with real world action. The, in, the, the initiative helped metropolitan areas assess their position and assets, position and assets in the global marketplace develop comprehensive approaches to boost trade and investment, share promising practices, forge partnerships with the region and their international counterparts, and of course, advance supporting program and policy changes, all of them in favor of the thing we hate the most, capitalism, right? Um, and uh, with this said, then you have uh, a number of um, uh, sort of Topics of uh, that that I have been researching on what is the role of consultancy firms in the relation of decision making power, and you realize that it's not only through these institutes that they do that, but they're they're happening operated so closely already with governments from a national, regional, and so forth level. And so I scanned a few you know of these news uh, papers, but I'm sure you find them all over the place. Specifically on McKinsey, New York uh, taps McKinsey to develop a Trump-proof economic reopening plan, but New York has consulted with McKinsey so many times in the last 30 years. And then, of course, Bloomberg, one of the mayors we had, created its own consultancy firm, which, by the way, sponsors uh, also C40, uh, the global C40 thing, right? Um, uh, with all of its uh, groupies that were his uh, secretaries or ministers and so forth that have created so much damage to our city. And so I can go on Macron with scandals, of course, with favors to McKinsey, Pete Buttigieg, you know, uh, also favors to McKinsey, uh, the NHS consulting, the, the British, you know, thing consulted to McKinsey, McKinsey in a big mess of $100 million contracts in Canada, in different cities with eyes, right? McKinsey with eyes, you know, you, you know the police, right? The, the absolute police of Trump to take over uh, away our migrant communities here. Um, and, um, a, you know, and I can go on and on and on. Now, uh, so I'm putting all of these images. Uh, sorry, I was advancing here and not back here. But what for us, and I'm talking, I'm going to start to talk uh, in, in, in plural, uh, a group of, uh, um, a bunch of people, a bunch of friends, started to question if the possibility of emphasizing municipalist uh, politics in the relationship with, uh, with Bookchin and Marx and many other people started to, uh, to, to do, to take, was how do we repopulate the void on, think on, think on intelligence of producing our environments that has been 
taken completely by these private organizations. Um, there is no resources anymore to create, you know, the specific, um, like a going back of this, that's what I think. And I just want to emphasize that we have a huge void of thinking, of intelligence, right? Um, governments no longer consult governments, consult these private organizations, uh, which have a very, very specific logic, right? And pointing out to this void is something that um, I, I think I'm going to start to co conclude here, but the way I see it is that we have this three general directions to take. And these are super general directions, right? I mean, like, and, and I'm sure there are four and five. So one is to let this ecosystem, the ecosystem of the private takeover of everything public, uh, go to its ultimate consequence, right? And see if a revolution comes, um, which is um, no public government or what we want to call a fake state or a plutocracy or idiocracy, right? In that way. Um, a second option, which has been taken by a lot of governments of the left, you know, is the idea that we have to struggle to return to build some kind of welfare state, right? Um, in the rebuild these public development agencies, uh, repopulate its bureaucratic apparatus. No? Um, and that, I think, uh, we, there's a lot of discussions on this topic in the housing space. You know, the should the government provide this, et cetera, et cetera. Well, a group of friends uh, and myself have thought that there might be a third uh, direction, which is how to fill the social political void that has been left by these pro-capitalist private consultancies that are that are uh, you know that we could form a struggle to replace them uh, with private public partnerships instead of private public partnerships sorry with collective private or communitarian private partnerships right so if they have left us with that language how I mean a lot of these things are happening. I mean, with Maliha uh, saying. And so there is a, um, a connection that I've always liked to make with this diagram, which is we have public to government, then we have from public to private, and we feel that, that we have to focus on the from public to collective. So how to take government out of the hands of government and bring it into the hands of people without taking over the state, which is another sort of argument that we are going to be discussing, right? So um, in this line, we're talking that uh, with doing that, we create partnerships to develop radical distributive policies or initiatives that align with municipalist, communalist, confederalist agendas that revolutionaries like Marx and Federici or the Subcomandante Ramona or the Black Panthers or Sunra or Bookshin have imagined at some point. So with this said, um, uh, I, this is where it gets lame because we all try to do things and this is of course not enough and, and of course there are many of these uh, attempts. But we set ourselves with this group of friends, we're 23 friends, to develop an organization that we call Urban Front. And there's a group of people that is our 21 friends from Quito, Montevideo, Medellin, Palestine, Khartoum, Ottawa, Barcelona, Paris, Rotterdam, Philadelphia, and New York City, and have been working on the creation of what we jokingly name uh, a McKinsey of the left, um, uh, which is, uh, it's an interesting conception, right? Um, which would be, an or is, because we're already operating, an international consultancy that brings a certain advice, but contrary to bringing neoliberal advice to governments, we bring eco-socialist intelligence uh, with the goal of helping left and progressive governments transfer political power to collective bodies, implement redistributive politics, and ultimately structure municipalist confederations. So um, I wish I had, uh, well, I don't wish, I'm, this is a, a terrible thing to say now, but we are working with a, a very concrete examples. Uh, right now we're working with the city of Mexico, uh, Mexico City on some housing matters, but a member of the group of Urban Front, Ana Rodriguez, started to create municipalist links to the newly elected mayor of Quito, which is a progressive uh, um, uh, uh, mayor, um, on how could they start contributing and collaborating between uh, Mexico City housing policies, which uh, are as terrible as we are, have it here in New York City, they're, you know, all free market, but how to develop links and networks within it. And our attempt with this is to start to um, reconfigure how the people that we service, in this case, left governments, can begin to coalesce in, you know, international, more broader strategies, municipal strategies in support of this, right? Um, so I will leave it there. Um, and uh, that's basically the discussion I'm saying. I'm not going to explain what I have in the back, but, uh, but I hope that brings a little bit uh, together what we we are trying to say, and we can start conversations. Thank you very much. Yeah. Okay, so. Uh, 
theoretically speaking, we have 25, 35 minutes, I think, of conversation, but I'm going to try to keep it a bit shorter so we have a break uh, for the next one. Um, I know Rachel, Ra Ra Raquel, okay, Raquel. Uh, Raquel wants to talk, wants to uh, talk, but um, do you want to start with the conversation? Yeah, let's start it. I mean, I was going to do it, but why not? Raquel is going to be in the next panel, and you have a lot to say, of course, on this. So, just okay. Well, the Well, that was a fantastic panel. Thank you all. Um, and very provocative. But I will add some other provocative tones um, on it. Because I think that a, a common thing that arose from this panel are basically two things. One is the role of property. Mahila, she made very clear, and I think this is a crucial thing, how much public commons, public things, can be really, really appropriated by all, <laughs> can really be universal. And this is in the exact opposition of the recent movements of new liberalization, which was precisely, precisely taking over everything which is public, or common, and this is the history of capitalism, into private, extractive, exploitative. So it's doing the reverse thing. So I think property and the idea of private property, as opposed to other forms of tenure, other forms of tenure of property, I think it's a crucial thing here, and we should think on that. Second is all the time thanks to the geographer, the question of scale here. There is a question of scale. When Joseph brought the power of proximity, and also what Cassandra was telling, but also what Malia was showing us, was um, real experiences of local, <laughs> extremely local, and local in a way is small, is deeply rooted, it has proximity, is one-to-one, -one, is eye-to-eye. -eye. And this has nothing to do with the power of finance mm -hmm. and consultancy, which is absolutely abstract, not local, not rooted, deteriorized <laughs> as a whole. So the thing is that, but having said that, they have the hegemony of restructuring territories. So I think the question would be how, how to scale up. But to scale up, it's not only to reproduce different experiences in different places, but also to have a sort of transnational, transnational power building which can also make the changes because, and this is very difficult. And I, I mean, the housing movement, um, we can see how, just to finish with an example, we can see housing movements today everywhere, mm -hmm. <laughs> every fucking city, because yeah, we live in a housing emergency. But what kind of uh, a transnational housing movement we were able to build up to now. Mm -hmm. Very difficult mm -hmm. to do that. So I just dropped this question here. Yeah, 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 yeah we're going to take a few. Um, so uh, who else wants to say something? Yeah, ask? Oh, perfect, perfect. Thank you, thank you. Hi, thank you for the fantastic talks. Giuseppe, uh, there's Cadiz also who remains a city, not like as large as Barcelona, but in Spain, this, this uh, city council, which is still radical in the left. Um, tiny one, but still. Um, yeah, I wanted to ask M M Maliha about, um, about all, 
all the the solidarity city idea because I th I think that you took most of the examples from formal co-ops uh, in housing, community organizing and stuff. I was volunteering at, at uh, Food Not Bombs in bed for a while and that's like kind of an informal food community thing. I don't know how to call it, but you know, I, I wanted to ask you like, why didn't you focus also on that? Um, and the other question would, would, would be like, um, is it possible to, to, to have a solidarity city within the context of the capitalistic state in the end? And because I feel like the state, the bourgeois state will appropriate everything that comes out of that. And I'm thinking about, for, for example, the idea of green gentrification now, right? Like building green infrastructures, that's also happening in Barcelona with the superilla. So you intervene in the city, you create a better conditions for people, but real estate prices, property market rise up and then displaces people. So that would be like my questions. Thank you. Hey, um, good afternoon. Um, I just appreciate Kazembe for mentioning public housing. Um, as I listen to um, Malia's um, presentation on mapping, I'm curious if um, public housing was part of those solidarity economies. As um, a long life resident, I think we watch it all the time. We are here for each other even before COVID. We, we mutual aid programs is what the hood is. Um, and so I'm just curious if that was included in the mapping and if not, why? Um, and in relation to that, um, I'm really proud of the Queensboro, um, what is it, the people space? Um, Shouts to Western uh, Queens Community Land Trust, um, as well as the Asian women who fought against Amazon coming. Um, so this is my neighborhood. I live in Ravenswood Houses, which is right next to it and in between um, this space is in between Queensbridge houses and Ravenswood houses. Um, and I can't help but wonder, especially with the history of community land trust, how much us fighting and, and even creating the space that we want ends up, um, we basically end up gentrifying our own community and the very people who built it and fought for it are the ones that end up displaced within 10 to 20 years. So I'm just curious as to how, mm -hmm. if we're thinking of the future as and community land trust, how can we safeguard it so that we don't end up displacing the very people that we're trying to um, serve. Um, and then I guess going to Kazembe, um, Cha, I can't, you, I, I want to hear all your stories. Uh, <laughs> shout out to Slam. I, I was also a CUNY organizer back in the day for Students United for a Free CUNY. And so I'm curious, um, as we reconfigure relations with labor and what, what is it? excuse me, labor and capital, how do we also reconfigure those same relationships between people and land? Um, your whole um, trajectory being in New York City, how do you see the future of like the movement in addition, in relation to land? Um, and, and what words might you have um, and advice for young people that are also getting into organizing? Okay. Thank you. One more here, and then one more, and then we we stop, and then we will talk, and then we stop, we go again. There, Jean Paolo. I'm not going to stand in the way of lunch too long, but first of all, what an amazing panel, Kazembe, Mahila, Joseph, Miguel, so sharp, so many things to take. One question, uh, and this is prompted by the question about territory. I'm thinking about the uneven geographies that produce the places where we have progressive administrations. So what happens to Yonkers? What happens to Andalusia? What happens, what is, how do we think about those places outside of Jackson, but that are in Mississippi, that don't have organizing and are yeah. even less, how do, how do we begin to work with what we have, build that power, redistribute, make the archipelagos, not the islands, and, and work against it at the same time? Mm. It's an easy question, I'm sure. <laughs> Okay, very patiently, Moncho. Gracias. Um, I, I just have a, a 
what I think is a, a provocative uh, comment, uh, and it is um, that I wonder to what extent we can uh, fully understand uh, the potential uh, for liberation uh, in the future, the, the liberation that has, self-liberation that has already happened, uh, and, and all the ills that have befallen us and our communities, if we don't really um, grapple uh, with, with uh, the fates and, and the histories of diasporas and, and colonialism uh, as it relates, uh, you know, our, our geographies. I, I'm thinking mm -hmm. very specifically of how I've always felt that I, a lot of the ill that has befallen Barcelona, for example, it's uh, karmically related uh, to, to the role of the uh, Catalonian uh, bourgeoisie uh, in the colonialist project in, in the Americas. And that, uh, you know, is what uh, Juan Gonzalez calls uh, the harvest of empire. Uh, and, and on the other side of it, it's uh, how uh, a lot of the work that has been happening, for example, with uh, community land trusts, it's also informed by that uh, lowdown municipalism that has already be ha been happening because of the connections that diasporas have uh, from one city to the other, and how the geographies and the problems that we see cluster and develop in geography, uh, in different geographies, are actually following the populations from one place to the other. So it's not that these geographies have these clusters of problems, but that the clusters of problems have been, as Miguel said, uh, you know, on the back, uh, following these, these different uh, colonized people that, that have to be, you know, moved from, from one place uh, to the other. So I think that, that we really need to, I would like to, to hear about that. Mm -hmm. Next to you. Thank you much. Oh, I just have a comment uh, to Miguel's uh, presentation. So I just wanted to say that McKinsey re recently closed down its office in Kerala and laid off <laughs> and, and laid off 250 workers, not because of any action by the Communist Party or the state, but because of the internal contradictions of capitalism. And uh, the reports put it as uh, an indicator of the coming recession in North America. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Thank you. Uh, Kasem, I will uh, start with you. I mean, Kasem was saying I don't want to be the first one in the, in the but okay, now you're the first one in answers. answers. Yeah. Okay, I'll be the first one. Yeah. Um, I mean, uh, I guess, I mean, I want to just, there's a lot I want to say. I mean, one thing, Raquel brought up the, the transnational, and I think that if you look at Malia's map, what you notice about the Mitchell Lamas in New York City is that they're at the periphery of the city. And so there, so like so, so what you have in New York City is something you happen, you're having in all cities around the world, which is a, I guess the the ring around the white collar, you know, what I'm saying, you know, so you know, so you have the, so you have the, you have the, 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 ben, the ben, my, my, my Twitter handle is Bronx Benule, you know, what I'm saying, and I think about the Benule in Paris, but which is also the location of working class red power in a community. So I can't. So can we think about a global Benule? That's connected to Colombos in Brazil, but also in the Bronx and Queens, connected to these black communities that are, that are forming in the periphery of the city. Because that's where they're pushing this out of. I went to, I gave a talk in New Haven, and New Haven is basically the South Bronx in the north. And so what, they're pushing our people further and further north um, in the Bronx, um, out in Queens, out in Brooklyn, um, before they're pushing out to the city. Um, so I want to use that imaginary as a space of solidarity. Um, and I think there's, there's this stuff that, that there's, if there's language around cooperative and quilombo, you know what I'm saying, quilombo and cooperative and banule could be, uh, can, can translate into each other in terms of agency. Um, I think, um, uh, I, I love I love what you said about the system in the back. Talked about public housing, and I'm a big fan. I'm a big supporter of public housing. I think public housing has to be part and parcel of every discussion around housing in the city. Um, and there has to be a fight to defend public housing and to expand it and to make sure it's funded. Um, you know, public housing is a, is a, is a, is a location of so much of the the culture and and the political import. 
of the city right now. Um, you know, and I actually taught in Queensbridge. I taught at, Queen, I taught at um, Jacob Reese Settlement House years ago. So I know Ravens Wood. I know, I know that community. And I know that I know it well. And this is really important. Um, and I think about, you know, and I, I think about, like, I think a lot about, um, you know, Monchi, you brought up the diaspora. But I think that, you know, I mean, I, th I think you brought up diaspora, right? Um, I think there's a lot of advantage that we have here in the city in terms of multiple diasporas, in terms of the, our ability to connect with each other. Um, and so I think that, you know, New York City as, you know, having the, having the largest black population in the country, but it's also very much of a pan-black population. So it's black folks from the Caribbean, it's black folks from South America, it's black folks from Africa, you know what I'm saying? And they're all coming to New York and being confronted with the problems of labor and capital, right? You know what I'm saying? You know, inadequate housing, um, police brutality and imprisonment in the in those things. So that's a that's a means of organizing. And um what what lay of the future? I mean, I can I, I can't tell you what works for you, but I can tell you what works for me, right? And I'm just like, I'm trying to decommodify and learn as much as possible um in terms of like outside of the institutional frameworks. Um, you know, and I think a lot about people like you know, James Baldwin, Irving Howe, um, the New York intellectuals, painters who did not go to, I mean, no, no shade to people who went to college. I went to college. I went to Hunter. It's great. But, and there's no shade to people. You know what I'm saying? And there's no shade to people who are, who are PhD students. But if you live in New York City, um, I'm trying to steal as much shit as possible. You know what I'm saying? And by stealing, I mean, like, it's, it's, it's out there for free. So how do you leverage power that you're able to have, which is, again, why this space right here, and I'm so thankful for it, is so important because in New York City, you can just be like, yo, like, for free, you can come to a lecture and hear people from India talk about politics for free. <laughs> like, tell your friends. Like, don't gatekeep the information. You know what I'm saying? Like, you, you can go to the Schomburg and see letters by Malcolm X for free. You know what I'm saying? So I think that part of the work that we need to do is like demyst not so much mystify, but demystify information. One of the things, I go back to Charlene, Char Charlene's exhibit. What I loved about this exhibit was this table, right, that was in the middle that had all these books that people can just peruse and read. But what it reminded me of, if you read the, the memoirs of Bernard, uh, Bernardo Vega, uh, who was one of the first Puerto Rican socialists to come to New York City, he would tell you the story about the cigar workers, and they would work at a table, and the number one position of the cigar worker, there would be someone at the top of the cigar workers who would be the reader. And the reader was a person who read the newspaper, but they also read Marx's Capital. So they would just be sitting there Rolling cigars, listening to Marx's Capital, the way that we listen to podcasts. You know what I'm saying? That education imaginary, you can take that education part and get, get two of your friends and three of your friends to create a pod like that. You, can, you don't need to like go to Spotify. Create your own podcast. You know what I'm saying? You call it a conversation. You know what I'm saying? Come over. <laughs> so, you know what I'm saying? Get some of You know what I'm saying? Whatever you want to do. Just be like, yeah, and just be like, yeah. This is what I think about this word. And you can even use your podcast voice. <laughs> Make it sexy. You know what I'm saying? Yes. Okay. We can do that for each other. You know what I'm saying? Like this, 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 there's nothing, there's nothing that we can't do. You know what I'm saying? But I think that sometimes we get keep ourselves from our own imaginary. But don't 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 lose out on the wonder that we that you guys offer off the guys offer all the time. Mali. Uh. Um, so uh, I'll say right now, I'm a fast talker, but a slow thinker. So it takes me a while to like digest people's questions. And I'm going to find you. I'm not, I'm, if I don't answer fully, I'm going to find you. Um, uh, and 
Okay, so uh, why uh, informal, formal? Um, let me uh, uh, take that. Um, I we definitely looked at formal solidarity economies. And recently, you know, of course, everybody's been getting into mushrooms and mycology and thinking, and and I've been influenced by that too, of course, like everybody. And in some ways, we've been toying around with that metaphor. And I think that solidarity is a little bit like a fungus, the fungus, right? And mm. and it's spreading out and it some it's somewhere between 20 and 80 percent of all forest life. I guess we're finding that out. And it it pops up though in fruits like mushrooms. And so what we did was we just looked at the mushrooms in the forest. We didn't look at the fungus. But you're right. There are there's like life sustaining currents of solidarity that are running sort of virally in all kinds of places. and But I do think that's a different project to look at, talk to, work with those people, um, to do sort of mapping projects. That, that, that's, a, that's a different, that, that's the next book. <laughs> that, but, you know, this was the first one. Um, so I, I think that they, in some ways, informal has got to be even bigger than mm. formal. But if we think about, so we looked at formal credit unions, but there are informal peer lending groups mm. that are zero interest running through temples and churches. And, and, but those people don't want to necessarily talk and they definitely don't want to be mapped and they definitely don't want to sort of be visible mm. to the world. So in some ways, formal solidarity economies do because there's actually great interest in working in a sort of synergistic sort of fashion, building up density, working at and forming post-capitalist supply chains. But, you know, you get the picture. Um, in From the question number three on, on public, I mean, you know, yeah, a, a pub, ha, housing in New York City, uh, number one, you cannot talk about housing without talking about public housing, mm. for sure. Um, it houses way more way more people than any of the pictures that I actually showed in terms of cooperative housing. Um, but mapping sort of solidarity potential within the state, looking at schools, public, that, that too took the project into, you know, more money, more people, the more resources than we actually had. Um, and so in a way, we had to sort of bite off what we could chew. And that was one of the decisions that got that got made. Right. But um, I, I work with Citizen Budgets Commission. They're talking about what it means to reinvigorate. And, and, and that has to actually be the number one priority of any housing kind of activist in the city looking at NYCHA and preventing sort of uh, what what people are talking about is approaching a threshold beyond which deterioration will not be able to be fixed or or it'll be just way more even expensive to think about fixing, right? Um, and I'll, I'll, there's other questions too, but I'll, I'll yield there and I don't, because I don't want to take up all the time. I, and, and we'll come back. I'll come back. Yeah. Good. I... I Maybe I didn't understand all the questions, but some of them I, I did, and I think I, uh, I can add something. No, for instance, in Hagel, uh, you were saying about this the role of property. I think the role of property is is crucial and it's uh, definitely one of the key points. But I would say what is also very important, and at least moving in in this territory, which the property is not uh, yours, uh, is the role of initiative, leadership, and the capacity of Regulation. I think that this is the the the, the enormous uh, power that although you don't own uh, the uh, the property, you can do many things uh, and and you can you can act if you preserve the leadership. And this is something that we lost uh, during many years, as I tried to explain in Barcelona. I mean, uh, almost uh, 15 years or 20 years, we lost the leadership and to to. Take, take back that leadership. You can make many things. Yesterday, our mayor was saying to stop cruisers and and people the, cruise, the people of the boats, the, the owners of the which is a mafia, an incredible mafia. Yeah, they were saying, but we we can come anyway because the territory is not yours. You are not the, the property of the land because it's true that the the coast is not for, for the municipality. And she said, yes, but I can't put fences. <laughs> 
<laughs> it's true, and because she can uh, at, at the door, no. So I think you can do many things, although you can you don't have the the leadership. Also, as you said, how do you scale? Um, I think that the scale you said it yesterday when you were talking about uh, 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 Vienna, no, 100 years of the same government. I think that that something which is crucial to scale up is time uh, and continuity. And and of course, it's very difficult and very, it's quite impossible to do it when with every four years you have elections and every four years you have a new crisis. And and that's kind of a, a difficult situation. And, and that's why it's so important at this point. And in, case, in the case of Barcelona, we can lose everything that we've done during these eight years and start over again, because I think most of those uh, things uh, are, are in this moment uh, scaling up. And scaling that means the, that Paris and Barcelona and London and New York and starts to kind of have like those uh, air, uh, um, spaces to, to, to deal and to, to fight for, for that some of the decisions that had been taken in Berlin now are, are being taken in Barcelona. And that was very important, those connections uh, that, that we had. And if we, lo- if we lose this, of course, we're going to start over again. About the, the superilla and the gentrification, I didn't have time to, to end up this uh, talking about this. It's, of course, one of the things that worries the most. And, and this puts on the table uh, the, the, the discussion uh, of also time uh, that you need to really transform things. Uh, things can be very fast. And if you use tactical uh, urbanism, it can be like from one day to another. And this is very important to do it because it's urgent. We are dying because of the bad quality of the air because of the, the, the many things that, that are urgently to act. But of course, you don't, it's not that fast to act in terms of housing. But it's important that both things go together. Uh, and that's what I was trying to express about the, the idea. It's not about public space. Everything is housing. Mm. That's something that we, we do believe. If you do a hospital, it's housing. If you do a station, a metro station, it's housing. If you put a plant, a tree, it's housing. So it's, you, it's very important that behind any transformation, you have to have a plan uh, to, to preserve the people who are living there or to help them or to add or to, uh, uh, to be assured that the, those processes of transformation are not kicking uh, people out from for, of their neighborhoods. And, and this is quite important. Also, um, you were talking about colonialism and, and, and I, I completely agree. This is one of the biggest fights we, we had and it was such a stupid thing we did. Well, it was very, not a stupid, it was very interesting, but very little was we, we took the, the monument of Antonio Lopez, one of the uh, people who paid most of the works of Gaudí uh, with the money of, of slaves, uh, of uh, the stra- slave trade. Uh, and we took the, 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 the statue and we take it out. It, was a, it, it has been a revolution. And we are taking all those monuments. And I think that the idea of the monument is very important too. Uh, how to deal with the new idea. Monuments are always in positions. And, uh, and uh, there are no such a bottom-up monument. Most of them are <laughs> monuments that somebody puts there to create a, a, new, a new order in public space. Uh, and this is a very, very interesting discussion we are having uh, now also. No? How do we deal with those uh, historical... No, we, we put our medals or they put uh, their medals because Barcelona, the modernism and Gaudí and blah, blah, blah. And all this is based on, on, on a mud land. No? And, yeah, I see Rudy saying like you have to end this, Miguel. Yeah. Um, it's gone too far. It's gone too far. Yeah. Yes. 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 Uh, food. Yes. Food. Thank you all very much. Uh, it was great. Thank you. In order to get uh, this, the food that you're about to eat paid for by CUNY, we need a list of participants. There's a clipboard at the front desk. If you could uh, put your name, and if you'd like to receive emails, you could put your email. But the main thing is to put your name there so that we have a head count so that CUNY will pay for your meal. Thank you. A um, comment.
for that, we have a few announcements. Um, one is that, uh, no, I need my phone, actually, for one announcement, because it's about me. <laughs> uh, all right, so there's going to be a discussion online next Thursday. Can you guys in the back talk quieter? No, apparently not. <laughs> the death stare will do it. All right. So um, there's going to be a, a discussion next Thursday online, Thursday, 1 p.m. Eastern time. And I will be in conversation with Zbu Zikode. And he is the president and one of the founders of the Abishali Basement Jondo, which is to say the Shack Dwellers uh, movement. So he'll be tuning in from Durban and I from New York and people from around the world. And I urge you to listen to it. Um, this was incredible and this movement is incredible. And speaking of housing, Jaime. Oh, okay. Hi, I'm Jamie. And we are gonna have another event uh, sponsored by the CPCP. It's gonna be here next Saturday, so in a week time, at 11.30. Uh, it's going to be a three-hour mini-conference about housing. Uh, the title is Envisioning Public and Social Housing Futures. So we're going to talk about public housing a lot, social housing, and, and it's going to be uh, with uh, tenant organizers, um, Safe Section 9, Justice for All. And then we're going to have like an international panel of speakers uh, about the U.S., but also Brazil. We're going to have Hakel here, and Canada, uh, Europe, the UK, and that's it. Thank you. So as we said, housing, it is the first thing, and it's everywhere. Um, so without further ado, wait a minute, do you have a chair for your panel? No, I guess I should do that then. Let me be your chair. Okay. Okay. But I don't, I don't have like any fancy things to say about you. What order are you going to speak? And with the program. Okay, then the program will be Raquel Rolnik, who hails from Sao Paulo, and then Carolina Bank Munoz, who hails from Brooklyn, and then Jim Paulo Baiocchi. I don't know where you're hailing from, man. Um, I'm hailing from West Forth and Broadway. Okay, <laughs> Manhattan. All right. And this panel is, uh, to remind you, Leftism Resurgent Latin America's Pink Tide. So without further ado, take it away. Okay. Yeah. So um, thanks a lot. I'm sorry, but I, I have to stand. <laughs> it's difficult to talk. Seated. Um, thanks a lot for Ruthie, David, Mary, and all the people who made possible my participation here today um, in this conference, which addresses, in my view, the question. <laughs> so I'm grateful for this opportunity. Let me place myself here in this conference. Um, I have 40 years of involvement, even more now, wow, almost 50, uh, involved in struggles for the right to the city, right to housing, as activist, as scholar, but also as city official in Workers' Party, Brazil's first city administration of Sao Paulo, late 80s, uh, but also uh, federal government appointed national secretary for urban policies during the Workers' Party first Lula's term, um, and uh, so and consultant to municipalities, agencies, and for some some years, I was the UN Human Rights Rapporteur on the right to adequate housing. So. Um, my position here is a position of somebody who had lived 
inside, outside the state in different levels. So uh, I, ha I have to be very frank uh, with you here um, that I think that not only um, the state, but I would say more, this mechanism of representation and decision making that we call state democracy that is absolutely hegemonic over any other forms of political organization in the world and it's absolutely a property based and raised together with capitalism so I mean, let's never forget <laughs> that these forms have a lot to do with capital and that's why it's so difficult to transform it. <laughs> so, and it's so much embedded in capital and capitalism. Um, so it's very, uh, it's quite difficult to address the challenges that we are facing, uh, uh, and it's very difficult to imagine that we can it, literally, after all the experiences that we had with actual existing communism, socialism, uh, municipalisms, local experiences on that to say, yes, this is the instrument to make change in the world, but on the other hand, I think it's very important also to say here that without the state, the harm we are doing to the majorities would be much, much stronger. So I see that we are caught in this trap in which it's very important to think how to deal with that and at the same time, to be very suspicious about the possibilities, the real possibilities of this type of political representation mechanism. It's come, becoming really, really, really meaningful and, and promoting change. But I know that the invitation that I got to be in this conference was much more related to try to bring you a piece of Latin American scene on that debate, especially with the hopes that arose after Colombia, Chile, Brazil elections, the result of the elections, and the triumph of left parties and the coalitions led by left parties in the region. So I am very disciplined and I'm going to talk to you about that um, and not about what I really wanted to talk about, <laughs> which is crit um, uh, But so what I'm trying to bring you here and coming, it's from Brazil, Carolina will talk more about Chile. So uh, I, will, I will bring here the news from Brazil and from this history. I, I know that you probably are familiar with the facts. Uh, how come we went from a workers' party government to extreme right, conservative, militarized, new liberal Bolsonaro, and then back uh, to the workers' party in many years? And I'm going to use one event to try uh, to show you the complexities of, uh, of politics and state in Brazil in order to help us to understand. And this event is June 2013, when millions of people were protesting on the streets and taking up the streets on Brazil. And a lot of people place June 2013 as the starting point of the race of this new right movement. But, as everything, things are much more complex than that. 
and uh, what in June 2003, when masses were demonstrating on the street, uh, I would try to bring this event in order to show the complex relations between state parties, social movements in Brazil. Uh, I would say that, and everything that I'm going to say is very controversial. N nobody agrees about June 2013. Ten years after, we are still arguing about June 2013. What happened in June? So that is my version. Uh, so I think June, th June 2013, it was the turbulent confluence of three rivers, powerful rivers coming together. And you know when two rivers come together, what, what happens? So in this time, it was three rivers. So what are those three rivers? One is, again, a history, a long history of popular revolts over transportation and other urban services uh, in Brazil. Since the 19th century, popular uprisings around the quality, the price, and the inefficiency of public transportation. Over and over in different cities in many, many occasions, we disaccumulated dissatisfaction with public transport and the precariousness of urban life as a whole, because public transportation is just one phase of it. But when we talk about infrastructure, when we talk about uh, school systems, health systems, we, we are talking about masses that don't have access to good quality public service, that had never had access to good quality public services in Brazilian history, basically. And in, in any of those revolts around public transportation, and again this time, this was seen as a bunch of troublemakers because most of those revolts were not led by unions or parties or political powerful organizations. They were what we call, and I know this is not a, an accurate term, spontaneous, in terms that they were not called by powerful organizations. There are people, normally young people, uh, screaming on the streets and trying uh, to get rid of that, of that hopeful uh, service. Then the second river. So, I mean, June 2013 started because in several cities, especially big cities, capitals in Brazil, simultaneously the government launched a raise in the fare of public transportation. 20 cents. <laughs> 20 cents. So this raise was the first thing that provoked massive uh, protest on the street against the 20 cents race in public transportation. So this is one. But again, this is not about 20 cents. <laughs> it's about, and that was one of the mantras and banners in the protest. This is not about 20 cents. <laughs> so this, is, this was part of the protest. Then the second river is a new cycle of popular struggles in Brazil, very different from the late 20th century ones, which was very important in Brazil, the late 20th century ones led to the organization of the Workers' Party. So it was the revival of the union movement, and led by, by union leaders like Lula himself, but also together with urban social movements around housing, around the infrastructure, around they didn't use that language by the time, but around the right to the city uh, as whole. Well. So that was that was the the first wave of 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 movements during the end of dictatorship and right after and during democratization. But 
very different from those movements this time and part of this movement really got into the party really got into institutional politics and the leadership became parliamentaries ministries and part of the state bureaucracy that was very important for this generation uh, to get in but then new struggles arrived and this I, I, I see after after also listening for the very uh, interesting presentations on Kerala on different issues environment issues which were complete not completely but a lot absent in the previous uh, in, in the previous cycle of struggles feminism gender racism anti-racism which is one of the most powerful social movements that is going on now in Brazil that was very absent on, on the late 20th century. And, but more important than that, um, organized much more horizontally without a leadership which is recognized in one person and, and one leader with less parties, less union, like everywhere. <laughs> So we, this also were coming, and this also emerged in early in in this uh, century, and during uh, during uh, Workers Party uh, uh, du during Lula's period, uh, it was very important also uh, the struggles that arose against the city renewal preparation for World Cup Olympics. Yes, Barcelona rides, rides again. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, Sao Paulo, Rio, and many capitals, they undercome um, urban renewal projects who evicted thousands of people. And so that provoked also a important movement against evictions, uh, the World Cup popular committees in many, many different cities. And the World Cup popular committees was part of what was on the streets on June 2013, because the World Cup will be next, the following year. So that was also there. anti Belo Monte, which uh, an hydroelectric power that displaced indigenous communities, and there was a big struggle against it in Brazil. So that was also on the street by the time. And, and how come? <laughs> how come all of that happened during Lula's government? So what I have to say is that the idea, the central idea of the workers uh, uh, party uh, rule during Lula and, and Dilma was basically to raise the power of consumption of the workers and vulnerable people through several mechanisms, including distribution of money, both a familia, in the pockets of those who didn't have, but also raises in the salaries of workers, better conditions of salaries for for workers, minimum salary, wage, raise, and things like that, but also po inclusionary policies, I would say. Inclusionary policies in terms of more access for uh, black people, indigenous people, and low-income people to public universities, uh, quota, uh, and, and this type of policies, which made a whole generation that came from the peripheries, from, from a very vulnerable working class for the first time in college education involved in culture. And those were the leaders of June 2013. This generation that was educated and inserted in a way in, in the discussion of, of uh, which historically was absolutely concentrated in very few white men hands. So that, that was part of it. 
But at the same time, I would say that in terms of public sphere, in terms of public services, it was a disaster uh, those years. Because, and that would, it's an expression that uh, was used a lot by the time, is that inside the homes, everything was better. More money, more appliances, more food, meat. <laughs> uh, meat and meals three times a day, more access to culture, more computers inside. Outside the home, public transportation, a mess. Schools, a mess. Uh, public services, urban infrastructure. So uh, that's why it's very understandable why this new generation of movements were saying, we want public services, FIFA partner. FIFA is the International Federation of Football, who set a standard for stadiums, which is luxuries. So we want this standard for public service. Uh, so that was very important doing that. And then finally, the third river is the anti-corruption movements. So, but in order to understand the anti-corruption, and here I get, I think, to the central point of our discussion here, is that they are, in, in Brazil, we have up to now, and Lula's term now is absolutely caught into the same mechanism, which is a, a political system marked by the alignment of the state with major economic interests, intermediated by parties and parliamentarians' mandate, whose permanence in power or the reproduction of their mandates became their highest priority. And in order, in order to reproduce their mandates, and this is called permidembismo, an expression of a political scientist, Marcus Nobre, the way this is done is that every party, including Workers' Party, the main goal is to control central posts in the government within the state in order to control the distribution of benefits to the people. And this has two faces. One is distributing benefits means to have constituencies, to have people voting for. But the second is through that, you open up space for corporations and enterprises to provide services and investments. And those corporations and enterprises are also responsible for giving money to the party, giving money to the mandates in order uh, for them to fund their campaigns and next campaigns and to maintain them in power. So when we talk about corruption, <laughs> uh, it's very important what I'm saying here because the whole campaign against corruption, which basically originally the anti-corruption banner was a banner that came from the left. But since the left became a part of this system and played with the system, and I have to say, play with the system with no alternative because the left never had hegemony in the Congress and in Senate. It has to govern always with a minority and to compromise with a majority. And the logic of majority is not right or left. The logic is controlling the distribution of benefits. And of course, there is some representatives who are ideological and very firm, anti this, anti this, but the majority is not this. So the idea of having this logic, it was something that happened then and it's happening again. 
the Congress Senate is controlled by this logic, which uses public budget to do that. So uh, Workers' Party basically abandoned uh, the, the banner of anti-corruption banner because of their needs for governmentality uh, strat strategies adopted. And that eventually uh, was one, the mechanisms that Lula administration used uh, in order to maintain this base, like including distributing actual money to parties, <laughs> uh, uh, was the reason for the first scandal during Lula's administration, which was the scandal of Mensalão, which was monthly distribution of money for different parties. It was for the parties, not for the people, but it was monthly distribution of money. Uh, so this is important uh, that... Uh, during uh, uh, the administration, Lula's uh, administration, uh, in June 2013, it was not Lula, it was uh, Dilma, uh, these uh, this first movements, they started, they were called by collectives, by autonomist movements, by groups, in, and they had no participation of organized parties, unions, nothing like that. Uh, but at the same time, uh, it was very clear for, for this movement that it was a movement, anti-system movement, in terms of showing very clearly that the system of provision of services and goods was something that was designed in order to make profit to enterprises and corporations in one side and in other side to maintain the constituencies. This is particularly important, and I have to say that in situations like Brazil and other countries in Latin America, in which a very important part of the urban fabric is not produced by corporate development but by the people themselves, self-building, self-construction. And all this territory, which is self-produced -product, by the people for years and decades, it has a very ambiguous status in respect to the right to services. Because in principle, they are all illegal. But they are illegal, but uh, nobody goes there and put everybody in jail. No, they are there. So they have an ambiguous situation in which nobody knows if it's permanent or not. Nobody really knows if it's there to stay or not. And this is what is negotiated on a daily basis through the political system and through political uh, representatives. So this is a very important um, uh, feature in order to understand how much uh, right-wing politicians also have a very important popular base because services and inclusion in the city is trade with votes. And when you have a very efficient politician which is capable of delivering those goods, he's gonna get he, he gonna get the votes. He's gonna get the votes. And this is very important to understand because during the late uh, tw uh, the end of, of 20th century, in the first uh, cycle of social movements, that was very insurgent. The movements that came from from the neighborhoods, they were movement, I mean we are claiming rights we have to, the right to have rights. We have the right to be part of the city. So it was very insurgent in a way. But that became absolutely professionalized and embedded and integrated into the political system in a way 
that this is not insurgent anymore. <laughs> this is part of the growth machine. So you have a growth machine <laughs> that at the same time has a way of developing related to real estate financial complex and another way of developing highly intermediated by the political system. So when the movement was on the streets, a very important move was done by the right um, and conservative part of Brazil that always existed with an active participation of the media and the judiciary, uh, Brazilian judiciary, which is very conservative as well, which was to absorb what was voiced in the, in the streets and translated it as this is anti-corruption and PT Lula is the one who is corrupted. So let's get rid of the Workers' Party and Lula. So this was done in order to disguise the very important mechanism corruption is related to, which is the political system of governing, distributing benefits, trading into votes, reproducing themselves, and the very important relationship that this had with capital, capitalist corporations and uh, many interests. So the reaction of the system, including the Workers' Party, which was in power by the time, was basically entering into the trap. <laughs> So denying that that was a legitimate claim on the streets for something that had to be overcome. And I just give you a quick example to stop. By that time, the city of Sao Paulo was run by Haddad. Haddad is now the Ministry of, of Economy of, of Lula. And he has a council in the city to advise him, a council of civil, civil society council. And I was there in the council, and when, when it was this turmoil on the street, he convened the council and said, okay, I want to hear you, what to do? And we, I was among other people say, I mean, cut the increase of the fare. And this is your opportunity to get rid of those corrupt enterprises who run public transportation in Sao Paulo. You take the public transportation system and you can break without, this is your opportunity. He said, oh no, I can't do it. <laughs> I can't do it. And it was a decision, this is just an example, of a political decision of, and of course there is many, many reasons for that decision, I'm not blaming the decision. I'm just saying that that was absolutely central for those movements to be caught to the right and to be caught in a trap in which we are all now, in which the criticism on the nature of the state, because our state is not state, is state capital. State capital is the same thing. They are not different. They are the same. They, it's, it's, <laughs> it's one thing. So all the criticism that, the, 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 that we have, so the criticism became a right-wing agenda. And through the polarization between right and left, the left must defend the state. This one, <laughs> the one that we have which should be criticized. <laughs> and the others are the market. So we were caught in a trap in which the big question is market versus state, and we are not discussing the nature of the state. And we are basically uh, blocking 
our debate, our political debate. Uh, and at the same time, why this is also a big, big trap? Because since the criticism, the anti-system became a right-wing claim, became a right-wing uh, banner, so all the anti-corruption measures that should be taken after that, because the state is corrupt, they make the life of those who are trying to do something in the state unbearable because more and more measures are taken in order to control corruption that prevent us, like the list that we had to sign in order to prove to CUNY that, the, that we really ate uh, <laughs> the food here. So can you imagine every day there is more, ma because I mean, of course, it was Ruti, she was not, I don't know, giving a feast with the money of CUNY. So with that, with that, we are making more and more difficult for the state to be efficient and to respond to the needs of the people. We are blocking because we are caught in uh, this game. So my guess and my question here is, how can we dislocate ourselves from this trap? I have slides. I don't know how that is working. Do I? Carolina Bank Munoz. All right, thanks uh, everybody, um, and thanks for the invitation uh, to be here. So on October 18th, 2019, Chile despertó, right? Chile woke up. Massive and escalating protests rebuked the neoliberal order imposed by dictator Augusto Pinochet, that was, uh, and that was largely maintained throughout the transition to democracy. While a 30 cent subway fare Increase was the spark that mobilized the, the protests. Activists astutely pointed out, no son 30 pesos, <laughs> son 30 años, right? It's not 30 cents. We see a similarity here. Uh, it's 30 years. Protesters were met with brutal state repression. Human Rights Watch documented over 11,500 civilians injured in marches in the six weeks of uh, the kind of central six weeks of protests. Two dozen protesters and some innocent bystanders lost their lives, and a shocking 400 people suffered from ocular trauma, mostly resulting from rubber bullets. And that number is more than uh, the total in the entire world over the course of 21 years in terms of ocular trauma. Um, President Sebastián Piñera declared war on Chileans uh, publicly on, on live TV, brought the military into the streets, forced a curfew, uh, took political prisoners, and in response, over a million Chileans flooded the streets of Santiago and tens of thousands more across the country. 
and you can see um, on the flag in this image, it says Chile despertó, no estamos en guerra, right? We are not at war. The protests created a political crisis for Piñera's right-wing government. Um, even as the government was offering concessions, such as reducing their salaries and halting the subway fare increase, the masses continued to swell every day. The left seized the opportunity to push for Piñera's resignation and a constitutional convention. And here's like a timeline. Uh, Piñera did not, of course, resign, uh, but his government was forced to negotiate the terms of a new constitution. Gabriel Boric, then a member of the Chamber of Deputies, negotiated the Acuerdo por la Paz y una nueva constitución, which was the peace agreement. And the peace agreement was signed by all political parties except the Communist Party and Boric's own social convergence on November 15, 2019. The markets responded very well to the peace agreement. <laughs> Unsurprisingly, the left was split on the peace agreement, many feeling like it stole the mass street mobilizations in favor of a bureaucratic and institutionalized process. On the one hand, I agree with this analysis. On the other, it's more complicated. Uh, while organized social movements were able to mobilize their bases, they were not sufficiently, or they were not unified on clear demands, right? So in the absence of these kind of concrete demands, uh, it wasn't a bad idea uh, or a crazy idea to seize on a political opportunity, which was to change the constitution, which had not been changed since the dictatorship, at least not substantively. The peace agreement called for a plebiscite in which Chilean citizens would vote on two questions, whether a new constitution should be drafted and whether those who drafted the new constitution would be elected in a constitutional convention or if half of the convention delegates would be already elected congressional representatives and the other half popularly elected. The original uh, plebiscite was scheduled for April 2020, but we all know what happened in March of 2020. Uh, the COVID pandemic shut everything down. The pandemic gave the state a useful excuse to make it impossible for the weekly protests to continue. And Chile had some of the most severe pandemic restrictions in the world, and they certainly served their purpose, largely to shut down a mass movement. Yet despite this, an overwhelming number of people turned out for a plebiscite on October 25th, 2020, 78% of voters favored drafting a new constitution, and 79% voted that it should be a constitutional convention with representatives chosen by the people. And in May of 2021, 155 constitutional delegates were elected. Amid, constitutional reform, uh, amid this constitutional reform process, Chile had an election. <laughs> I won't say much about this, except that in the first round, the fascist candidate Jose Antonio Cast got 28% of the votes, while Gabriel Boric, the left-wing candidate, got 26, right? So this scared everybody. Um, and in the second round, Boric emerged as a, as a victor. But this should have been the first sign. <laughs> when the fascist wins the first round, it's not a good sign. So uh, the final draft of the Constitution uh, delivered to Gabriel Boric on, in July of 2022, four months after he took office, was a game changer, heralded as the most progressive constitution in the world. The proposed constitution started with Chile es un estado social y democrático de derecho. Es plurinacional, intercultural, regional y ecológico. Right? Chile is a democratic and social state plurinational, regional, and ecological. Its entire content was a response to the disastrous consequences of the neoliberal project over the last 40 years. It was an unwieldy document for sure, with its 168 pages, perhaps the longest constitution <laughs> in the world, and very much consistent with the traditions of the left in being lengthy. <laughs> Uh, but it was also magical, right? And among its most important contributions, I'll, I'll talk about three, there are many, 
uh, but among its most important contributions, on indigenous people's rights, the declaration of Chile as a plurinational state, thereby officially recognizing Chile's 13 indi indigenous nations. Additionally, articles on autonomy, self-determination, and self-government of indigenous peoples and nations appear in a number of clauses, including uh, indi indigenous nations uh, being able to have their own courts. Uh, and while there is much more to do, uh, this would have been a radical advancement over the dictatorship constitution. On labor, uh, the right to freedom of, of association, including the right to unionization, collective bargaining, and strikes, but also would have given unions exclusive entitlement to collective bargaining rights, uh, preventing the action of negotiating groups or groups of non-unionized workers making deals with management, and allowed uh, unions to choose which level of bargaining would occur, uh, branch, sectoral, and territorial, and to determine the reasons a strike may be called without legal limitations. On the environment, 50 regulations refer directly or indirectly to environmental protections, including new subjects of rights, such as nature and animals. These included articles that protected nature from privatization and climate change, and that forced the state to provide adequate education on the environment. The Constitution also created new regulating institutions, such as the Ombudsman for Nature and the National Water Agency. And in fact, uh, water would have been uh, consigned as a fundamental right. The text also established that it was inappropriable uh, and must be used sustainably for present and future generations. The text further recognized and, uh, the protected, um, and protected the traditional use of waters located in indigenous territories. And this would have been particularly consequential because the Chilean economy has relied on forestry and mining extractivism, which are water intensive industries and often located in indigenous territories. So huge, right? Already we can see some uh, pretty amazing <laughs> stipulations in this constitution. And days before, it's not going to let me show it. Well, this, there was a short video on like the half a million people in the streets kind of celebrating, having this very celebratory mood about, you know, four nights before September 4th, the, the date of the plebiscite. Um, and then, of course, it fails. Walk, walk. So why did it fail? <laughs> um, First, the right and the political and economic elite discredited the constitutional convention process from day one. Misinformation was spread through social media, television, both kind of, of the nation's major conservative newspapers, campaigns, aggressive campaigns throughout Chile's townships. Um, the right was unified, forceful. It had a lot of resources. Uh, employers threatened to fire workers, et cetera, et cetera. Some of the poorest areas of Santiago and some of the poorest regions in Chile voted overwhelmingly against the Constitution. And many of the most cited reasons by residents was fear of state takeover of private homes, state-owned housing, a ban of inheriting, uh, a, a ban against uh, inheritance, uh, nationalized pensions, and plurinationality. None of these provisions were in the Constitution except for the plurinational state. Right? Second, and not surprisingly, the left was fragmented and disorganized. <laughs> Many unions and social movement organizations did not start campaigning for the Constitution until July of 2022, a mere two months before the vote. The Starbucks Union's delegate assembly voted not to endorse the new constitution, stating that it didn't go far enough to change the neoliberal status quo. Uh, same thing with some port worker unions. Um, other unions, like the Walmart unions that I've been working with for a long time, ran strong uh, educational campaigns, but have limited numbers of members. So I think the left organizations conflated 
mobilizing with organizing and didn't recognize the toll of the pandemic, inflation, and worsening conditions. The upsurge of uh, 2019 had mobilized millions and the prospect of new constitution energized voters in anticipation of what could be. But the September 4th plebiscite required a heavier lift uh, with a much tighter timeline. It required convincing people in the face of severe misinformation uh, that the new constitution would fundamentally change their lives. It required one-on-one -on -one conversations, political education, and infrastructure that many social movement and labor organizations do not currently have. And I'll say, maybe we can talk about this more in the, um, the Q&A, but here, the where people come to trade unionism matters, right? So the, the Walmart workers who kind of started as workers were able to take a leap and see uh, the environment and feminism and immigration and all of these issues as part of a worker's struggle. Um, the Starbucks workers who came out of student organizing <laughs> Right, had a much harder time making those connections. Um, and I think social movements in general were, had a harder time making those connections. Third, Chile's national identity is deeply rooted in white supremacy. Uh, many Chileans across the class spectrum are invested in maintaining the identity and image of Chile as a white country. Uh, Anti-black racism around immigration from Haiti the Dominican Republic and Colombia also helped to create a kind of spillover effect on the constitutional proposals around indigenous sovereignty. So when I was in Chile in January and doing some interviews, I heard from workers things like, well, plural nationality would have meant that we would have had to have uh, workers from Haiti, Colombia, and Venezuela as full citizens, right? So they, uh, they actually mistook Plural nationality being about in, in indigenous nations and thought, oh no, the black people are coming and they're going to be full citizens, right? So um, I think that was huge. Uh, and, and finally, I would say that the call for a mandatory vote, uh, which had been eliminated in 2013, was a tactical error. I think the left thought it was going to get young people um, to turn out, and instead it got a lot of apolitical people. <laughs> and conservative voters, right? Uh, and in fact, in March of 2022, Gianpaolo and I participated in a delegation to Chile um, to observe the constitutional process. And uh, I, my heart sank. <laughs> I mean, that week I was like, this is not gonna pass, right? Um, this is not gonna pass because almost nobody we talked to, uh, and, and this is mostly the left, right? Uh, from labor, feminists, climate justice, indigenous nations, None of them felt that the new constitution or the constitutional process represented them. Um, and, and this was striking because, again, um, even though there were only 155 constitutional delegates, the process involved many neighborhood and regional conversations with thousands and thousands of people. Uh, so, you know, what's, what's next? Um, President Boric has not really been able to catch a break, right? By putting all his eggs in the constitutional reform basket, he opened himself up to deep criticism by both the left and the right. Uh, he didn't do enough to separate his political, his own political and economic projects from the constitutional process. Um, coming out of student activism, it's been hard for Boric to address concerns most connected to labor and working class struggles. And the lack, his lack of political experience uh, has affected his ability to, no to negotiate with the entrenched parties in Congress who are running circles around him. Um, as such, uh, he is a president with the greatest number of changes to the cabinet in the first year of governing, including putting many of the old center left folks that his party, the Frente Amplio, has criticized and that the people do not <laughs> support um, back in power. So right now he has an approval rating of 
And uh, while he has initiated a new constitutional reform process, many Chileans see it as a sham process directed by politicians rather than people. They're not wrong. Um, it includes a third of people from Congress, a third of experts, and only a third from the kind of general public. And meanwhile, neoliberalism continues to reign. So after the initial shock of defeat, social and labor movement organizations have been slow to regroup. Um, however, I think Eve Weinbaum's work is instructive here. Her book about Appalachia tells us to think about successful failures, right? And we can think about um, the fact that workers, that, that you know, Millions of people were in the streets, that millions of people were engaged in a process means that we can and will continue to organize. It might take us a minute. It's only been eight months. Uh, was a revolutionary moment appended in October of 2019? Was the constitutional process reformist? Something in between? I tend to be somewhere in the middle on this. On the one hand, the rage in the streets was definitely diffused. On the other hand, the constitutional process and the document created, uh, created it was a clear example of what's possible, right? That another world is possible. Thanks. How can I follow up to that? So first off, I want to express uh, gratitudes and appreciations, CPCP, Mary David, uh, Ruthie for inviting me, my co-panelists, the people who are doing all the work. Uh, it's been an amazing day. It's amazing. I missed an amazing evening yesterday, I hear. Um, and I really love the prompt that came with the email we got about the program. Kind of late, but it's fine because I, I'm, I'm an emergent strategist. I believe it. <laughs> Less prep and more presence, right? And then what conversation can you have that you can't have in another moment? And, and, and the email that I got said, you know, make sure to ask your co-panelists a couple of questions as you start. And I think that's great. So I'm going to ask a question, and I'm going to give you one answer. So I would like each of you, after we, when we get to the discussion part, to tell us about things that give you hope. I want to hear, I, I, I understand everything that you're saying, fine. But I want to I wanna hear, there are things, there must be things that give you hope. And I want to hear about them. And I want to hear about how we can work with them. So Kazembe in the earlier panel was talking about, uh, this is a personal thing. It's like about, you know, turning 50. And then Kazembe, do not be afraid of 50. Because, <laughs> no, 50 is when you discover what you're here to do. I think. And my job on this planet, I realize, is to say positive things. I feel like my professional career is grump, 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 and Gianpaolo at the end. So fine. <laughs> I'm going to try to do what I can. So the last panel was, was ended on a very positive note. I thought about the possibilities of municipalism, and I'm going to try to you know, my, my work and writing and experience uh, is mostly about Brazil, but I want to give some pink tide vibes, see if we can't lift the mood a little bit. So the first thing I will say as a reaction to, um, the, to, to Raquel and to Carolina um, is I was thinking of disavowal. So disavowal, you know, in Freud's sense, is a trauma that is too big to ignore but uh, too hard to face. And I feel like that is a little bit our left position with the state. It's too hard. We, we can't, as like I was saying, we can't not have the state, but it's hard to look at it for what it is and what it does and what our task must be before it. Um, in the early days of the pink tide, and so if you think about the 1980s and the early 1990s, uh, Raquel, working there with Lisa Rungina. All those folks were working with the paradox, actually, that Raquel closed their comments with, which is, an, uh, what do you do with the state that wasn't made for us, right? People at the transitions to democracy in all these countries 
were inheriting an extremely violent, repressive state apparatus that was colonial in its very DNA, settler, racist, that was not made for people. It was made for capital, and it was then shaped by dictators and elites for a long time. So what do you do with that? And the thing that's kind of surprising, if you look back at some of those early texts, is just how hopeful people were when faced with this monumental task. And by and large, this is true of a lot of Latin America, the elites kind of stayed the same. They changed a couple of people, but the state functionaries stayed the same. Police stayed the same, military stayed the same. In other words, the state kind of looked like the same state as before, except now there was a little bit of voting and a little bit of rights and a lot of problems, <laughs> right? And so what do you do with that? This is, you, and it's interesting, and I, this is one parenthesis, um, there was a great deal of family resemblance to Du Bois' thinking on black reconstruction and his idea of abolition democracy. Like, what do you do with these inherited, limited, inherited, inher limited institutions that you have to deal with? Which ones do you improve and democratize, and which ones do you do away with? The Latin American version, and I, I make this, I wrote a, a little polemic that, again, is a controversial one, and by controversial, I mean was met with silence. Um, <laughs> I, I wrote this, um, this book right after Trump was elected about the Latin American left and what do we take in this dark moment in this country from, you know, this a remarkable history. Uh, and so I, I outlined what this theory of popular sovereignty was. So that was the early, that was the 90s version Mm -hmm. of, you know, the answer to the conundrum and to the paradox and how to face the disavowal. Popular sovereignty meant two things, and they had to go together. One, it was a sense of the people, the popular, at the center that was plural, that was radically democratic, that was expanding all the time and had the oppressed at its center. And it, there was sovereignty, right? The popular had power over things. It was supposed to be sovereign over more and more institutions. But you can't have one without the other. If you have just sovereignty without this kind of like radically democratic popular holding it in check, then you just have that kind of state decisionism. If you just have the popular absent some kind of instrument to bring that to power, then you know, you're, you're having good dreams, but they're not uh, what people uh, were concerned with. This translated into two things. Again, this is continent-wide. Uh, you can look at Brazil's history. You can look at Bolivia's history. Two sort of like, this meant two things. One was the idea of the movement party. So in some places, it was the political party as an instrument of the people's sovereignty, right? That's the MAS full title. Mm -hmm. In Brazil, the workers' party was a party where movement could speak, mm -hmm. right? And this was kind of like, they were looking at Eastern Europe, it was a break. It was idea of really a, a new kind of political party that was radically democratic. It was influenced by popular education, liberation theology. Instead of like old Marxist debates, you sit around and draw things on the ground, sitting in circles. It was very groovy for the 90s. <laughs> the other thing that is a kind of like signature, and if when leftists travel to Latin America, they're always, like, why are people obsessed with meetings all the time? <laughs> is because this the institutional root, the idea of radicalizing democracy was the other part. So we're gonna have a movement party that's gonna to be to talk to Ruthie's issue about mediation. This is the mediation and representation of our demands. And then we're gonna have a radical transformation of institutions. And the radical transformation was to extend them and democratize them at the same time. So there was this idea in Brazil that people said, you know, we need to finish the democratic revolution to then have the socialist revolution or we've got to have them concurrently, right? We've got to expand the network of schools and democratize them and improve them. And in a lot of instances, this wound up this sort of participatory approach. Latin American left loves meetings. Um, so the participatory approach was, okay, you win a municipal government, uh, you're gonna open a lot of decisions to the popular mandate, ideally everything, and this is gonna build popular power and legitimacy for the left project. It's gonna extend your basis. 
and at the same time, it's going to hold the party in check, right? We do not want someone becoming mayor. You know, Raquel is also actually a mayor right now. We did not discuss. <laughs> She's the mayor of the University of Sao Paulo. It's true. <laughs> we have to, we don't know. I realize we have to have some councils to, <laughs> to hold you in check. But the idea was <laughs> you have these participatory meetings that are transforming, uh, moving the state while building popular power for it. And, you know, fascinating stuff. Uh, Marta Harnecker actually went around Latin America and had incredible discussions with folks in different countries. And people were looking at each other all the time. And the Zapatistas actually were looking at some of these things. You know, uh, this, this Brazil thing is, we have a bad state in southern Mexico. We're going to do something else. So people were thinking and reflecting on all of this. Um, so then as the story goes, parties do relatively well. The reports and academic stuff, including mine, on municipal administrations is largely a kind of positive story for a long time. Then we have the national victory uh, of Lula and the other pink tide governments. I will say a couple of things also to keep with a positive vibe. So Raquel was talking about harm reduction in some of these governments, right? So uh, under the Workers' Party administration, something like 45 million people were lifted out of poverty. Uh, we have affirmative action for the first time in federal universities, while well, doubling the number of university seats. The set-asides for universities uh, is about 50%. It's a very, it was, you know, it has been transformative. In Brazil now you have, maybe it's a black lower middle class or black middle class. In Bolivia, you have an indigenous middle class that is a result of some of these policies. So these governments, uh, one of the founders of the Workers' Party, Olivia Duter, has a phrase which I think captures the, the region. He says, look, these are governments of inclusion, not of transformation. So we worked on inclusion. They did a lot of inclusion. However, a couple of things. One, as Hakel was um, alluding to, the, in the case of Brazil, but certainly in the case of Bolivia too, the parties that were supposed to be our parties began to look a lot more like the traditional political system than the other way around. The idea, the phrase was, you're going to be a virus into the bourgeois state, but it seems like we got sick <laughs> with the bourgeois state somehow on the way there. So these parties started to look that. Organizing and the idea that it was a party for militants and community organizing becomes much less important than corralling voters and electors. It becomes, by and large, a party that's concerned with its own electoral reproduction, mm -hmm. looking pretty traditional. Uh, the Workers' Party has a lot of wonderful internal rules about promoting base members to leadership and helping them run for office. In fact, what happens is we had an amazing president in 2003, and when we were looking for someone run now, it was the same guy, <laughs> which is, he's in a, Lula is an incredible person, but sure feels like we should have more, right? We should have women in leadership, we should have people of color in leadership. So the party criticized itself now for not become continuing on that, that radical road that it had set for itself and looking a lot more traditional. Uh, the party becomes absorbed into the state apparatus. So, uh, you know, when you win a seat in Congress or you win a, even a, a local state assembly, you get 11 jobs for your friends. And you call the people from your political tendency and the other organizers and they come with you. And if you do this enough times, not a lot of movement people left. I mean, the thing that was incredible coming, living here as I was and going back to Brazil and just the emptying out mm -hmm. of so many movements. Oh, I'm going to go find somebody. Oh, yeah, they're at the mayor's office of this other party, which somehow is an electoral alliance with us, mm -hmm. right? So the, the party becomes absorbed. Um, it's not so concerned with this organizing in that sense as much as turning out. And the meetings, 
took a, a weird turn in my view. Um, there were tons of meetings under the Workers' Party National Administration, tons. There was, there was, a, there was a political scientist named Roberto Pires who was trying to calculate the number of people hours that were taken in meetings. No, this is no joke. I think it was like 3 million people went to Brasilia for a meeting at one point. So there's national congresses and conferences with a state and a city, lots and lots. Of, I, was, I was trying to get him to calculate what is the drag on the economy in terms of GDP, in ter because it's a lot. Socialism takes a lot of meetings. Whatever this was also took a lot of meetings, right? And but the, the thing about the participatory instruments during the national administration was that they were not about building popular power. They were not about turning over decisions. They were not about popular sovereignty. You could go participate in all the conferences, go all the way to Brasilia, have a good idea, and they would say, well, thank you for that excellent idea. And it's like a community board hearing or something in New York. It's, it's not a, it's not, it's not the empowered decision making that brought this party to what it was. Um, everything Hakel said was about the the June twenty thirteen is I, I think I don't think it's that controversial to me. What you're, I mean, it, it was a depressing circumstance watching Brazil descend into the nightmare that it did was unbelievably depressing. Uh, one tiny fact, so there was destruction of the Amazon, there was political violence mm -hmm. in a way that was unprecedented. Um, the mobs felt empowered to just harass people and professors and activists in a way that simply had, was not part of our Brazilian experience. Brazil used to import political refugees. Brazil used to receive political refugees and now started to export them. Right, we started to receive people in the United States from Brazil, like Marcia Chiburi, mm -hmm. uh, scholars at risk, which in my lifetime is a shocking and just depressing thing. And the stories she's telling, the other scholars at risk, are heartbreaking. The um, and I want to say a couple things before getting to I think what were some of the positive vibes. But I've, I've been giving you time to think about the positive <laughs> stuff. The the authoritarianism and fascism. So one, people did not think the right was going to be as organized as it was. People were not aware of the transnational links and the consultants, you know, the Paraguay using the same right wing consultants they were using in Brazil for the media. Um, but I think everyone underestimated just the deep, nasty racism that lives inside our upper middle classes and elites. Mm -hmm. I think the, uh, that authoritarianism, as a, as a person who's white in Brazil, all of this Bolsonaro stuff was, it's, it's a familiar devil. This is deep, deep in Brazilian history. And what Bolsonaro did was not invent it, but just bring it out of the shadows and bring it out of the closets. And it was, it has been absolutely awful. So now we have this new particular conjuncture uh, we have, uh, so what's, what's on the agenda for the new Pink Tide? Which, by the way, is kind of a slippery thing. I was looking, according to, you know, Newsweek, it's 80% of Latin America is under the left. Uh, and I was like, okay, <laughs> how do you come up with that? <laughs> um, but, you know, Colombia, Bolivia, Chile, Brazil, Honduras, like, what are some of the things that's on people's minds? What are, so one. I think people were taking all this experience and all this failure and successes in this mix as a way to rethink and like have a new set of politics. What's on the agenda? One, democratic reconstruction. I think it's been shocking in people in all these places to learn in Colombia how many people identify with fascist anti-democratic sentiments. It's not that people are right wing. People in large numbers identify with anti-democratic. I think, you know, criminals should be killed. I think there's too much, this, <laughs> so we need to rebuild the democracy. We, so th this is part of the agenda. As Boris likes to say, democracy is always an incomplete project, but it's especially incomplete right now. <laughs> um, right, there's these, we have to work with, we have to find a way to attract some of those segments into a democratic process so that we can at least have a, 
societies. Um, second, now there's black and indigenous claims that are present in these left parties uh, in ways that haven't been the case before. So this last election brought our first black trans congresswoman to office in Brazil. Uh, black women were elected in larger numbers than before. Uh, this is all on the left. Uh, we have a discussion about why is it that these parties, everyone looks like a white university professor and not like the base of the party. I think these are healthy overdue discussions and I think is going to make uh, this next moment interesting and exciting. People are talking about the carcerality of the state as a, as a feature, not a bug, in a way that feels robust. For a long time in places like Brazil, people talk about human rights violations and they talk about the dictatorship and middle-class students being arrested and tortured, which is terrible. But there's been violence against black bodies mm -hmm. consistently, consistently, increasingly uh, over these past years. And the left has never had a good response to that. The kind of imagination in dialogue with transnational movements, I think, is very exciting. Mm -hmm. And I think people were thinking about what a post-extractivist left uh, can look like. So I don't know. I think these are positive. This, I want to end this on a, on a positive note. I think this is people in realities. This is the context they have. This is the kinds of problems they're thinking about. You know, the, and now we didn't even talk about the collective mandate. The idea of collectives of women running for office under one seat is an exciting social movement innovation that comes largely out of the black movement in Brazil. Uh, Raquel's friend, Guilherme Bolos, I've mm -hmm. uh, got a tremendous vote. You're upset because I'm so positive. <laughs> <laughs> it's your friend. I was in Raquel's house. It's like, hold on, I got to talk to you again. I was like, whoa, he's famous. But so, so there is a kind of like radical energy. I think the young people who mobilized in 2013, horizontalism, I think there's a way to bring that into some mm -hmm. political project that's going to look different. <coughs> um, but yeah, I, I think it's not going to be terrible. <laughs> okay, thank you. There is no moderation, so it's self-management. Yeah, yeah, self-management. Self-management. Yes. Okay. <laughs> yes, please. Yeah. Um, no, thank you, Gianpaolo. I think it's very important to take into into account another aspect that you didn't bring, and me neither which are the left and the all imaginary of the left is related to a world that does not exist anymore. Yes. So working class, huh? Where is the working class? I'm sorry. The, the, Uber the Uberization of, sorry. So this word, there is no more a working class, a pro proletarians. Where are the proletarians? I mean, the work has been the uberization of work. Entrepreneurship. So the informality, which has been always, always the case of the work in Brazil, because we have always had a very small part of, of, of the population engaged informal work with signed contracts, pensions, and all that. But that was an aspiration. But this is not an aspiration anymore. There's been a, the aspiration is entrepreneurship, mm -hmm. is to become an entrepreneur. So all the informals now, they are entrepreneurs of themselves, self-exploiting their own bodies and times and connected to high finance through digital platforms. And so, they, I mean, capital has changed. The, the political economy of work and time and relation of, with territories has changed. And the left is using the same categories. So my feeling is that besides all the things that you have pointed about the Workers' Party and the, the militants and all that. I mean, uh, there was a change in the base, a real 
cultural, economic cultural uh, change in, in low-income communities that I think that the left could not grasp. Mm -hmm. And the right is just yeah. <laughs> floating over. And I think this is very important. Another aspect, you mentioned that part of, of, of the popular base in, uh, in the 80s, 70s, 80s, was based on um, the liberation church, the liberation Catholic church. This is over. This does not exist anymore. So in terms of religion, this was absolutely taken over by evangelic Pentecostal um, churches which value prosperity, entrepreneurship, free market, competition, meritocracy. And they are the ones who are providing social structure and support at the peripheries. They are really into that. So we are talking about the, a third component, violence, violence. Uh, it's very important to understand how much, and this is also true for Mexico, for Colombia, and for many other places, how much the dismantling of the industrial base in our cities, the dismantling of the whole changes that happened in the world in, in the 90s, uh, and the taking over of the territory of drug trafficking, um, illicit, trade and all that as the one and only alternative for the young people to survive and to be able to eat. And those change, I mean, that uh, neighborhood associations had been taken by drug traffic. So those private regimes of, ter of territorial control, they are seizing. So you have private regimes of territorial control at the corporate level, public-private partnerships, <laughs> urban renewal schemes where private owns entire neighborhoods. But at, at the low-income income, you also have private regimes of territorial control, delinquent private regimes of territorial control and based on violence, which is something which is faced every day. So, what I'm saying is that the left, the left parties, the organization, don't have an answer to that, to this new way of organizing time, space, and daily life. But having said that, I agree with you with the fact that it's the first time in Brazilian history that the issue of racism is raised seriously and is taken seriously. And this is very important because the very root of violence is slavery. <laughs> this is the root of violence. So if you don't tackle that, you don't tackle anything <laughs> there. So I think it's important. And I mean, that's going to bring change. And that's why a government like Lula's government today is very important to have, not because Lula will bring the reforms we need, because of course it's a broad coalition and with very limited conditions of really changing things and under you know, the, the hegemony of finance, uh, the hegemony of banks, of agribusiness and all that, but, but, during Lula's government, social movements can exist, subsist, can be supported, can uh, imagine, organize, and be ready and alive, alive, to imagine other futures. So it's very important what's going on in terms of giving time and space for social movements and for those emerging movements to grow and and to think and to bring a new a new way of organizing 
spaces and territories, which is not there now, but that will come <laughs> eventually. That's positive. <laughs> It's a rough moment right now. <laughs> I'm not gonna lie. I mean, people are really depressed in Chile, right? Like yeah. it's it's hard. It was a it was a blowing defeat, and uh, and it's and it was a recent blowing defeat, right? So, I guess I'll say two things. One is I think uh, I'm hopeful about the expansive. Uh, ideas about rights uh, and those conversations that that came out of the Constitution. Um, some people have criticized um, that there was too much focus on identity politics and not enough material, you know, heft in the Constitution. And I think that actually there was a lot of material heft and a lot of focus on rights. And both of those and the combination of those are really positive. It's, it's a positive and innovative direction. Um, and one that at least some organizations have really taken seriously. So I'm thinking about, I was telling John Paula before, the, you know, the mine workers union uh, who had a lot, they had a lot to lose from kind of a climate oriented constitution mm -hmm. supported it and organized for it and embraced it and uh, wanted to think about alternatives, right? Um, and the Walmart unions, at least the progressive Walmart unions, continue to use the constitution as a political education tool, right? So that it's, um, there are ways in which I mean, the Constitution, what it, the document was a mess, right? Like, n even if it had passed, the amount of work that would have had to happen by movements to implement even a fraction of what was written in the Constitution would have been enormous, right? So uh, for movements to see it as a living document and as a document that, that can be used to kind of continue to have those conversations and discussions um, and develop a, a politics around it and push the state, even though those things aren't in the Constitution, right? You you can still push the state uh, on those rights. Um, I think that's positive, I'll, um, and that's 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 about all I can say. <laughs> okay, questions. Yes. Yeah. Hey, thank you all very much. Uh, very provocative panel. Uh, I might lean on the more grumpy side of the questions here, but I, I wonder what it means to delimit the horizon of struggle to the state. One thing that didn't come up in the talk were the struggles for autonomy and self-determination that flourish throughout Latin America. And oftentimes, these struggles, even under progressive governments, are met with extremely harsh repression. So I wonder, what does that mean for us as we're thinking about the nature of the state and the potential for liberation right now? Mm -hmm. Thank you all. Do we want to take blocks? Yeah. 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 Hi. I guess just to kind of echo and riff off that, I was thinking about this kind of question of um, like in Greece's recent like direct action cells, or even in this recent um, speculative documentary, uh, a dry burning ground in Brasilia, um, this idea of like direct action cells, small organized violence against the state, and what this type of whether it actually happens, say in in Greece or a different, or in this kind of speculative imagining, um, how does this type type of uh, self-determined action, can it create, can it go towards creating different conditions in the state, or how do you think it kind of plays into this, whether the, it's the reaction to that, that's going to be quite negative, or does it actually uh, mobilize more and more? Um, Uh, this is a question for Carolina, PSC comrade, um, about uh, the conditions that led uh, that 
the failure of the um, referendum led to, because Australia is approaching a referendum or a plebiscite at the end of this year, um, far like lower stakes, but it's about uh, enshrining an Indigenous voice to Parliament. And anybody on the radical left, be they an Indigenous activist or a um, left-wing Labour militant, will tell you that it's a, a non shift that like the actual concrete consequences of this won't really change anything in terms of the uh, relations on the ground. However, the unions are behind the um, referendum. They're behind a yes vote. Um, and it's really only sort of the fractional parties and some of the indigenous radicals that are pushing a no campaign on the left. Um, I've been trying to size it up in my head as to like what the appropriate course of action here is because from an organizing point of view, I can see what those fractional parties are doing. I can see that they see it as an opportunity to organize people who are uh, disillusioned with the system into their ranks around this question of, you know, this isn't enough. But I'm also terrified of what the consequences of a successful no campaign would be. And so I'm just wondering like how the right rallied after the no, if, the, if this has been like sort of touted as a big victory for the right and what that means for their ability to organize. And just going back to your distinction between mobilizing and organizing, um, whether or not the strategic decision to strafe a piece of legislation from the left like that isn't taking into consideration what consequences that actually might have on the ground for organizing after the vote goes through. Um, those are great questions. I mean, <coughs> the right in Chile, I mean, they, they're so powerful and it, it certainly didn't help that the Wall Street Journal and major U.S. press was like, ah, <laughs> right? Um, uh, so, yeah, I mean, they really rallied, right? They, they lost. Uh, shockingly, actually, um, in October, in that first that vote for the plebiscite, like they were shocked that they lost, right? Um, and they learned a lesson from that, uh, and they really they went hard and strong from day one. And the left saw the number of people in the streets, and they were like, "We don't have to do the work because look, we pulled a million people into the streets." That, and I'll tell you, two days before this vote, when um, I was like, we're going to lose. We're going to lose this. This is going to fail. I mean, I started saying that in March. March to September, right? And I was the Debbie Downer. But, uh, and I hate being right about this, right? I mean, this was, it was tragic. But even two days before the vote, the left was like, we pulled half a million people in the streets. Right, celebrating uh, this this constitution. Of course, we're going to win this. Of course, we're going to win this. And they were shocked. People were shocked. And I was like, "Did you see the polls? I mean, I we can't, you know, we can't rely on polls for everything. But it, it was definitely a bellwether, right? Uh, and they were just like." I, I just can't believe that people were so, you know, that people have been um, losing the word, but like hoodwinked by neoliberalism. <laughs> right? And I was just like, yeah. right, but you didn't organize. You didn't organize. You counted on the millions of people in the streets and you didn't spend time in communities, right? And the organizations that have the most capacity to do that for example, parties and unions um, were kind of absent, right? I mean, unions were, there was one union in the, that was uh, one union representative that was elected to the constitutional, uh, among the constitutional delegates, right? One. Um, so that, so then people were shocked and it was like, well, the organizations that can most carry out a program uh, based on membership, we're not in the room, right? So, um, yeah. So, I, I mean, and the right organized. I mean, they took caravans to the townships. They made sure their employers were all telling workers that they needed to go out there and vote and vote against the Constitution or they would lose their jobs. Like, they did the work. Um, 
And it was brutal. So I think that's a really important, I mean, it's a brutal lesson, but it's an important lesson, yeah. Autonomy. Um, there is one change which has been very, very significant, and it's related to indigenous movement in Brazil. I think that one change, a very meaningful change, um, is two things. One is that um, not in, the, in the previous uh, cycle, um, there was NGOs funded by international money that were putting forward the indigenous people agenda in Brazil. Now, and this has to do with the inclusionary policies, you have a whole generation of indigenous leadership and indigenous organizations that are taking over the lead of their claims. They are much more powerful and, and organized. And there is a difference because in the previous uh, Lula's uh, uh, organization and Workers' Party uh, rule, uh, the, the, the topic of indigenous autonomy or indigenous sovereignty was absolutely absent, mm -hmm. absolutely absent. And this is a change. Now you have a, a new ministry of indigenous people who is a, a woman indigenous leader herself all the ministries, all indigenous leadership in, in, in all the structures. So, I mean, this is, uh, an, and this is absolutely new in Brazil, and I think it will be very important because it's, a, it's the way, it's the leading discussion on environment and environmental issues. It's coming from this, autonomy group and and that changes completely the tone of the discussion around the environment because you know environmental discussions can be really 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 much captured by by uh, corporations certifications greenwashing and all that so i think this is uh, what's coming and one single line on the, on the question of constitution. Um, we, as social movements, we put in, in the 80s a lot of work and pressure in writing down a new constitution, which was adopted in Brazil in 1988. And then doing a great effort in order to enforce the Constitution and to make it really happen. And just for you to give an example, the right to housing is in the Constitution. The fact that property has a social function is in the Constitution. But nobody cares. <laughs> nobody cares. You don't have any housing policy or land policy that really is trying to enforce it. So that also plays the question for social movements, how much you invest in legislation, constitution, institutionality, and how much you invest in trying to organize and create different ways of organizing space and life. So I think this is very important now because there is much more effort, in my view, on uh, investing from community leadership and organizations in investing in community plans, community organizations, right? Thinking how we can organize our lives ourselves, not exactly with the idea that they will be autonomous or, or, or but with the idea that not, I mean, Laws in Brazil, it's not, I mean, a, a law, it's not something to be enforced. A law is something that eventually <laughs> can be enforced or not, 
depending in the level of struggle and power that you have. So this is a lesson learned from, from the previous cycle, which I think also will bring a very important change. Yeah, and I'll just give a yes and to the grumpy gentleman, which is, um, <laughs> I was trying to, to remember the line from the prison notebooks where Gramsci talks about an infantile disorder where the working class limits its imagination and its claims to the bourgeois state. And this is a pre-revolutionary consciousness. And, you know, Gramsci's no autonomist, right? Um, so the view very much shared by both movements and radicals within left formations in Brazil and in many places in Latin America is that that's a mistake. I'll give you an example of that mistake, which was the, the thing I know best, which is a terrible idea with participatory budgeting. Um, don't do it. <laughs> Too late. Um, the, what, what, yes, it's a, but what happens in um, many social movements at the municipal level in Brazil became sort of uh, they began to think in budget lines, and they began to think in terms of the budget cycle. So the budgets are due in March, this is in June, and it, it colonizes the kind of life world and imagination that people have. People used to be against apartheid and solidarity with Cuba and for, and then they become experts in moving budget lines around. So <laughs> limiting yourself to the state as your target and horizon, limit your imagination, I, I think is a lesson a lot of people mm -hmm. were saying was a was an there was there was not enough counterweight. If you're going to play in Portuguese, a post institutional institutional gambit. Yeah. If you're going to play in the institutions. There needs to be some kind of counterweight so that 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 you're alluding to doesn't happen. Yeah. Yeah. Rudy, you let us know when when. Uh, we have lost, uh, we have less time to continue in this discussion because he has been um, super. Uh, I don't know how to put it, but inspiring. I mean, to to be in this in this day uh, that I don't want it to end. I have not felt this way in a long time, <laughs> perhaps in the pandemic and so forth. So it's been super inspiring. But I, I was very taken by by your answer in terms of the Chile, like everything's like a demise, and you know it's in a very bad situation. And it brings me back to a Chilean, which is a, a, a very young musician that is the son of Alfredo Yar, uh, uh, an art, a Chilean artist, is this guy's name, Nicolas Yar. He has this song where uh, I've always been taken by since I heard it, which was not long ago, where he says, Ya dijimos no, pero el sí está en todo. And this was in a response of October 5, 1988, which was when the plebiscite against Augusto Pinochet was very triumphant, no? And so, uh, I'm going to translate that, ya dijimos no, pero el sí está en todo. It's a, we, all, we said no, but the yes is in everything. Meaning that the vote did not change a thing, right? Yes, you had no Pinochet, but everything, all the structures that are not Pinochet structures, are 500 years of capitalist advancement, you know, are placed upon, you know, the belief that one single vote is going to change the stuff. And I think I, you got me, Raquel, because I was going to mention exactly the same. I participated uh, very directly with Hugo Chavez in Venezuela. I uh, worked with, uh, with uh, Rafael Correa in Ecuador. And uh, they also have a new constitution that was put on. And it's the same type of situation that we tend to fall into these determinisms, right? I mean, in this case, it's a constitutional determinism. Like if you put the constitution, it's going to change everything. Or if you do the budgeting, it's going to change everything. And I don't know why, but we constantly become obsessed with a specific formula that is going to that. In, in my view, it's, it's the multitude of social movements and the multitude sort of contradictions that emerge to them, but the different constituencies and the different fights you know, that are being fought in the streets that are going to make the change, right? Whether or not we believe it's going to be towards the state or in an autonomous form or so on, that depends on your political light, right? But, but I think it's, it's very important to look way beyond this, right? If anything, this provided you know, an advancement. Because you know, you've had, since Pinochet, no constitution, the same freaking constitution that you've had since Pinochet, which is crazy, right? But nevertheless, right, it, it is a, an advance. It is not the advance, and I think it would be very, it was not okay to focus all the energies on that. It literally won't change. The yes is in everything, 
This is a 500 years right, of absolute oppression. Of a, of a colonial, you know, capitalist and all of that type of things that we're discussing. So we have to think, as my point of view, in, in, in 300 years, in 400 years, I was always been taught that Marx actually thought communism was coming in three, 400 years. I have to, we, we are fighting, we're in the struggle in this, you know, in, in step by step and so on. We cannot lose sight of the long-term timeline, right? Uh, while, of course, addressing the super urgencies that, are, that we're trying to do. I guess I just wanted to put a little bit of inspiration. I felt really like <laughs> you sang me when you said like it's 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 just so you know it, it's not okay, it's really not. <laughs> and congratulations for trying. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I'm gonna carry on some of that uh, kind of anti-stasis discourse that I really appreciate. Um, my experience comes from Lebanon, and to my Chilean comrade, I feel you. Um, the Chilean experience, as it was unfolding, it was simultaneously with the Lebanese revolution. Um, and a lot of this resonates. Um, I'm, I'm, I kept thinking while I'm listening to this very right now conversation about Lenin's, probably my, my favorite, and the productive thing about Lenin's state and revolution, where he's asking us to dare to imagine another state that is post-capitalism, where to what extent taking over the state is actually going to resolve any of our problems or the constitution. As someone coming from the Lebanese experience, we have a saying in Arabic, which kind of roughly translates to the solution for the state is the dissolution of the state, of the current state, probably rebuilding another one. Um, and on that, I, I'm just reflecting on the question of non-governmental organizations um, and the struggle against the state, against the right, against the elites. I'm really interested in how that is also a struggle against the capitalist state of affairs, um, especially in what concerns the question of bureaucratizing activists and revolutionaries, um, not necessarily in this, in, through the state itself, but like through a vast network of non-governmental organizations that professionalize the struggle and most often effectively humanitarianize the strife into some sort of human concern or another that kind of totally shaves off the political edge from it, right? This was what shot us in the foot in Lebanon um, in 2019. And this was really the cause, the reason behind why mobilization never transpired into actual organization. Um, because, you know, we used to have career politicians, now we have professional activists who get paid and who look for grants more than actually engage with society. So I guess I'm just trying to you know, put it out in the conversation. How do we deal with sustaining our struggle while simultaneously kind of trying to ward off <laughs> you know, funded struggles? Thank you. I was hesitant because I spoke already. I see Ruthie's hand. <laughs> Should I just give you the mic? Just curious of how the politics of recognition and representation impede like transform like material transformation um, and lessons that Latin America can teach the US. I'm sorry. <clears throat> Um, curious how the politics of recognition and representation either impedes or hastens um, us like materially addressing anti-blackness and anti-indigeneity in our policies. So can I just, I'll, I'll, I'll say a few things. I mean, one thing is I, I don't disagree, in general I agree, right? You don't want to put all your eggs in the constitution. On the other hand, Chile is really, backwards like uh, as a country like in thinking about uh race colonialism like 
until maybe five years ago, people were like, oh, there was no slavery in Chile. Like that, you know, I mean, like literally five years. I mean, we were the last country maybe in, you know, to get divorce legalized. I, it is so, so, so. I think that the three years that were spent in this process, kind of from uprising to vote, um, was useful. Like it was useful time to have to develop a more expansive sense of rights and what's possible and humanity and you know and rec- and and opening the conversation and talking about you know indigenous oppression. You know, I think it was really useful, and I think it it has. Um, kind of opened the perspective for a lot of young people. Um, and a lot of young people brought that perspective to the table. So I think it was it was good and it was useful and it was an experiment. And it was also, you can't, you know, it's not a substitution. You always have to continue to organize, right? Um, I do think that the focus right now, the the Borita's focus on like trying to do the constitutional thing again is a total waste of time, (laughs) right? It's like, dude, the moment passed. Uh, We didn't win it. And like spending, you already only have a 28% rating, like spending any additional amount of time on trying to make this constitution thing work is, is no good. I think we should take into account um, and understand more deeply what happened in the 90s, especially, I think, in the 90s in Latin America, maybe the timing is different for for each each country. Because I think we we lived through a very perverse convergence of, in one side, all the new liberal thinking was bringing the idea of strategic planning, bringing on the table civil society representations in order to build a policy which is in relation with civil society, empowering civil society. So ideas that at the same time, the left was also arguing for that, opening the state for radical democracy with more participation, public participation. But we were talking about completely different things, completely different things. But in the public sphere, they they seem to be the same. And that was very confusing, I think, because, again, we, ca- we were caught in a sort of trap in this way, because a lot of may- progressive mayors, which were doing participatory blah, 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 they were, yes, also supported, and then the World Bank was saying, oh, look how beautiful is the participatory a practice of this city and and that and then and let's take that into other stage and other stage and other city. So it was very blurring, very blurring. And I think that if we really want to radicalize democracy, which was the banner by that time, let's radicalize democracy, which meant basically open up the state and the decision-making process, which it is in the hands of corporations and mediated by politicians to the people, basically. And that did not happen. That did not happen. So uh, now, (laughs) what is the question? What is going on now? I think new liberals were very efficient on providing not only the discourse, but also the means. So philanthropy today is very active on low-income neighborhoods. 
supporting neighborhood associations, supporting uh, neighborhood leaders, uh, supporting projects, giving grants. And yes, people are absolutely professionalized around that. And again, this is one of the way by which society became neoliberalized. <laughs> so we are not talking about only economics, or we are not talking just about corporation and the state, but neoliberalism is something which is also from below. <laughs> it's been cooked below. So that's what I'm arguing here. If we don't understand that it's cooked from below, it will be very difficult. And we are thinking, oh yeah, let's, let's, let's criticize the state and corporations. But we are not really disputing that inside in, in the biopolitics. So I understand how much Chile, I mean, you had a brainwash in Chile <laughs> for many years. I mean, it's the most new liberal society and culture of Latin America, maybe in the world. <laughs> it was, it, new liberalism was invented in Chile. <laughs> Simultaneously as it was invented here in the US and UK, were the three places where new liberalism was invented. So, I mean, it's not surprising how deep is embedded in, uh, in, in Chilean minds. So I think we should think more on that and work more on that, critically on that, in order to understand what kind of new, new forms of thinking society and territories that relate to their realities that we have uh, down uh, in the peripheries and, and so on. Perfect. And I'll just add one thing to the NGO question, which is, I think the question there is, how do we think about the livelihood and the survival of people who are engaged in struggle, right? Many people wind up sort of trapped in lives, maybe, because the NGO provides them survival and provides material things and the philanthropy brings things to their community. Mm -hmm. And what is the other thing that we're going to do for people so that they cannot be trapped by that? And, and, and I say that as an open question politically, you know, here in the city of New York, sometimes there's political fights about, you know, so and so you're insufficiently radical because you organize or organized with or receive benefits from X, Y, or Z nonprofit. And you can fill that in as you wish with the names, but and it's a tough question because people sometimes know that they're trapped. So what is the kind of alternative that we can provide to people, right? A, a simple principle refusal maybe is one strategy, but I feel like we should be able to do more. But I, I appreciate your question very much. And is that the? Yeah, yeah I actually do like it. Oh, good. <laughs> <laughs> no, it, it, it follows on the point you just made, John Paul. And um, I want to thank the three of you for fantastically um, uh, vibrant and uh, depressing and yet helpful <laughs> Thank you. Uh, presentation. Not the, not depressing. And this is what I get when I send out the guidelines late. <laughs> <laughs> Luck of the draw. But but here I, I actually want to build from uh, especially uh, Raquel's point about uh, you know we live in as neoliberal society and subjects and that you know infantile that you know Gramsci is credited with is also something that popped up in Lenin, not in state and revolution, but in imperialism, mm -hmm. right? And thinking about, you know, infantile subjectivities. Mm -hmm. And one of our infantile subjectivities, and I'm using our really broadly, there's some, a lot of abolitionists in the room, is forgetting that the people who we organize with and the world we're trying to change is as saturated with all the crap as above is, uh -huh. right? Absolutely, um, absolutely. The, the presumption is the problem is crime, the solution is punishment. Yeah. The presumption is the problem is hunger, the solution is a wage. Yeah. 
-hmm. The presumption is the problem is houselessness. The solution is home ownership, yeah. right? If, and so on and so forth. So, so getting through that is part of what I'd hope we would do here today by trying to think about the state, not as the limit, but as a set of institutions, internally contradictory, for us and against us, that we can sort of think about and think through and think with. So thank you all. And we will continue after a break. So six o'clock, we'll do a roundup round table. Everybody welcome. Well, I was going to be not depressing, and then we actually don't have a lot of not depressing content. <laughs> Just my affect. <laughs> I was like... You know, you mentioned um, the, the uh, anti-racist coalition. No, I know, right? Oh, okay, see you. Of course. Thank you for your question. You know that the anti-racist coalition did
Bring your paper. <laughs> we need those notes. Yeah. And David's gonna sit here. You can sit, or you can sit with me, and David can sit there. Be us against them. David's coming. David's coming. Okay. No, he's coming. He'll be here in a moment. No, you're fine. All right. So the great finale. <laughs> we will review. We will reveal now which measure should have been taken. <laughs> Okay, here's here's another mic. It works. I don't know, use it however you want. I've got to. Not when they were when the off button was on though, I think. All right. Um, all right. So thank you, thank you, thank you. Uh, thank you again to all of the panelists all day for fantastic <laughs> presentations. Again, I, I want to do what I, I did last night, which is to thank from uh, the bottom of my heart and my disorganized soul um, the amazing organizing work of Mary Taylor, who's assistant director of the center. She's hiding. I saw her. She's back there. I see her. And she is running around with that damn clipboard. And if you didn't sign the clipboard, we're going to bill you for your lunch. <laughs> um, uh, Michelle Cannon, who, Michelle, are you here? No. And Hodeb, uh, Muhammad Hodeb, who just left, um, who provided all kinds of able support to our effort. Um, I also want to shout out into the universe. Thank you, Rekha Raj, for trying to get here. She tried and tried, and it didn't work. Uh, but I hope we can welcome her in real life one of these days soon. And um, so the round table is, uh, we are we call ourselves the sub thugs. And we'll explain that to you if you insist after the program is over. And um, but Everyone is welcome to participate in the conversation that we hope to have just launched today on the topic of the state, um, the theme of the state, the institutions of the state, the possibilities of the state, um, many other things, including some of us, like my three and I, when we're sitting together, whispering, see and hear state when others of us who are presenting say there is no state involved in what we're talking about. And that's interesting, <laughs> politically. And I think it's not infantile in, in the possible subjectivity that it brings to mind, but I could be wrong. So David, you've been very quiet today, so why don't you um, take it away with some um, <laughs> remarks? <laughs> Uh, I was reminded uh, in the last panel that uh, Oscar Wilde was uh, asked his uh, opinion about socialism and he said, too many meetings. <laughs> uh, I imagine if he was asked his opinion about socialist constitutions, he would say, too many pages. <laughs> uh, so here we are at a meeting, so maybe we've had too many. Um, I, I, I did, it's been a fantastic time. I, I, I really very much enjoyed the Brecht uh, last night. And, and uh, it, it revealed something to me that I w was astonished about. That uh, many years ago, back in 1996, I wrote a book and I ended up with an epilogue from Brecht, which said it's only by the lessons of reality that you learn to change reality. And I never knew where it came from until last night. <laughs> so this is a fantastic learning experience. <laughs> and I thought, you know, because somebody had given me the, the whole quote and I'd used it, and I, and I thought, well, I either have to go through all of Brecht's works to try and find it or just leave it there. And I've left it there for the last, you know, 20 odd years. So 
But I thought I'd make a, a few remarks about the, the state. Um, uh, first off, in terms of the conversation here, uh, there's been a lot more about civil society than about the state. And it's pretty evident that the state is very much contingent upon the conditions in civil society and that most people want to talk about civil society and the, or what I would call the social formation rather than uh, the state itself. Because the state itself, it seems to me, well, first off we should uh, disaggregate it a bit and kind of say, I want to talk about the capitalist state as a specific kind of state. Uh, secondly, uh, I would want to talk about different instead of talking about the state and saying I'm for it or against it, you kind of say, well, you know, if the state takes care of garbage disposal and health care, I kind of am in favor of it. And if it's dropping bombs on people, I'm not. So that the state is... So then there's a question of who, who runs the state and what's the situation. And I was very impressed recently by looking at some of the stuff by uh, Giovanni Arrighi and... Fernand Brodel, in which uh, the state is clearly understood as, a, as a, an agent of capital. And that the state and capital are, in Brodel's view, one and the same. Uh, Giovanni Righi talked about the fusion of state and capital. And uh, yeah, that, that comes about because uh, you see, uh, you know, there was somebody who was a elected uh, Prime Minister of Great Britain. They came out with an austerity program. The bondholders revolted and, you know, she was Prime Minister for what? One week? Two weeks? Something like that? Not as long as the lettuce. <laughs> right. <laughs> still too long in my Yes, opinion. yeah. And, and, and this, th this goes back also to the famous remark of uh, Bill Clinton after he got elected. He was going over all the programs he wanted to, to set out and He'd uh, invited Robert Rubin from Goldman Sachs to be Treasury Secretary, and, and Robert Rubin told him basically, no, you can't do those things. And Clinton said, well, why not? And he said, well, you know, the bondholders won't let you. And Clinton complained, you mean to say my whole program is contingent what a bunch of fucking bond tra traders want? And Robert Rubin's answer was yes. And so Clinton came in promising universal health care and all those things. He gave us the reform of welfare as you know it. He gave us NAFTA. He gave us the whole neoliberal program, um, which is, you know, uh, actually rather significant about, you know, to what degree do even social movements, but particularly individuals within them, actually have the power to do anything. And my, my examples here would be I've lost count of the number of times when you know, really close friends, very progressive uh, in academia, become a dean, and within two years they're acting like assholes. <laughs> <laughs> and, and you realize the position, you know, the position makes the person rather than the person making the position. So I think that's also true of a lot of social movements, that social movements come in with some agenda and then they get absorbed within the apparatus. And so, so there's this side of, uh, this kind of side of, side of things. Um, but then the other thing that struck me, and I think it's important we introduce this into the conversation, is the state is only an entity within an interstate system, and we haven't talked about the interstate system. In exactly the same way that Marx talks about the coercive laws of competition, which force corporations to do all kinds of things that they don't necessarily want to do, so that interstate competition uh, within the interstate system forces all kinds of things in terms of you know, military expenditures and all the rest of it. And so we, we actually have to look, when we're thinking about the state, that it, it should, it, we have to disaggregate it, we have to sort of fine-tune our approach to it, we have to think about those parts of the state we want to succeed, you know, providing I don't know, water, sewage, uh, health care, and all those kinds of things. And those things we don't. But then there's a very interesting structural thing, which is about the relationship to civil society. The thing that struck, struck me was um, uh, in 2007, 2008, when there's this big kind of crisis coming, and then uh, actually at a certain point, three people came and stood before the television cameras. You know, the president disappeared. Congress didn't know what to do. 
And the three people were Ben Bernanke, Hank Paulson, and Tim Geithner. And you realize that actually this is the US Treasury Department plus uh, the, 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 the Federal Reserve. And they were the decision makers. Uh, and and you, when you look back, uh, this seems to me to constitute what I would call a state finance nexus. That there's a relationship between the Treasury Department, which is inside the state, and the Federal Reserve, which is technically outside of the state, but is the head of the banking financial system. And when you then look at it, you look at this interesting structure. You have the Justice Department, and then you have all of the court system. And, and in fact, there's no such thing as a department in the state that doesn't have a parallel institution in civil society, which is actually, sometimes they're in agreement, sometimes they get together. When there's a big crisis, like there was in 2007, 2008, they, they put their heads together and they, they, they deal with it, but they have to deal with it in a way which, of course, is about keeping capitalism going. And then that leads into the question as to what is capitalism about. And here, too, as uh, Raquel was saying earlier, we have to be careful about imagining that capitalism is still where it was in 1848. It, it ain't. Uh, and it's even gone through some radically big changes over the last you know, 10, 15 years. So uh, yesterday I quoted, and I probably got the figures wrong, but, but back in about 1990, there were 600 hedge funds in the United States, which controlled about $3, $3 billion of, uh, of investment. Now there are 1,200 hedge funds, controlling something like $4.3 trillion of investment. Now, when you come to questions of bribery, you know, like Al mentioned, you know, well, there's this petty bribery of $300 or whatever it is, the sort of thing that put uh, Agnew in, you know, got him thrown out as, uh, uh, as vice president, those kinds of, that kind of bribery. But here you're talking of, I mean, when the hedge funds move, I mean, they can, they can simply buy elections, no question about it. And what we're seeing is they're buying Supreme Court justices. They're, I mean, we're living in this, this, this rather different, different world where the, the power structure and the money, money power structure is such that it's very difficult to think of being able to uh, so, sort of uh, really you know, supersede it in, in any way by, by financial means. The only means to do it is by mass movements of the sort that we've seen in Chile and various other kinds. But then there's another issue, which is, which is the stability of the society. I mean, people like to think about, you know, social movements and, and, and all the rest of it. But the trouble right now is the employment structures are so e ephemeral uh, and, and locations are so ephemeral that the sort of idea in which you know somebody is raised in a community stays in a community works in a community for their lifetime most people are moving around you know four or five communities in 20 years and it's very difficult to construct uh, social movements that would be anything other than ephemeral given the situation i mean we can complain about to people about you know you're not organizing over the long haul or something of that kind but, but actually, they're not in a position to do that because their job is ephemeral. They're, they're, you know, so, so when you start to think of this world, you think about the possibility of social movements. There have been fantastic numbers of social movements around the world over the last 30, 40 years, but all of them are ephemeral. You know, on February the 15th, 2003, there were, I don't know, millions and millions of people on the streets all over the place saying, no war, no war, no war. And you say to yourself, what would have happened if everybody had stayed on the streets? Mm -hmm. But they didn't. They disappeared. And now we have another war going on and nobody's walking up and down and doing, you know. So, so we live in a different world and we have to sort of think about this relationship between the state and civil society, what the interstate system is doing, how it's being organized and reorganized. So those are the sorts of issues that I think are very important for us to, uh, to, to, to look at. At the same time, as it does seem to me, as some, many people I think are sort of saying, there are, there are many things happening right now which should have happened years and years and years ago and are now beginning to happen, and therefore there is a, a creative set of possibilities. 
and those creative uh, possibilities are some of the things that have been talked about in in, in the last, uh, to particularly today, but were also, I think, laid out a bit last last night in the in the Brecht play. So I, I would I would want to say, you know, yeah, I think Brecht was right to say that, you know, uh, it's only through understanding the lessons of reality that you can change reality, and that and I'm, I'm I'm going very much with that, and then saying, well, let let's now think about how to change reality, with many of the things that have been laid out in in today, uh, been a fantastic day. So let me leave it right there. Thank you, thank you, thank you David. You know, one of the things I thought about um, with respect to the point that Rachel made, we live in a different world and that David just underscored, is how, yes, we live in a different world, but the history of modernity is living in a cascade of different worlds. It's not like the world was one thing from 1451 until 1991, and then it became a different world. So then the question is, so what are the continuities, like categorical, theoretical continuities that we can trace, whether it's the tra tracing the, um, the sinews of um, capitalism, slavery, and colonialism, or tracing the kinds of linkages that people have made from the ground up as well as from the top down under rubrics such as, well, a word that's only a couple of hundred years old, internationalism. Bentham, by the way, <laughs> internationalism. Um, and I was thinking when Maitri was talking about the 1946 um, movement and how the trade unions insisted that they wanted to become part of the Indian national state, that was like straight out of Lenin, man. It's like we have to get bigger as fast as we can because our linkages are essential to our liberation. Now, whether or not that particular step was the correct step, the right measure taken, is something that I think people in Kerala have been debating from then until now. But it really, it, you know, these are, these are some issues that matter. Uh, others that have come up have to do with um, I don't know if this is a word that anybody's used uh, in the last couple of days, but it's kind of been in the atmosphere, and that is externalities. What gets pushed off you know, onto people, onto individuals, onto communities, um, across borders, and so forth, uh, that make it appear, you know, as Angela was saying in that opening little clip, make it appear that certain people are doing things that are improving the conditions of life on the planet, like using biofuels, when in fact the externality that makes that possible is turning parts of Colombia and, 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 and Brazil, as our friend Maria Luisa Mendonca has written a great, brand new great book about, and others into you know, these green deserts that can support biofuel use in, in the rich world, wherever that is, including in Sao Paulo. Right, so you know, so these are some of the questions that then you know we visit in thinking about the kinds of institutions we either can you know infiltrate and use, or distort to our purposes, or abolish as in the sense of turn into their raw materials that become something else. Right, um, so those are, those are some questions, and underlying it all is the question of property and, and, and property as land that is alienable and from which people can be excluded seems to be one of the fundamental problems that we have been addressing throughout the conference, including the play last night. And every single moment of that play was about that, too. And I don't know anything about cotton. I don't know anything about rice. What can I tell you about land? Nothing, but I know it's price. Maybe I could follow up on that. Um, um, again, in, inspiring panels to, uh, today and really loved the play uh, yesterday. I was thinking about the, the state, not a, again, not as a monolith as has come out in various um, uh, presentations today, but as, uh, as fungible. But within that fungibility lies a promise, I think, for uh, radical social movements not to reproduce 
the state necessarily, but to reproduce a fungi fungibility that would challenge uh, the state. I think it was Melina who might have brought up the question of fungus and you know whether we should um, you know <laughs> be fungal. Um, and I, I'm fascinated by that because you know obviously there are lots of uh, fungi. I think like four million or something like that. So uh, we're all always already present in. Uh, but there are certain aspects to fungi that. Um, are not necessarily natural lessons for uh, radical politics, but one of the things that the most fungi do is decompose, right? They, they uh, so if we think of this in relation to the state. Um, I think it's it's a useful metaphor to think about the state as always already uh, in the possibility of decomposition. But another thing about fungi that is sort of fascinating is that it's symbiotic, and not always in a positive way, right? And so um, uh, it can be it can uh, uh, be a parasite too, uh, that which attaches itself to another organism in order to eventually um, uh, kill it and move on. And I was thinking about this in terms of um, I'm going to mention him again, Derrida, um, but <laughs> you know the arrête de mort, right? The the death sentence, and this has to do with a, a, a Kind of undecidability, and I and I do think that it's not it's not a bad thing to um, embrace that undecidability, and we've had a few examples of that today. Uh, one is around the use of the word forged, which means both to make, which is how it was used, forged organizing, right? But it also means to make falsely, right? Um, as in forgery, and I, and I do think that the the, the left can't sort of preempt the possibility that what they believe to be uh, making in the positive sense uh, might also be to make, uh, uh, to make falsely. So um, the challenge remains, right, with, with the state. But I'm, I'm pessoptimistic, um, with, <laughs> at least with regard to uh, uh, political possibility. And it's, it's odd for me, because I, I didn't think and I would think this, but the play for me underlined that. In the in the way it was sort of openly embra uh, embracing uh, political constituency without foisting that responsibility on individuality per se. Uh, yeah, I'm. You know, it's been a full day. Lots of things. I'm still processing a lot of things, and I don't know. I was thinking. Uh, you know, about Monday this week, and when I had a chat with Ruti about what am I going to present, and I told her, there's all this infrastructural building and racialization, probably I shouldn't call it racialization, I don't know, I'm still thinking about all, all of these things, and she said, tell me something I don't know, and, <laughs> and I was like, okay, probably there is all this other stuff going on, on debt, and you know, things like that. And so I you know, figured out my presentation. And I was also thinking about my supervisor back home in Kerala, who uh, is actually part of the Kerala planning board and a member of the party and his you know, quite a senior carder and all of that. And he would say, you know, I'll, I'll have this, all this critique of uh, trade unions. And he'll say, oh my god, but don't you think that trade unions are also in this world? Like, don't you realize that you know they are products of their time and space and all of that? So where is your analysis? Where is your, I mean, in a way, where is your empathy or where is your sympathy for? Uh, so I have had to, you know, I, I think I was lucky to have all of these people in my life who who nudged me to think abstractly, and I feel that thinking abstractly is one of one of the things that uh, that that makes us closer to the state in a way. And you know that's where abstractions um, collide, like how the state and capital abstract us and how we turn it on them and abstract back. Uh, and which, which necessarily things uh, involves a lot of scalar and interstellar or interscalar thinking. So I feel that uh, it's this collision of and then I was thinking about, uh, you know, how I've never participated in any large movements until I came here and was 
and participated in the George Floyd uprising. And uh, and then I thought, okay, all of this while, even though I was in Kerala, amidst so many, but everything was so little. You know, there was never this massive street-based protest. And 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 then I told some comrades back home, oh my God, American American communists are so great. And he said, don't trust them. Are you crazy? <laughs> <laughs> They're no, never going to get anywhere. Don't you know that? <laughs> and yeah, so you know, it's the collision of all these historical consciousnesses that happens, and and I think state is one way of. Um, uh, drawing some boundaries around our historical consciousness so that we can actually do something. Yeah. Well, we can open up for the discussion. I did think of one other thing I meant to say earlier. May I have another couple of minutes of your attention? This is, goes back to Brecht and bringing Brecht all the way up to this moment. So when, when, when Brecht was trying to figure out a revolutionary theater, an epic theater, he spent a lot of time experimenting. It was trial and error, trial and error, trial and error, and then writing about it and then reflecting, abstracting from his own experience to evaluate that experience, to give himself, which is to say him and his comrades, some indications of what they should do next. Right? So it's kind of theory or policy, however you want to, whichever word you prefer, applies. And along the way, in the kind of development of the kind of theater that we saw the play, you know, last night as an expression of, um, Brecht and his comrades came up with this concept of the model. And the model is something that isn't static. You start with a model, say develop a, a version of Antigone, for example. A version of Antigone that's been stripped down a bit and some of the um, kind of principal contradictions that make that play work become the basis for any future approximation of that play as a performance. And then the result of that, including conversations with audience and so forth, creates the conditions for the next time. And it's not like crit in the sense of, oh, I didn't like that. I didn't like your voice, although that comes up too. But rather that the model itself is, has a certain plasticity to it. It can change shape. We're not carving something out of stone, but using the plastic of the social to understand the social as well as to change ourselves. Right? And that's what the play last night was doing for me and what our conversation today was doing. So there were plenty of times today as I was listening to my comrades present their work, and I go, oh man, I don't agree with that at all. But that was great. Um, not because only because we can debate, but because the kind of social plasticity that I'm trying and we're trying to understand, the reality that we're trying to understand is something that has all these dimensions that themselves are changing and can change in a moment. And so that is something uh, that uh, I hope we might be able to build on next year in the CPCP seminar where we're going to talk about the state and take model not as blueprint, but model as this you know, socially plastic, um, real uh, set of relations that are constantly contradictory subject and object of struggle, and therefore constantly structure agency as we move forward through our analysis and also changing the world. So with that, it's open.
Hi. Um, on the subject of mediation or thinking through uh, movements or parties as mediation, um, I was reminded, being Italian, about the Five Star Movement and the kind of trajectory of a form of mediation that is technically kind of public participation from below, um, started as a movement, uh, had this you know uh, sort of digital interface whereby you know, thousands of people were able to technically uh, promote certain policies versus others. So that that was technically speaking from a, a radical perspective, like a model of uh, very uh, you know, sort of immediate participation in governance. Once the Five Star Movements kind of solidified into uh, a party and um, became the, the actual state, um, there was a, a, an immediate kind of downfall, fragmentation, et cetera. And now the trajectory, of course, is complete fascism or like a form of fascism, um, which is kind of running the country now. So I was wondering, I, I just wanted to bring it as an example or as a thought in terms of mediation and like forms of mediation um, and perhaps you know what that means um, with, with the tools that are available now. Thank you very much. I think I forgot what I was going to say. No, um, I I am. Um, I was very taken by these uh, uh, today and yesterday, of course. You know, it's very interesting. I one of my early formations on, I guess, on left here was actually Brecht. Uh, a friend of mine recommended uh, to start reading Brecht and so on. And uh, perhaps it was even before I read Marx it's, uh, itself. And it was, it was quite illuminating to do this. But one thing that that I always get when I refer when we refer to people from that time is was just the incredible capacity to imagine the possibility for something different, and um, and I've been very taken by uh, and I talk to my students a lot about this. Some of them are here, um, where there's a, a whole shadow of dystopia and of the end of everything that that is just on top of us. And when I got uh, today's uh, today, I, I thought, you know, it's not that that shadow. I, I I actually thought that many of the conversations were incredibly imaginative. And 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 even though, yes, I mean the the discussions on Chile, you know, and and, and I guess Raquel also being like very um, powerfully, you know, discussing the state from a very negative perspective of of the impasse that we're in. Um, I sense that there is, uh, yeah, that everyone here together just brings an energy where. I don't think we're we're we have this lack of imagination, but we certainly need much more of that. I just want to to say that, and we're very afraid of the, uh, pro, of making propositions, right? Uh, of of just showing what ideas we have, right? Because we are all open to these criti criticisms, or quite open. The moment that you you present an idea, is you put yourself much more vulnerable than when you present a critique. And so I guess what I'm trying to say is that that the force that we can bring out of this conference is, is this impetus of, of just bringing ideas, no matter how, you know, they, they, how they come forward, because we, we just need them. I mean, we need that, that fuel for the soul, the same as Brecht was coming and all the people around that time, right? The same during so many liberation movements that, that happened pre-postmodern times or you know, pre-neoliberal times. Um, and and we, I, I just, just begging everyone that that I think is a, it's a big task to do, right? To to to, yes, the critique is very important, but the imagination is something that they ca we cannot let them take that away from us, right? Yeah, thank you. Um, I just wanted to the just reflecting on the state and I like the postal service and I like my garbage being taken like the parts of the state that I do like versus the part of the states that um, is also part of the problem is there any part of the state to keep or is there anything we can learn from like I, I just I'm thinking of shrinking the state and then but also what 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 expands in that dynamic of shrinking and um, John Polo impressed upon me the efficiency of the state, and 
I, like, can we learn from that efficient? I mean, like, not everything is everything bad about the state, or is there some efficiencies that we could learn from, um, counter, and you, I don't know, harness, um, et cetera. So that's just more of external processing. Thank you. I think it's on. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. All right. Um. And and I want I want to hear from my comrades, but there there are a few things I wanted to say immediately. The first is that um, I think one of the contributing uh, forces that has stifled imagination and creativity in a good deal of um, the parts of North America, U.S. and Canada, that part of North America that I encounter is that people have uh, come to behave as though analysis equals complaint. No wonder our imaginations get all fucked up when we think that what we're supposed to do is complain, and I'm complaining about it, right? <laughs> <laughs> um, so thinking about analysis as something other than complaint then raises all kinds of issues. So some of you know that I say what we should be doing is rehearsing, not reciting, and that gets us away from complaint. But, I, but the, the fact of, of the state being efficient is something that every single capitalist will snort at. All, that's all they talk about is how inefficient states are. That's all they talk about. And yet we know if we've ever tried to like cure a friend of cancer, that there, there are efficiencies that we cannot realize on our own, and those efficiencies might be well realized in a public hospital or you know, ed educating large numbers of people in a public school or keeping up a park. So those are, that's a different way of thinking efficiency. So there are you know, a couple of, of approaches. And one, one thing that I think about all the time is this. Um, mutuality and radical dependence is absolutely important. And I depend on my friends, many of whom are in this room right not now, for everything, for my happiness, everything. Like, I just wouldn't be if it weren't for my friends who are here. But what concerns me is that there be provision for everything someone I despise needs. I don't need, I don't want to care about somebody other than that they not be let die. And that's where, for me, something that I'm calling the state comes in. And not that we say then the state, some object, will take care of all of that, but rather we decide on our own, together, democratically from the ground up, how provisions are made so that when that person I despise comes along with need, they get them met. That is the thing for me. <laughs> yeah, I can't follow that. I did want to say something, though, about constitutions. Um, I uh, did a little bit of work on the, the Puerto Rican plebiscito, and the options in that plebiscito are just um, uh, impossible, right? So um, often what happens is the independence parties just um, boycott it because it's the, 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 even the language of, of the plebiscito is, is decided, it's a congressional thing, right? It's a congressional document. It's decided basically by... Uh, the the U.S. So the the reason this is important for me is that the that the the the, the idea of the Constitution is it, it is a map, right? But it's uh, as somebody brought out in the in the presentations, it there's uh, the, if it's not enforced, right? Uh, what what grounds does it actually have? And it suggests to me that at least part of why the inertia of the state is able to continue right is that it's very good at these performative aspects of 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 the running of the state so it seems to be doing something that it, it often is not doing and one of the things that it's often not doing is precisely enacting its constitutional uh, decrees you know on on top of that like 
I mean, I think there's a big, big question as to where political subjectivity comes from and how it forms. And this is one of the questions that we ought to be, I think, reflecting on right now because, you know, there's some very strange political subjectivities erupting all over the place. And I think we should uh, actually then, we should, should have some understanding of, of, of where that comes from. Um, we can do it theoretically or we can do it some other way. But that's one of the questions which I think comes out of this, uh, these sessions. I don't know what to say, um, you know. I mean, about the state, I was thinking throughout the day, we didn't talk much about affirmative action or representation specifically. And I was thinking how it is such a big part of uh, how Kerala was formed, uh, because we have hun we've, have, we've had 100 years of affirmative action for uh, Dalits and uh, other um, uh, former untouchable castes, and which has now expanded to even to economically backward, not just backward caste. And even if you take the Constitution of India, it provides for you know reservation for uh, lower caste. So I, I feel that you know political subjectivities will erupt only if uh, we. Uh, I mean, there's some way of um, some representational path uh, or path to representation. So I'm interested. I mean, the whole day we spoke a lot about demo democratizing and its relationship with radical radicalism. And I was thinking that you know how these things are connected, and you know, and 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 I also I was quite surprised by the fact that you. You would want to change your, I mean, you'd want to rewrite your constitution or, you know, having these referendums regarding these pieces. And it's not a parliamentary thing, but that it's a popular, it's popular will. So that was interesting for me. But I was also thinking, you know, how can we have lasting, oh, sorry. Yeah. How can we have lasting uh, representational, you know, concreteness? Uh, rather than that being very transient. Yeah. You know, I think what you just said links really directly to you know David's um, point about political subjectivity and how people imagine themselves. Well, what is that? Althusser's definition of ideology: people's imagined relation to real people in the real world. So that, that imagined relation to real people in the real world itself uh, is shaped by, you know, that plasticity I was talking about is shaped by all kinds of things, including what people imagine having been represented means or imagine becoming represented means. And so for us, it's the becoming part that matters um, in the context of the historical constraints through which becoming must fight. And none of us picked up the five stars question. I meant to come back to that earlier. Um, and I'm reminded that uh, 100 years ago last October is when Mussolini and the gang made their march. And you know, the kind of dramatic, spectacular founding of, that, of the fascist party as, as a force. And the march was huge. And people who were perhaps prepared to embrace communist provisioning or other sorts of anti-capitalist provisioning instead became completely swept up by the spectacle and the promises of fascism. Right? Equal pay for equal work, for example, and daycare, for example. And whether or not those events and promises and so forth of a hundred and, and a half years ago um, uh, are reflected in contemporary Italian fascism, uh, the questions remain the same. What is it that makes these things so attractive to people? Why did the overseas department of France have very high levels of votes for Le Pen in the runoff? Right? Not Mélenchon, Le Pen. Like, why? Why? 
And saying, well, people vote against their interests is not explaining anything at all. What is it that people think? So these are things for us to talk about. Another round? Um, I was so excited by all the conversation today because it brings me back to one of the, as a young anti-prison organizer, when I encountered uh, Golden Gulag for the first time, I was made to ask myself something more than the state is racist and capitalist and it's against us and ask the question that you state later with Craig and Beyond Bratton, why does the racial capitalist state ever change? And this question of, you know, states are constantly creating, smashing, repurposing capacities, these different institutions, and to ask ourselves, why does that happen? Even if in the big grand scheme of things, we know that it must preserve capitalism, turns out capitalists have a whole bunch of weird different ideas about how that should be done at the macro level and at the meso level. And there are a lot of contradictions between those visions in actual practice. At a certain level of abstraction, at the macro level, there are certain shared interests, but even on some of those fundamental class questions, the capitalist class is not that unified in actual political practice. But at the meso level, they're a mess. And so the points that you were making, Maitri, earlier in your presentation about how each of these wage regimes was the sort of result of a political settlement between construction capital, and the trade unions and the uh, recruitment agencies. That's true of all of these agencies of the, of the state. And we can just take it as strategically, we can take it all as just window dressing or as all just weird shuffling that like, now there's a ministry of this. Oh, that got merged into the ministry of that. Oh, now it's spun back out. Oh, now there's a ministry for indigenous people. Oh, that's just you know window dressing or it's just showing off and pretending to be a reform. But the fact that that even had to happen, the fact that they even needed to make window dressing, is the sign that there was a response to organizing that was happening, to things that people were doing. And so strategically, when we're thinking about organizing, taking seriously those you know, divergent, um, the, the outcomes that of those divergent strategies that different factions of capital, that other classes, um, have been taking in terms of making these decisions of what should all of the collective capacities um, uh, centralized into state institutions look like and do. Um, taking that seriously because that's the terrain that we're fighting on if we're talking about non-reformist reforms, if we're talking about you know, the types of things that Du Bois talks about in Black Reconstruction in America of the creation of institutions, the experimenting with these institutions that were things to have turned out differently, would have been the seed institutions for a completely different type of state. And so I just think strategically it's so good for us to take seriously those changes and to not just sort of dismiss them as window dressing or tweaks on the side, but to really dig deeply into those questions because those changes are going to be the basis for what comes next, whatever shape that takes as we see on the poster in the, or in the regular poster in the subtitle, we have a bunch of paths ahead of us and what exists now is going to be the basis for that. How are we going to make that future out of what we have right now? That involves understanding how we got where we are and how we could repurpose those. So I'm really excited about everything people have been saying today. My mind's on fire. So many, many ideas, uh, but building on that one, well, and also a few ideas about, um, because when we think about the state, I'm thinking about Carolina's presentation on Chile and how she was like, well, the media was totally against the constitution. And it came to my mind, this famous uh, sentence of Allende, El Mercurio Miente, and Mercurio lies, you know, like this, the big newspaper in Chile. Um, so I think one of the things that we should think about is like the, the state and, and all its ideological apparatuses in the Paulantan sense, for example, the media and how that shape hegemony and mm, do not let us think about other ways out, outside of the box, outside of the box of the capitalist state, right? 
And then the other one is like about the thought I have, um, the cooptation of social movements when they get into power. Uh, Italy is an, is, a, is an example. Uh, I can talk about Podemos in Spain a lot. And, but I also wanted to, to bring into here like um, how uh, in Portugal, um, before the, well, when the Estado Novo, well, the dictatorship was there, the, the Portuguese Communist Party infiltrated the, the military and the police for a few years. Like they did that with, with a purpose, the socialists as well. Um, and so that when the revolution came, well, actually it was kind of in instigated by them with the people as well. And then like it was, I think it was one, one person dead in the whole revolution. Um, so that brings up like, we want to abolish the state, we want to abolish the police, but how do we relate to that when they still exist here? Um, yeah, and also how do we build, the, 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 the Communist Party of Portugal could do that because the political subjectivity was super huge, right? Still on the party, in the Communist Party. Now that these are, we have been talking about this, how this uh, is a different, different economies, we have the urbanization of economies and, and the financialization as well. How do we build the political subjectivity? I wanted to build on that. Um, and yeah, that, that'll be, yeah. Yeah, just to build upon the uh, earlier discussion on the state, uh, when we envisage a state, we, as David was saying, not only different types of state, a capital state, a socialist state, but different levels of the state, uh, drawing from the experience of Kerala, because the democratic decentralization project, which is now almost going to be 30 years, has been deeply threatening to establish vested interests. And that's something that we have to contend with, because uh, Jan Paolo is talking about participatory budgeting as you know, suck the energy out of imagining more radical versions of democracy. But here, what we see in Kerala is that participatory budgeting in popular assemblies were deeply threatening. Of course, it has gone into the direction of people being more interested in getting some welfare handouts and other things from the state. But uh, the recent incursion of big capital, neoliberal capital into the state has happened because of clawing back power from the village assemblies, which was initially given in the democratic decentralization project. So that's something that we have to understand, how, how a democratizing state is deeply threatening to capital and vested interests. So bureaucracy has clawed back because it's e easier for capital to you know, manipulate the bureaucracy at the top level than at the local level when well, you know, the local people are involved. And so that is something that has very much happened illegal quarry, mining and mining interests, ecological degradation, and so on has happened because of going back on democratic decentralization. Not because of uh, uh, democratic decentralization working as envisaged. And that is something that we have to keep in mind. That participatory budget can be empowering if, you know, uh, if, if it is fulfilled in its potential. But here what has happened is that the bureaucracy has come back with force to take back the power from the people and, uh, and the subversion happening at a higher level of the state. So different levels of the state and different kinds of state. And uh, that's something that we have to contend with. And, and popular assemblies and uh, democratically elected popular assemblies can be very, very threatening to uh, established interests, politics as well as capital. And that's something that we need to contend. Yeah, I just wanted to reflect on the idea that every, you know, civil society likes quick fixes, right? So like the idea of, and it's always easier to mobilize than it is to organize, right? So like the idea of a constitution is very uh, compelling, right? Because it's like, oh, if this passes and all my problems are solved, or if this socialist president gets elected, all of my problems are solved. But like everything else, uh, a constitution is like a contract, right? Like our contract at CUNY gets violated by management all the time. And the only way to hold management accountable is by organizing and pushing for it not to be violated. And, and it's the same thing with the constitution, right? Like, so a great constitution gets passed, that's great. You still have to organize and hold the state 
the social movements, everybody accountable for ensuring that those rights are guaranteed, right? So it's similar. Um, could I just pick up on a couple of things? So Ruthie, you talked about plasticity of state. And a couple of days ago, uh, I remembered when David was talking on the panel with Miguel and Rachel, um, you, you clearly said capital is not a thing, it's a process. And in some ways, I think what we're working towards is the idea of state as process, not a thing, right? And, um, and so you also mentioned Althusser, and, and I'm thinking, all right, so if we think about state as process, and if we also, also borrow from him ideological state apparatuses, and in addition to the repressive state apparatuses, right? And the ideological state apparatuses were actually outside the state altogether. And so in that sense, almost state, like the, he talked about church, he talked about family, and those are not necessary, that, that's starting to get into the biopolitics a little bit, right? Of that's lo much larger than the state, that state's only one component of, and. And so I, I guess I just want, want to ask you guys about that, too. I'll, I'll, I'll start with um, uh, Malia. I love, I love that question you just asked. And thank everyone, again, for questions and comments. It's really been fantastic. Um, one of the things that I think we're constantly having to refresh our political subjectivities about is that every category of struggle is in part shaped by every other category of struggle, right? So it's, so it's that. And then, you know, thinking with Althusser and thinking about the, um, ideological state apparatuses, let's take the church. We can say, well, the church is outside the state except for insofar as the state has agreed that the church can be outside the state, which is not true everywhere. Or the family is outside the state except for insofar as the state has decided what a family is and isn't. Um, whether it's a matter of heteronormativity or what the tax burden is or who can live together under the same shelter, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So there, there kind of isn't an outside, which is a good thing, because that means there's no time to waste and we don't have to worry about you know, wasting time. Um, and and you know, re related to that, I, oh God, I just had a very senior moment. Yeah. <laughs> 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 it's, it's the devil in the deep blue sea, right? <laughs> yes, yes, younger brother. <laughs> <laughs> so, the, uh, with my understanding of Althusser, right, there, there's a dynamism at stake, right? And so ideology never sleeps, um, which is also something that the activists themselves know, right? The activism cannot sleep. Um, because of the, the 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 dynamism of what enables the state to produce itself and reproduce itself, so um, it didn't come up a, a great deal, I don't think, in the in the panels today. But obviously, some kind of theory of ideology is still useful in in, in political um, um, in political activism, um, and this is issue of interpolation, I think. Uh, that Althusser used, you know, that ideology is right, an imaginary resolution of a real contradiction. I, I, I do think that that is something that we're not outside of, and we 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 tend to perform that as well, even though we we're conscious of that's not what we should be doing, right? So um, it's I, I think generally we haven't, you know, drawn a line and say, look. Well, Contradictions, you know, that side of the political divide, uh, non-contradictory and uh, and healthy politics. This side of the divide, uh, but the the question is um, yeah, how you handle the expectations of of those impasses, of of those of those places um, or or projects that that don't work out, um, 
And in that sense, this, this, the struggle is almost literally endless. Well, but one of the things that, uh, again, it comes back to the question of the, the state as process. You think about the amount of uh, uh, money that circulates in the form of uh, state revenues and how those revenues are dispersed and to go in, in what direction, you know, part of it goes to the military where it gets completely wasted. Some of it goes into, you know, supporting schools, hospitals, universities, you know. In other, in other words, there's a whole kind of field of uh, circulation of uh, state revenues which needs in itself to be dissected and looked at, and a lot of it, of course, is about redistribution. And we like to think the redistribution should be from the rich to the poor, but in the United States, it excels in taking from the poor and giving to the rich. And that's what, uh, for instance, uh, Trump's... Uh, uh, budget reform uh, amounted amounted to, and and uh, when you look at this, you kind of realize that actually the state becomes an agency for extracting wealth, very frequently from the least, uh, to the most vulnerable people, and 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 to the least well off part of the population. So again, there's a there's a way in which as soon as you uh, start want to talk about the state, you start thinking about well. How can those revenue streams get switched? Uh, and what happens when you try to do it? Uh, and Clinton genuinely tried back in the 90s uh, to switch from defense expenditures to social expenditures. But basically, uh, the big apparatus stopped him. Uh, and, and so he couldn't do the switch. And of course, Congress wasn't going to do the switch. Uh, so, so again, there's a whole field of, uh, of uh, pushing here, uh, which which is which is seeing the state as a, as a, as a, a, a mechanism for for extracting wealth from the population and redistributing it according to certain principles, and and the social the idea of social movements is frequently to to change that so that the more is sent into social welfare or into into Medicaid and Medicare, and you see the kind of the other folks saying, no, 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 uh, put it to, you know, supporting the corporations because the corporations create jobs, which turns out not to be the case, uh, or give it to the very ultra-rich because they invest. No, they don't. They just buy yachts. Uh, so, so this is... So there's a whole kind of... Uh, allure that goes on about that where, where the state apparatus is something that needs to be dissected and understood and and then I think the social movements have to think about exactly how to redirect funds and and not uh, preferably not through NGO structures uh, you know revolution by NGO forget it uh, and and uh, there's a big there's a big difference there's a big difference uh, between having the status of a citizen demanding rights and being a beggar uh, asking for charity for an NGO. I mean, this is again about the actual creation of political subjectivities that, uh, that, that actually alter very much how, how political stuff uh, gets uh, treated in, in, in daily life and, and as well as in the, in the press. Maleha's question and responses, you know, by David and all of you reminds me of, you know, the idea, I mean, about counter-revolution, because um, it seems like, like it's the job of the state to actually absorb a lot of the counter-revolution, too. So you trace the part of revolution and the counter-revolution, you, you know, you almost like stumble upon the state. And I think that's interesting. And to think of yesterday's play, you know, there's a lot of fraternal and con convivial aspects to our lives. But also, you know, there is comradely fratricide. <laughs> so, I, so I think it's, it's interesting to talk about those things and to think of the backlash or the counter-revolution and the state. Um, that probably we are, I mean, definitely in India, we know very well about, and you know, it's relationship to constitution because constitution is where you are like, okay, agreeing to a certain formal conviviality. And you know, then they come and say no. So then the state has to absorb that too.
Your, your point reminds me of a really heinous article that was in the New York Times last week about the MST. You know, the watch out, watch out, landowners. If you're not using your land, the Marxists are going to come and steal it from you. Yeah. And it was so interesting. To, I mean, after I calmed down, uh, it was so interesting to me to see that this reporter who apparently, you know, lives in, somewhere in, in Brazil and, you know, went somewhere where Marxists were stealing land, didn't bother to consult the Constitution and therefore explain to him, I think it was a he, themselves anyway, um, how it is that 60% of the cases brought were founded in favor of the people doing the land occupation. Like, how could that happen? It, it wasn't like 60 Marxist judges. 60% <laughs> of judges were Marxist. So I just... Saying that, but related to that and related to counter-revolution is the sort of ongoing fact of passive revolution. And I don't know, like 30 some odd years ago, I realized, I looked up one day and said, oh, that's what's happening in the United States. It's a passive revolution. And it was, you know, as the, as the radical right was, you know, kind of gearing up for its next round, but it was right before Clinton was elected and, and and um, David already said that Clinton realized Clinton couldn't do what actually I think Clinton was never going to do. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but, you know, he had to make a public acknowledgement of that. And th that passive revolution does a lot of this absorption as well as um, manipulation and distortion. And yet we're constantly thinking again and again with our, um, you know, with our theoretical ancestors uh, about historical personality, about what it is that makes a movement move, um, enables a movement move in a direction, whether that direction is revolutionary, whether it's land occupation, whether it's a, a occupation of a hospital in Cape Town, which people have been doing for living now for four years in the Sissy Gould House, a thousand people live in a building that was a hospital. And the first people who occupied it after the hospital was closed as a hospital were the security guards, who were the ones who knew how to get into the hospital when it had been decommissioned as a hospital. And now it's home to a thousand people who govern themselves, who have reorganized the interior space, but they are also demanding of the provisional government provincial government and the central state resources for them to convert that place uh, more permanently to the homes that they have made there. Uh, similarly, with people who are doing land occupation up a Shali, the Shek Dwellers movement, it's the same thing. They, people do uh, land occupations, build houses immediately. There are eviction police who come and burn the houses down and they build them again, build them again. Eventually, some of the settlements remain unevicted. And then the demand is of the state. And these are not naive people. They've been, they've been burned out of their homes three, four, five, ten times. So when they're making a demand of the state, there is a historical personality at work that's trying to accomplish something. And in that accomplishment is changing the relations of social reproduction. So, the, I mean, these are some of the, the lessons that we have, and it's not to romanticize anything, but rather to recognize um, these things. So using what is to make what we want, as Carolina said earlier, is, is absolutely important. And also that point that Nissim made uh, bears repeating, yes, there are all of these formal, not real um, uh, shows of democracy, but then there's the real practices of democracy and we ought not presume that every practice is really only ever a show or the other way around. Because there really is, demo people are really making democracy from the ground up and remaking it and remaking it, as we've heard in some of our presentations. More one round, one last round. Hi, thank you all. Um, I'm gonna try try to not ramble about this. Um, so I, I want to uh, I want want to invoke an absent presence, <laughs> um, that of that of the, the the party, and not to say I mean, I'm, not, I'm not a party fetishist. I'm not gonna come up here and say we need a party. 
Um, maybe we do, maybe we don't. But historically, it seems to me that parties have played an important role in articulating struggles to the point of forming new subjectivities. Uh, sub subjectivities being formed in, in that moment where struggles across space and across scale are brought into contact with each other and converge and become something larger than the sum of their parts. Um, and this is, a, this is an instrument that movements have been able to use to engage with the state, to use the state, to move through the state, to move against the state. It's a kind of infrastructure that allows you to move your forces um, in the war of position. Gramsci also looming over this whole conversation. Um, if the state has changed, is changing, how does that um, kind of instrument of engagement change? Mass parties in the industrial West have their legitimacy has collapsed. Not necessarily true across the world, but largely true in wealthy democracies. Um, so, you know, do we need a party? Do we not need a party? I don't know, but we certainly need some form of organization that can fulfill this function. Or are we in a totally different kind of world where that is that function in and of itself, not just the party form, but that function is uh, obsolete. Uh, hi, everyone. Um, yeah, thanks so much for all this amazing, uh, mind-blowing uh, conversations. Um, it, f while, while listening through um, all the speakers today, um, I can't escape the, the idea or the, th the questions around state violence um, as a material expression of the state. That maybe we can think about that we can get away with it by not engaging with state violence. Maybe we can think about factoring it out from our calculus, um, from our own political work. Uh, but in reality, it's present, and it structures many um, social relationships, and it kills lives. Um, and so I was curious um, what are our thoughts about this in terms of thinking about um, our own political work, um, not necessarily directly in relation to state violence, but how do we think about our own political imaginaries and our own political commitments, um, knowing that at any time, the state can crush us, can kill us, right? And, and there are, I mean, my political work is in the Philippines, and um, some of the movements there have taken on arms, right? The, the Maoists, for instance. Um, have taken an arms to defend um, the political gains that the, that the communist movement um, have been building on in the last 50 years. Um, and they articulate and communicate this as a way to protect and defend the gains of the democratic um, people's rev revolutionary government against state terrorism and state violence. Um, Obviously, in the U.S., that's a questionable fact, right? That's a questionable thing to say, like kind of like take on arms, right? Um, so I'm always grappling with this kind of question, and like, uh, sure, we can be creative in terms of um, of dealing with our own problems, collective problems, uh, but how do we think about state violence? Thanks. So I know I love I know I've done a lot of talking today and yesterday, but I just wanted to bring. Up when we talk about the state as a process and the fact that we're in a different situation in relation to the state than we have been in the past and that the state's doing different work to what it's done before. I think one of the great novelties of the late part of the 20th century is the exporting of the idea of, uh, we were talking about Italian fascism before, of corporativismo, of corporativism into the rest of the Western world at least, to the point that the labor movement no longer has political independence. And I think that that manifests itself in different ways. In Australia in 1983, the Labor Party signed something called the Prices and Incomes Accords, which basically uh, withdrew our right to strike as unions in exchange for a social wage. In this state in 1967, the Taylor Law removed the right to strike on the behalf of public sector unions. 
we're at CUNY, we're dealing with this right now. It's very difficult for us to build any political power other than through lobbying Democrat officials because we're not allowed to strike. And so I'm just wondering, like, that, that mode of activism, which was once opposed to the state to some extent, uh, the independent labor movement, the fact that that's not a reality in many parts of the West today, uh, that really does sort of speak to your point, Ruthie, that, you know, there is no outside here. And I just wonder, you know, what the outlook is for, for a labor movement which doesn't have, for instance, something like the right to strike. Hi. Um, I'm not sure how articulate I can be, but I'll try to post this question. Um, something that's been running through my mind even as I was listening to multiple panels from the morning is I feel there's a certain similarity of forms on the left and the right. Like, for example, I think Nisim's presentation showed that there is this right wing populism, but then there is this left wing populism as well. There is this party leader worship on the right, then there is this left party leader worship on the le on the left as well. And then there is this uh, left utopia or a left hope that is given. But then the fascist also gives me a certain hope. Like, for example, make America great again. Or in India, there's this Ache De Ane Wale, which means the good days are yet to come. Or Swach Bharat. You know, there is clean India. So there is this utopia or the hope that is on the left and the right. And there's this certain universal subject that is being tried to construct it on the left and the right again, the, like a proletariat, however the particularist it is. Or, or even on the right, there's this, everybody born in India is a Hindu, no matter even if you're a Muslim by practice, you are a Hindu. You know, that's certain, like an ontologically universal and empty category that is being created both on the left and the right. And how do I differentiate between these norms? You know, the, what are the ethical coordinates? like? I do not want to start from this place. I mean, I have certain normative uh, uh, rules by through which I come to this place. I understand caste is bad. I understand race is bad. But I do not want to just start from that moral, moral position of this is bad. But how do I differentiate between these for analysis going beyond these certain normative? Like, no matter, like, there is the similarity of form. I understand there's a difference in the substance. but. There's this reproduction that's happening on either sides. How do I differentiate between these, the forms on either side? Yeah. Um, so my question sort of hinges on turning back to Brecht as a sort of epigraph. Um, for this conference, but also as uh, Professor Harvey said for his book. Um, and thinking of Brecht trying to deal with um, the epic theater, uh, and so many of his plays hinge on these sort of vignettes or scenes that maybe are something like the um, ephemeral social movements that we're looking at, if we can think with allegory, um, as Marxists, as, as literary Marxists love to do. Um, and then thinking of it in sort of contrast to a literary Marxist idea of tragedy. Um, and Alberto Toscano says that tragedy is not the really pessimism or foreclosure, but the arrival at a moment when um, you need an answer, but the answers that are available are ones that are sort of recourse to the past that have already failed. Um, and I'm thinking about this in terms of the opening um, remarks on Kerala and this issue of late socialism um, and neoliberal realities. Uh, and so my question is, do we look at politics and the state today as um, something with sort of epic forms or generic potentials or something with tragic um, forms or potentials? I think novel potentials. Um, I mean, novelization sort of swallows the epic um, and swallows uh, a tragedy. It's a bit like, a bit like capitalism, right? Um, very greedy. 
Um, but I do think there are some serious issues about um, uh, you know modes of opposition when it seems like from from, from your uh, question, right? That there there seems to be a mirroring of mirroring of political uh, subjectivity. I would say, not in fairness to the right, but in fairness to the left, that that's not the only mode. I mean, there is a kind of iconography, will to iconography, and and um, superheroism. It's actually interesting to do some work on the Soviet era superheroes in relation to Putin's self representation today. You know that appeared in comic books in the. 50s and 60s, but that's another story. A bit too literary, or maybe not literary enough. Um, but I would, <laughs> I would say though that um, uh, the um, maneuverability um, and the, the the tactical or strategic exigencies uh, again are very difficult to uh, uh, predict unless unless you you know you uh, get back to um, what David was saying about you know, borrowing from Brecht on reality, right? And so there's this kind of an onus, I think, on, uh, on the uh, radical organizer to um, uh, assess what constitutes that reality in that moment rather than seeing it simply as a, a version of uh, right-wing representation. Okay, all right. A um, uh, couple, couple of points. Um, nerve, my dear. Yes, absolutely, of course, state violence. And as we know, as Jordan Neely breathed his last, non-state violence. So the, the fact of organized violence and disorganized violence is part of what we're struggling through and a lot of the discussion after the play last night was shaped by that. You know, what should violence be? Should violence ever be the form of speech? And sometimes it is. Um, but then we have the normative question, what relation do we want to have with that? One of the fundamental debates underlying the fact of this conference is whether or not there can be a, an, a set of institutions called the state that are more for me or for us than against us. And some of that for and against, you know, people evaluate by thinking, well, where's the organized violence going to turn its attention? Um, whether against me or against somebody, I would prefer also not to have it turned towards. So the, you know, these, these are, are the hugest political questions. And then, though, uh, uh, combining, combining your question with um, Giacomo's question about the right to strike or no right to strike, well, this is where we decide we're going to strike, which is to say, we say, all right, forces of organized violence, bring it on, because this is we, where we have decided to take a stand. Right? Um, du Bois came up a few times today. And we could have started with Du Bois, um, not in, in lieu of Brecht, but we could have started with Du Bois today as well. And, and thought out loud about people, <laughs> this is going to sound really corny, making history under conditions not of their own choosing, um, which is to say, Striking, fighting a, a revolution for emancipation known as the Civil War in the United States, and then making institutions in order to um, create the conditions for the reproducibility of reproduction, as my theory was talking about this morning. And it's not like the emancipated people who did that started doing it the day after the Civil War ended. They were already doing it and then kept doing it, right? So there, these are these are indications of whatever it is, political subjectivity, historical personality, that give us some glimpse into what normativity should be that enable us to distinguish between what seem to be otherwise equivalent forms. This form is not the same as this form because the purpose is different, right? The, you know, these, these are these are you know 
sort of questions and indicators that we have available to us. And so, Julia, was that your question about Brecht? Julia, I mean, I come down on Epic, even though I completely embrace Alberto's evaluation of, of the tragic. But Epic, and Epic, because Epic is so plastic. You know, we can sort of make it and make it again and make it again and make it again. And it, I know this for some people in the audience who might not be familiar, Epic might sound like we're saying heroic. Not at all. Not at all. Not at all. And yet there are these big punches available because of how stylized and, um, as it were, exaggerated things are so that we have the ability to notice what we're seeing and think about it and be disturbed by it. Not have the answer, but have the disturbing uh, um, uh, sensation that alienates us from ourselves, which is productive, like really, really productive, which is what the mask was about last night. So I'm sorry, Giacomo, Brecht is still like right on. <laughs> uh, yeah, you know, I, I liked all the questions and don't have much to say, but also was thinking about this tragedy and, you know, this difference between epic, tragic, and all, of, and novel. And, and I was thinking whether that exists in the Indian context or the Kerala context, and I don't know. But at the same time, I thought, you know, tra tragic means that, you know, you sh if you keep avoiding something, if you keep running away, I mean, the Sophoclean uh, tragic thing is basically if you keep running away from something, you might actually end up there faster. <laughs> so it's better to <laughs> confront. <laughs> so in that sense, a very um, simple idea of tragedy. <laughs> Yeah, so that that confrontation is probably you know an interesting thing to do. You know, it's been a long day, and I think we're all stimulated enough <laughs> that those who drink can drink, and we who don't will do other things and enjoy the rest of the evening. But let me thank everybody for splendid um, talks today, wonderful conversation. <laughs> A shout out again to our comrades here at the People's Forum who always welcome us beautifully. And by the way, in case you don't know, just because everything is, is contradictory, you know, the People's Forum is a you know, not-for-profit NGO. So when we're talking against all the NGOs, we mean except the ones that are ours. <laughs> and we know that you know, philanthropy is private allocation of the stolen social wage, so here we've stolen it back. I just want to add a thank you to the People's Cafe as well. Oh, yeah. And the sub thugs will never reveal their. Uh... <laughs>